What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. In this video, we are going to be covering the rise of Sinister in the Krakoan era. This video will be consisting of the entirety of Mortal X-Men run, all 18 issues. But to make it a little more interesting, we're also adding in the Sins of Sinister timeline. Because it connects so much with this series, we thought it would be very important to add it in here to really understand where Sinister began and how he ended up as a Dominion. We are going to see all of Sinister's plotting and scheming, his attempts at becoming a Dominion Hood, at becoming a god. But as he goes for this, he will quickly learn that there are others out here reaching for the same thing, the three other Sinister clones. And so we get to watch as they battle for absolute supremacy. One thing will be certain by the end of this. Mutant Kind should have listened to Moira. She told them not to allow Sinister onto this paradise. To keep Sinister away from everything. Because no matter what timeline, what era, or what existence we are in, Sinister is always going to be Sinister. Now, make sure you guys have subscribed to the channel. Make sure that you like this video. And with that being said, let's dive into this breakdown. Alright gang, so as we dive into issue number one of Immortal X-Men, we are picking up in Paris 1919. A little bit of a throwback, we see Sinister and Destiny. And with Sinister just doing his casual, usual banter, he does bring up a question about this quote-unquote Nimrod that she has been dreaming of. Something that has made her so very disturbed. And she tells him that a war is coming. This is something that he's not oblivious to. He knows that there will always be a war coming. A war at this point is inevitable. The question that we must ask ourselves, what side are we gonna be on? What side do we believe is gonna be the winning side? And though she didn't come here to discuss philosophy or any of that, she did come to tell him something. And these words are going to change everything. She knows that he is an evil man, but she also fears that their paths are gonna be joined together. And whether they are on the winning side or not, she does believe that they are going to be on the same side. Whispering into his ear, she divulges the information. Being granted this vision, we see him fall to his knees, and he appears to die. Mystique coming out of the shadows. This is something they did not expect to happen. Raven does want to know what information she divulged to him, but Destiny, she is asking to not ask that question. If you love me, if you trust me, I need you not to ask. If the day ever comes, that you truly need to know, I will tell you. But she really does hope that that day never comes. And that's what takes us to Sinister in current day on Krakoa in his laboratory. We're gonna dive into all of the dirty little secrets that Sinister has been keeping from everybody. And the information they give us, it is very vague. He says X-Gene activated to see how something is holding up. Not really knowing what this is, he goes on talking about there being a couple iterations at least. And he's also building up a database, a database that has some kind of logs. 25 of them to be exact, saying that he is 26. And as he looks through all of the files, he is seeing what is on the menu for today, saying that today is a red letter day, that he needs to remember to act surprised, because today is the day that Magneto retires from the Quiet Council. And it appears that Sinister may have already known this information, always looking like he is two steps ahead of everybody. Going into this council meeting, he was very cocky, and also knowing what's gonna happen, he is going to watch everybody's expression. He's going to see where everybody is standing. This will give him an idea of what path everyone is going to go. Well, Magneto lets it known he's retiring to Orocco, that he will be spinning out his days there. We have Sinister going around the room, and he's really more or less profiling everybody on the council. He is a man that has done extensive research on every single one of them. He knows what makes them tick. He knows their motives. He knows exactly how to mold them to what he wants. He also knows so many of their dirty little secrets. One of them being Colossus is a puppet to the Russians. 
and Sinister is the only one that has this information. Nobody else on the council knows about it, but he's been holding it in his pocket. Once he is done looking around the room, we continue with the conversation between Eric and Charles. Xavier wanting him to reconsider. He doesn't want to be here anymore. After everything that has transpired, everything that they have done, and Emma Frost really does call him out. They betrayed her. They didn't bring her into the loop. They didn't trust her. And so she made sure to bring them down. To make sure Moira was taken off of the board. The secret weapon that they have been using this whole time. And to push this even a little bit farther. She is saying that Eric needs to step down right now. That he has no say so in who we pick to replace him. And while Magneto may oppose this. They vote on it. And he gets voted out. He gets removed immediately from the quiet council and while he tries to act like they stabbed him in the back emma frost has no sympathy no empathy whatsoever letting him know like you can go cry somewhere else you can play your little pity party all you would like at the end of the day you have been playing and manipulating everything and you're just mad that you don't have the power and now we have interviews beginning from angel to penance beast Abigail Brand, Vulcan, everybody is throwing their name into the bowl. Everybody hoping to be the new member on the Quiet Council. And after spending the afternoon interviewing all of these candidates, none of them can come to an agreement on who it might be. There hasn't been one solid candidate that has stuck out to everybody. With them taking a little bit of a recess, we see Exodus go have a conversation with Hope. Exodus is really more of the religious zealot type, believing firmly that Hope is the quote-unquote messiah. But he's not the only one to recognize this. Many, many mutants on Krakoa, they recognize her as something very special. Her and the rest of the five, they really are seen as rock stars. They're the ones that bring everybody back. And Hope isn't one for all of this acolyte religious crap. And at the end of the day, she's letting him know, like, what do you actually want from me? What is the purpose of you coming up to me today? With a smile on his face, that is where we pick up back at the Quiet Council. And the Quiet Council is currently interviewing their newest candidates. That being Selene. And she really does lay down, I think, the best defense on why she should be in here. Because while they're looking to replace Magneto, they also need to replace Apocalypse. They never really filled his shoes. Yeah, they gave someone the seat, but nobody that matches Apocalypse. While Destiny may be very powerful, it is not a replace for him. She has skills to offer that nobody else has because no one in that room knows magic that if she were allowed to be brought in that mixture of magic with the five they could almost instantaneously bring everyone back or at least that's the idea that she is proposing might be a possibility using genosha as an example though everyone came back as zombies and kate pride definitely points that out and while she says that wasn't the case but it doesn't really matter the truth is she was able to do it in a day and so bringing her onto the council, it will bring them together. They can use magic and mutant abilities to take the next step, the next evolution in what they truly could be. And while all of this sounds great, this is where we have the arrival of Hope. Walking down the steps, she says that it needs to be her. Coming in uninvited, she is letting them know that we need to cut to the chase. End all of this right now because we all know, by the time I walk out of here, you're picking me. Hope has been tired of the five being left out of everything going on. With them holding the key to everything mutant kind is building, she thinks it is finally time time for them to get some kind of representation. For the last year, she has been playing the good soldier. She has been going on pure faith, and at this point, she is done with it. As Sinister really starts to antagonize this situation, saying, do I hear an or else? And while Hope doesn't say it, it doesn't need to be said. Because if the island finds out that Hope came in looking to get that seat, and the council denies her that, there is going to be a lot of angry mutants who are going to want some answers. And so Selene, she throws out her Hail Mary. That if we're gonna play that game, the external gate that reached Araco, 
Apocalypse made it from the bones of her fallen agent externals. The only reason Araki were here is because of the murder of her peers, threatening the disruption of the gate that it would just go away. With this definitely being an or else, Sinister seems very confident that she is just bluffing. Emma Frost is the first one to speak up and endorse hope, and the power game begins. Exodus is pushing for hope, Sinister letting us know that the Hellfire votes, they should all be pro, because Exodus has struck a deal with them. Also believing Mystique and Destiny are gonna vote that direction as well, but he also believes that everyone else will vote no, saying that he will decide to vote no with them to avoid all of the disasters that are yet to come if hope is brought onto the council. And so the vote goes up, Charles no, Emma yes. Colossus no, Mystique yes, Sinister no, Destiny no, and that no, it throws him off. He was not expecting that. As everyone else starts to cast their votes, he is recognizing he's gonna have to change his. Not sure if Destiny knows that he knows. He needs hope on the council. Calling a timeout, saying wait, he lets everyone know that he is changing his votes. And with that vote change, this is what decides who is on the council. Sinister being the one to break this tie, Hope is now on the quiet council. As Xavier goes to break the news to Selene, we find out that her threat, it was not idle. He made his decision, and now he has to live with the consequences. And from the ocean, we see a giant freak freaking kaiju and i do have to point out what is it with kaijus consistently attacking krakoa it's like the one thing that marvel writers always go to we need something what what can we what can we make up oh we got a kaiju let's make this kaiju or that kaiju we'll just keep throwing them at krakoa maybe one of them will eventually stick but with the gate now being resurrected all hell is breaking loose Krakoa is being set ablaze as Sinister goes up to Destiny and asks the question, why didn't you say anything? You surely saw this coming. Destiny just shaking her head, telling him like you've never understood how my powers actually work because she doesn't see the future. There is no the future. There is no destiny. As Sinister witnesses this kaiju taking over the island, he heads back to his laboratory, telling his computer to take a surface scan of relevant details from his brain and upload them to the clone. He is finding out more and more that there are things he didn't know. Selene was not supposed to escalate this situation to this point, but now he knows, returning to his lab, and so he can try again. And right now he is just talking to himself, trying to figure out the point of divergence, trying to figure out everything that's been going on. Maybe it's magic that is manipulating and helping him not be able to see the whole picture. Because while Sinister really hasn't been discussed too much on what he's doing in these laboratories, we know he's been making clothes, but more specifically, he's been targeting X-Genes. It has been believed that the person is the gift and the gift is the person. But the truth is, he can isolate these genes, isolate these unique powers, and now they become a product. They become a resource that can be exploited. As he continues to upload everything from his mind that happened today, streaming the battle with the kaiju looking for any useful clues. The person that he has been over over all of the years, it really has changed. And this day and age, he has learned that you can't treat life as an experiment because there is no repeating, or at least that is what he believed. We start to truly see his plot unfold, telling us to imagine someone whose consciousness moved back in time to when they were born when they died, erasing that timeline entirely. Now consider that you take this individual, you clone them, activate their X gene, and as time progresses, upload whatever you want to that clone's brain and when you grow bored of this timeline you can kill the clone which in turn your earlier self can download whatever your future self has uploaded into the clone at the later point what he is saying is that he has been cloning moira believing that moira was working on small scale believing that her database of a small 10 lifetimes was some kind of sufficient data to say that mutants 
always lose. Now, Sinister, being the mad scientist that he is, he wants to explore what is truly possible. And it's gonna take a lot more than 10 lives to get it right. Alright gang, so we pick up with Hope Summers looking directly at this monstrositous beast. The one summoned by Selene. And thinking to herself, she's got good news and bad news. The good news, she's on the Quiet Council. The bad news, this is now her responsibility to fight. Of course, she doesn't have to do this fight alone. With many other mutants joining by her side, they are doing every Everything they can to fight this thing off. For Hope Summers, this is like riding a bicycle, jumping right back into the fray. All of her instincts still exactly how they used to be. This is where she finds herself in her best element. As she leads mutants into combat, off in the distance we have Magneto and Storm. Not really sure if they should intervene, Magneto thinks it's a good idea to show a united front. Even not being on the Quiet Council, he was once a member. Him going and fighting this kaiju, with Storm fighting this kaiju. It shows that not only Mars, aka Arako, is united in this fight and the decisions the Quiet Council has made, as well as individuals that are no longer on the Council, but their words still hold some kind of sway. And so Storm and Magneto, they jump into this fight. The two of them together, they are unstoppable. The truth of the matter, each of them could handle this kaiju all by themselves. It may take them a little bit longer to take it down, but this dynamic duo working together, Magneto fills this thing full of shrapnel. And that's when Storm brings down the lightning, splattering this kaiju all over the ocean. Unfortunately, this thing reforms. Destiny begins to get a very weird feeling. Whatever this beast is, it's messing with her ability to see her visions. What they are quickly able to uncover is that this beast connects multiple dimensions. Any kind of hurt that they put on this damages space in that area. It damages the gateways, connections to other world, a little bit of everything. They have to find a way to try and stop this thing without actually killing it. With Hope on the front lines, she starts evacuating as many people as possible. Standing her ground, Exodus does not leave her side, letting him know that when they first met, she had taken his powers. She saw that the more people believing in him, the more powerful he becomes. Exodus being the most religious individual on this island, really next to Nightcrawler. He sees Hope Summers as the messiah, with her quickly blowing that whole shenanigans off, the whole idea that she's a messiah and she's amazing, so on and so forth. Her thing is being able to mimic powers, with them believing in her much more than they do Exodus. Using their powers combined, it gives them the opportunity to hold off these assaults as the two of them are holding their own. Off in the distance, we have Sinister watching all of this unfold. He takes this as an opportunity to show everyone on Krakoa what Sinister is truly all about, believing that a lot of people forgot this, believing him to be a joke. Opening up his own little gateway, he finds himself at the edge of the water. Taking a serum that he has created, he injects it into his own arm. We see him become a literal monster. As Kaiju Sinister rushes in. Charles Xavier has to ask the question, what are you doing? What Charles really wants to know is what the heck did you just do to yourself? This is an experiment that Sinister has been working on, taking a lot of mutant genes and mashing them all together. While this is very unstable, this is the first time that he has actually been able to use it for this amount of time without having any issues. Charles worrying that this might be a bigger problem than the kaiju they are currently facing. Nonetheless, we see Sinister dragging the kaiju out to deeper water, saying that this thing will either dissolve or it will explode. They've already learned that they can't kill it, but they can slow it down. With the explosion, it blows to pieces. Nightcrawler grabbing hold of Sinister and bringing him back onto land. Every time they do this kind of damage, it really messes with space and time. But this is what they had to do 
Duke to get that opportunity to really try to figure out a plan and what the heck they are going to do to solve this issue. Grabbing hold of everybody's mind, Charles has a very, very quick emergency meeting. And they all know at this point, Celine is just biding her time. She is waiting for the mutants to come crawling over to them. Because once they do, she thinks that she is going to secure her seat on the Quiet Council. That they will have no other choice than to bring her on board. And as it stands, this seems to be their only option. So it is agreed that all of the captains, they will hold off the kaiju when it reforms. Charles Xavier will try to appeal to Celine, try and figure out some kind of diplomatic way of solving this issue. As we stand in the eye of the storm, Destiny comes up to Hope and lets her know that she has just had a vision. What she saw was Celine being assassinated, and in a one second time frame, she will drop dead right in front of the window. Now, either by design or by accident, Destiny telling this information to Hope, it gave her the idea. Going and finding magic, getting as close as she can to her, she is able to mimic her abilities. Having mere seconds to do what needs to be done, she finds herself falling outside of the building that Selene is at. Taking her rifle and pointing it directly at her head, she takes the shot. And in that one second time frame, she drops dead. Not any ordinary bullet could kill Selene, but this bullet, the one made of Mysterium, it has the properties of anti-magic. And just like that, she finds herself back on Krakoa. That's what takes us down to the hatchery. We have Selene, who is being brought back to life. And unfortunately for her, when you get out of this egg, it's a little bit confusing. You're still trying to grab hold of your thoughts and, and all of your senses. All of, It's just sensory overload to the max. This gives them the prime opportunity. Exodus grabbing hold of her head. He is able to take control, finds the failsafe shutoff switch for this kaiju. The gate monster disintegrates and flies back to wherever it came from. Just like that, the job is done. And we see how truly brutal Hope can be when her back is against the wall. Picking up a little bit later, we have Hope who is explaining herself to the Quiet Council, letting them know that she took an opportunity and because of it, that Kaiju was taken down. That there were no Krakoan laws broken in this manner. With most of the Council actually agreeing with her, they would have had to bring her before the Council, have a whole trial, put her inside of Krakoa. This avoids all of that completely. Now she waits in queue. The question has to arise though, Charles Xavier asking, when it is her time to be resurrected, will you do it? Hope not giving him a straight answer, letting him know that that is a discussion for another time. Picking up with Mystique and Destiny, ever since that creature had arrived, whatever it did to space and time, it is also messing with her head. In an instant, we see her fall down to the ground, repeating over and over that you're a ghost. Alright gang, so as we get into the Immortal X-Men issue, Issue number three, we are jumping some hundred years ago. The last thing we had seen from Destiny, she collapsed. And we are finally getting some true glimpses into her past taking us to when she was 13 years old, when her mutant powers started to manifest. The first time that she saw the future, it really threw her off. She didn't know what to think, seeing so many possibilities, so many different timelines. She knew that her mutant abilities, this new sight that she was given, this temporal world that she is able to see, it was eventually gonna make her go blind so that she couldn't see the real world, knowing that her time had been limited. Over the course of 13 13 months, she made 13 novels, 13 volumes of her testament. These stories were just for her. We can only assume that she is writing some kind of future. By the very definition of the word prophet, that is what she is. We could say that this is her own bible, stories that would be hidden away and no one else would ever read them. Now that's when we pick up in present day, Emma Frost scanning over her body trying to figure out what's going on with her, and it appears that that destiny is just being overloaded with possible futures. Even for someone as powerful as Emma Frost, this is overwhelming. But right now, they need to get off to a council meeting. While there's nothing super heavy to vote on, Mystique needs to be there. Leaving Destiny to her visions, Emma Frost and Mystique, they head off. 
And of course, Raven cares about her. She loves her with everything that she has. And with that comes concern, comes worry of what she is going through. As she continues to remember her past, we see Destiny going through all of the possible futures. She was able to see the individuals that may court her, how those relationships would turn out, how life would be for her if she chose that path. And so she has known for a very long time that she was eventually gonna meet Raven. In fact, she had been anticipating this, knowing that this would be the love of her life. One of the only people that has ever been able to make Mystique smile. Destiny held absolutely nothing back. This was Destiny's very first crucial Nexus point. And Nexus points, they are very critical to understanding Destiny's powers. Her gift is seeing possible futures. It's all based around chaos theory. Small changes make the future flux. Nexuses, they are landmarks which they can navigate through. They can bring them towards them or away from them. And so things that come after the Nexus point, it makes it much more predictable for them. And while there are definitely other Nexus points out there, Raven is the most important. That is because Destiny has built her entire future around her, around the idea that they are together forever. But falling in love was going to be one of the hardest things either of them have done because the two of them, they had to separate. For them to have a future, Krakoa had to be born. That means Destiny had to die. Krakoa was the limit on everything that Destiny could see. She knew what was possible. She knew that immortality was right around the corner, making sure that Raven knows to bring her back or burn down paradise. The reason she had to die is because of Moira. Destiny would have stopped at nothing to kill her, and in doing so, Krakoa would have never been born. In a roundabout way, this is really a love story. The love story of Raven and Destiny. How Destiny has centered herself around Raven, trying her best to ensure that there is a future where both of them live happily ever after forever. Or at least as far as she can see into the future. Now that's what takes us to the Quiet Council. Hope now officially on the Quiet Council. They have their meeting. As they get her completely caught up on everything, all of the secrets, everything that the Quiet Council keeps quiet. And Hope's first question is why don't we tell everybody? Why do we continue these secrets when it's a possibility it will all burn us down? This is when Hope brings up the helmet that was brought to her by Xavier. Hope trying to figure out why this was done in the first place if you didn't want me on the Council. What we learn is that they are learning this was Mystique. All along she was playing every single chord that she needed. This was so she could bring bring Destiny back. Both Charles and Eric had vowed that they were going to bring Destiny back, but they had no intention of doing so. That is all because of Moira. And so as the Quiet Council, they break into argument. This person's lying to that person. This person's lying to that person. It's just one giant cluster of a mess. While they try to figure all of this out, we pick up with Destiny having a vision just like she did at age 13. Seeing a multitude of futures. A war with the Eternals. Sinister creating his army, and magic ruling over everything. Remembering that these are just possible futures, which means one of them could come true, or none of them could come true. As she looks at the branching timelines, as she looks at all the different possibilities, there are many different branches, but for some reason, she can't see too far, at least in some of these timelines. In one timeline, we see Judgment Day, which is our war against the Eternals. It branches off into many different things. Nimrod Extinction Event, a new Krakoa, the Broken Sword, the Empire of the Red Diamond, and then leading to the Storm System. One pathway leading to the Reign of Apocalypse. Cassandra Nova, another Nimrod Extinction Event. And then there's another one, referred to as the Expanse. This one seems to be the most far-reaching one. While Destiny is looking at all of this, she's trying to figure out why some of these timelines she can't see too far past. As if there is some kind of mutant ability prohibiting her from seeing any further. And so she picks the furthest one away. The one that takes us all the way to the Expanse. 
somewhere far in deep space. All the way out here, this is where we have the reach of a mutant church empire. And we pick up with a ship covered in clones. It can be none other than Sinister himself. Unfortunately, Exodus has caught up with him. But this is not the Exodus that we currently know. This is an Exodus that has trillions of worshippers. And I believe we talked about this in the last issue. Exodus powers, they really are surrounded by the fact that the more people believe in him, the stronger he becomes. Having the potential of limitless power, he is finally caught up to Sinister. After all of this time, after all of his sins, after he burned down paradise, as Destiny watches all of this transpire, this is where she learns the truth. With the death of Sinister, the timeline is reset. At first, this baffles her. How could it be possible this Sinister is able to do this? This obviously not being a part of his abilities. But then she recognizes that Moira can do this. Sinister being the man he is, she knows immediately that he has clones of Moira. That he is controlling the timeline. This is why she cannot see past certain parts. As she comes to this revelation, we pick up with the Quiet Council. They are all still arguing over all of the drama, but Destiny has come to let them know a war is coming. In a matter of weeks, it is going to arrive on our doorstep, and we must fight for our immortality telling all of them that they need to put their petty differences aside. The fate of Krakoa, the fate of mutant kind, is now resting in the balance. Not yet uncovering Sinister's secrets. She's gonna keep this close to the chest. She's not sure how she's gonna use this situation yet. Many of them not really wanting to take her word for it. Emma Frost wants to look in her mind, but Destiny doesn't trust any of them, asking simply to just have faith in her. Faith that she wants mutant kind to survive. As Mystique and Destiny head back to the room for the night. We see Destiny sit down and she begins to write, letting Raven know that when she finishes this book, she cannot read it until it is time, that she will know when that time is, but right now, you can't read it. There is a major reason why she doesn't want her reading it. In every future that Destiny saw, Mystique was not there. Not a single one of those futures. And so to Destiny, if there is no future with Mystique, there is no future at all. Alright gang, so this one is going to be hugely focused around our girl Emma Frost. We pick up the Eve of the Hellfire Gala. Right now, she is tossing and turning in her diamond form. She sleeps like this because she is, she's just scared. At the end of the day, no matter the tough persona that she presents to everybody, when she is asleep, that is when she is her most vulnerable. But this night, she's not getting much sleep. With the Hellfire Gala looming just in the distance, she finds herself very restless. But she's really just speaking about her vulnerability. How she needs to be untouchably perfect. That everything she does is for this nation of Krakoa. Her mission of making sure all these children, everybody is protected on this island. That is her mission. That is her goal. Believing that it is almost a shame that they don't have some huge announcement like they did last year when they terraformed Mars. Though she is going to regret thanking those thoughts. Because when she wakes up the next morning reading the newspaper the daily bugle lets it be known that the x-men are immortal that they have conquered death thinking to herself what is the worst that can happen we pick up after the hellfire gala and she finds herself covered in blood and to explain where this blood came from we take place right after the hellfire gala with the ambassador Ming Yu coming up to her and trying to have a discussion about mutant resurrection. The truth is, a lot of people out there, they are angry. The X-Men have a mortality, and they have been giving medicine to the world to help people live five years longer. Having like a million fires to put out, Emma Frost wants to deal with this guy just a little bit later. Not giving up, continuing to press on, saying that maybe if you just gave it to the elite, to the world leaders, if you could grant them this new gift that you have, maybe we can settle down the masses. 
trying to let him know that this is only for mutants, that they haven't cracked the code of bringing anybody back. It's not as simple as just saying, hey, you're alive again with all of your memories and your consciousness and everything that makes you you. But this answer is still not good enough. This is when she kind of kind of lays into him, saying 16 million. That is how many mutants have been killed by the hand of the Sentinels. And so even if they could bring back humans, what makes them think that they have deserved it when there are 16 million mutants that have died at your hand? At the hands of humanity. While all of you stood back and you did absolutely nothing. Some of them even cheering for this. Many of them made profits by creating these killing machines. This is when somebody comes out of left field throwing a bucket of sheep blood onto Emma Frost. Her husband had just recently died in a boating accident. She's just angry. She is bitter. They can bring themselves back to life, but her husband will never return. And while she can't really do anything about this situation, Cyclops had given her a lot of information at the Hellfire Gala. She gets to bring down one of the worst people in mutant society. That's what takes us to the quiet council meeting, with Sinister up there having a discussion about what they're going to do with this news being out of mutant immortality. Of course, Sinister's thought is, let me clone all of the world leaders and put a kill switch inside of all of them. That way, if they ever step out of line or they try to attack us, we could just end them right then and there. Obviously, nobody on the council actually thinks that this is a good idea. But there are bad things happening out in the world. There is a man who injected himself with mutant growth hormone, hoping that he would get mutant abilities, that he would become a mutant. Then he killed himself, hoping that he would be reborn. Nobody truly understands what this is or how they have resurrection. That part is still a secret. The Five is still a secret, at least to the masses. Orcus, the Eternals, Moira, they all know that the Five is the key to their immortality. This is when Emma Frost, she kind of stops the conversation, taking a pause on this because there is something that is much bigger that needs to be handled. With Sinister in the middle of the floor, she lets it be known that she has memories from Scott from the last couple of days. As they verify all of these memories came from Cyclops. This is when she telepathically sends out everything that she was shared. The X-Men had been fighting Dr. Stasis. Cyclops recently finding out that Dr. Stasis is in fact Club Sinister, claiming to be the real Sinister, and that Diamond Sinister is nothing more than a clone. This is something that Sinister was not expecting. Doesn't crack a joke, doesn't make any of his funny banter. At a complete loss of words, throwing down a little bomb, he teleports out of here. Trying to make his getaway, Exodus is right on his tail. As he pops some multipliers, we see him turn into many. Going to make his escape, he runs into Destiny. Waiting at the gateway, she is letting him know that he can't run away from this. And while Destiny, she could technically stop him, she chooses not to. Getting back to his laboratory, he is trying to figure out how he missed this. Because remember, he has multiple clones of Moira. He is able to reset the timeline anytime he chooses. He has continued to gather information from every timeline reset. Pulling out his pistol, getting ready to burn this timeline. He thinks back to what Destiny just said to him. She told him not to be a coward. She knew that he would be there. She could have stopped him, which means that she knows something. Does she suspect that he has all of these Moira clones? That he has all of these failsafes ready, locked, and loaded? Not really sure what game she is playing at. He really wants to find out where this timeline is going to lead him. And at the end of the day, he can always just blow it all up if he chooses. So he is going to try and play this out and see where it goes. But that's not before he injects himself with a 
a whole bunch of jeans. As he does all of this, he is ready to go face the music, showing up back on Krakoa, coming in peace, letting it be known that he wants to work through this, coming and trying to clear his name. Now Exodus, Exodus just wants to kill him, be done with it, and just resurrect him later on. Of course, Nightcrawler, he has something to say about that. Moira throwing around the idea of the pit, but this is when something happens. A giant beam of light coming out of the sky, and we see Sinister teleported away, with Destiny saying that he was just kidnapped. She begins to talk about the war that is just on their doorstep, believing that Sinister's kidnapping has something to do with this. Destiny still seems kind of unsure where this is all leading, making Emma Frost believe that she either doesn't know where this is leading, or she is lying to them. But one thing that she does know for sure is that Destiny has Krakoa's best interests in mind. She cares just as much about Krakoa and mutant kind as Emma Frost does. And so with Emma Frost going to bed for the night, she gets on her diamond form. She thinks about everything that has transpired and everything that has yet to come. Alright guys, so this issue is labeled The Book of Exodus. You could consider this a real catch-up to his origin story, how it all began, and how he got to exactly where he is. The story begins us 1,000 years ago. Exodus, in the desert, stranded, and on the verge of dehydration, knowing that within a half a mile, there is a good chance that he could be dead. But he knows that Apocalypse waits for him. For him, Apocalypse means revelation. Not sure if this was an illusion, not sure if this is some kind of mirage as he begins to crest over one of these dudes shown before him is the phoenix this is when we jump to the far future close to present day but not quite yet in the moment not quite in the now Around the quiet council table, we have all of the council members discussing the Eternals. Destiny letting it be known that there is an attack that is imminent. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. They're also discussing the matter of Sinister being abducted. They know for certain that the Eternals are responsible for his kidnapping. There is always the possibility that Sinister could be working with the Eternals, that this was them rescuing him. Now we know that that is not the case. We know the Eternals had kidnapped him, but when it comes to Sinister, they really are careful on what they do and how they operate. They've already been duped by him so much that him working with the Eternals is not outside the realm of possibility. Emma Frost, right now, she is genuinely worried. During the Hellfire Gala, she was able to get readings off of people. What she was able to pick up is that Orcus and a bunch of other individuals, other countries, are beginning to see see all of Krakoa as weak, that they might be able to do something. People are no longer fearing mutant kind. In fact, many of them are beginning to get bold. Orcus is a prime example. If the Eternals make them look even weaker, this could be dangerous in many, many different ways. Believing that they should be preparing their defenses. Of course, Sebastian Shaw, he wants to go on the offensive. He wants to make the first strike. But Exodus, he lets it be known that even if we did want to do an attack, many of their cities, they are hidden from reality. Citadels caught between molecules. And so even if we did want to do a strike against them, it would be very difficult to do so. And it is no surprise that Exodus knows a little bit about the Eternals. He has lived for nearly a thousand years. And while yes, he did spend some time asleep, that doesn't mean that he didn't run into a lot of different individuals. Because all those years ago, he fought against the Eternal named Cersei. Not only did he fight, but he won. And in doing this battle, he was able to learn a lot about the Eternals. In mid-conversation, this is when it happens. Almost as if everybody on the Quiet Council goes paralyzed. And he is thrown to another memory. A memory where he stands before Apocalypse. Saving his life. Trying to prove that he is worthy. He was finally an acolyte. He had his herald for the first time in his whole life. 
but it came at a cost. This cost was to kill his best friend. That just so happened to be the Black Knight of this era. The one known as Garrington. Listening to his messiah, this is the first time that he met the Eternal known as Cersei. He was easily able to defeat her. Not only that, he had the life of the Black Knight in his hand. He realized in this moment that he was being tempted by the devil. Apocalypse being that devil. And while Exodus, he doesn't necessarily see this as an insult. In fact, he believes being called the devil is a compliment because Satan is an adversary. The adversary plays their part. Apocalypse may be a vile individual, but he is at the very core of his faith. Exodus, of course, fall into Apocalypse, buried him alive, and left him for dead. Exodus coming back to the now. He knows that they are under psychic attack. The Unimine is upon the Quiet Council, and they are trying to paralyze everybody on the Council to stop them from doing anything, not allowing them to act, trying to shove their consciousness down into their memories, knowing that he has to wake up, throwing him back to a memory where Magneto had freed him from his burial, sleeping for the better part of a thousand years. When Magneto had come for him, Exodus believed this to be his messiah. It didn't take him much time for him to understand that he is now the only true church. That the cross he once bared, you turn it sideways and it is an X. An X that every single mutant carries with them, within their very genes. All mutants carry the cross. Magneto fallen time and time again. It didn't take him long to understand that this guy is not the messiah. He is just yet a prophet to guide him along his path. Magneto no longer on the Quiet Council, Hope Summers now takes his place. Getting back to the here and now, we pick up in the moment where Wolverine saves the life of Hope Summers. This is when the Quiet Council understands the Eternals know about the Five. They know about mutant resurrection and how it is possible. Having a second to breathe, Charles Xavier uses his abilities and he keeps out the Unimind protecting the Quiet Council. That's how freaking powerful Powerful Charles Xavier is. He is able to protect not only his mind, but every mind of the council from the freaking Unimind. This gives our telepaths an opportunity to make a counterattack. Emma Frost, Exodus, and Hope Summers. Charles Xavier on defense. This telepathic strike force is on offense. Exodus letting us know that telepathy, like revelation, it is like seeing. To be truly powerful, to be at your fullest potential, he must see the conflict in terms that his brain can understand, which means he is a knight in the desert, wielding the shield that is Emma Frost, having the mighty sword that is Hope Summers, having faith and hope, and the many-headed beast of the Eternals. The knight fights the dragon off, breaking his way into the Unimind. The Eternals try with everything they can to capture him. This is when he is thrown back to yet another memory, when there were only 200 mutants left alive, when the Scarlet Witch said no more mutants. He was on a pilgrimage seeking purpose, but being able to find nothing, he had taken to torturing his body, standing next to a freaking sun. He did this to try and test his faith. Mortification of the flesh. Before the fire could consume him, he remembered of hope. A child born, the first since the witch swept them all away. Believing that his messiah has returned, he swears to never kneel as long as she stands. This is when Exodus wakes up after being unconscious. Hope and Emma letting him know that they won. They were able to repel this attack. The Eternals are now on the retreat. But even with their retreat, the Eternals, they give out a message to the world, letting the world know that mutant kind has gone unchecked for far too long. That it is now time to erase this excess deviation. And rising all around the world, we see the Hex. Giant eternal beings that are going to be used to wipe out mutant kind. Now, they were really hoping that they would have a little more time before that next attack had come at them. But Exodus has no fear in this matter. Matter, telling Hope to retire to safety and return the fallen warriors. Guard the flame of mutant life 
and Exodus will go to slay these dragons because he is the rock in the hand of Cain. Alright gang, so as we jump into this issue, we are picking up with a conversation between Destiny and Sinister. This is when Sinister let her know exactly how to destroy the progenitor. The Avengers unwilling to do so. The Eternals bound by their principles unable to do so. But mutant kind, they are much more morally flexible, which means they have no problem taking the risk of this destruction. Because this is why the Avengers won't do it. There is a risk that the Celestial could just detonate. We saw that play out. We saw the whole illusion of it. We saw Destiny and Emma Frost connect everybody's mind with what members of the Quiet Council were currently there. They all voted. They voted. They went into battle. The Celestial exploded. Innocence killed. The blast absolutely devastating. Our mutants coming out of the illusion recognizing that their judgment is upon them. The first to be judged is Destiny looking like her mother because this is something the progenitor has been doing a lot coming in the form of something you fear something you hate something that would hit you with the most devastation and while destiny tries to reject the celestial saying that its judgment means nothing she still gets the thumbs down she does not pass she will be part of the reason why humanity will die what she is being judged for specifically is for lying about her gift to achieve it judging her for fearing of losing her. And while Destiny tries to say that there is no destiny with her every fearful action, she shows otherwise. Now this is when we are taken to the Quiet Council after the first battle of the Progenitor. Everyone pretty quiet here because they just got duped and they failed miserably. And with this failure means the judgment of the entire planet. And it appears that we have everybody back on the council. Even Storm is sitting here, though they do not bring up where she has been. We can only assume that she was battling on Arako and that we are going to see that later on. But they have acknowledged that they are now forced to play this Celestial's game. That they are all going to be judged. Whether it be in groups or individually, they will all be tested. Emma Frost has learned from her judgment that this could come to you in any kind of way, shape, or form. Letting the council know that she got the thumbs down. This is because she was playing both both sides. With her not committing to some kind of principles, she was judged poorly. We have Kate Pride. She was already judged, and she passed. Not really sure why she passed, but she does make a joke that she has early nights and she eats healthy. Charles Xavier, he's not even sure if he would notice that he is getting a test or some kind of judgment, because he is still fighting off a psychic siege, even while they have this conversation. He does let them know that if he dies again, he would would appreciate if the council did not bloody their hands at least while he is absent, so he can get his say in. And while all of them discuss judgment, we are taken back to the early days of Sebastian Shaw. This not appearing to be his judgment or his test, but to see what kind of man he is. You know, in his early childhood days, he had tried to go to his father just to talk to him, to feel affection from him. But instead, his father turned him away. And so when Shaw got older, when he made his first million dollars, he brought it to the grave of his father and he burned every single dollar. He wasn't doing this because of the memory of his father. He was doing this to ensure that hell stayed lit, that those fires still burned, and his father along with it. As this meeting begins to adjourn, Storm lets us know that she needs to head back to Arako, that there are still machines up there, and they are destroying a lot of stuff. We do learn that Legion had saved a bunch of people, so we're not sure if Legion died, what happened to him, how he was able to save people people. We have no idea what's going on with Legion. I'm really excited for them to jump back into that because we saw the Battle of Arako and man did they leave us on some freaking cliffhangers. She does reiterate to the council what Charles Xavier had said that if they do decide to do that kind of vote again they will regret not having her part of that meeting. Before everybody does go Emma Frost lets us know that the Eternals want to set up a meeting. They want to set up some kind of pack. Not really sure what this is or how it will be done. 
Sebastian Shaw sees this as an opportunity. Because while many people on this council, they may not trust him, there is almost nobody better to negotiate a deal. And while he has his own agenda, he has his own motives, it still could be very beneficial for mutant kind. To further that, everybody else on the council, they're needed on the island. But before everybody leaves, we see a giant demon arrive. In his hands, it appears to be the Black Knight, the one Exodus knew back in the day. Garrington begging Exodus to save his life that if Exodus is to take his place, he can go free. And while Exodus loves him, he cares about him, the mutant church is still in the cradle. He cannot sacrifice himself for one individual, even for someone he cares about so deeply. As the choice has been made, the demon goes to take Garrington back down to hell. Exodus running in trying to stop this. Right now, the biggest concern is that Exodus is going to get trapped in hell. Now, if he dies, they can resurrect him. That's something easily done. If he gets trapped down in hell, that might be a little more complicated to go and get him. But definitely not impossible when you have people like Magic. This is when Sebastian Shaw, he takes off his jacket. He heads down into the Hellfire completely unscathed. He goes and he stops Exodus. The Hellfire making Shaw stronger. We see the beast fade away. This test is over. The thumb is raised for Exodus. He has passed. This was all a test from the progenitor for Exodus to see how he would react, to see what he would do. Taking us a little bit later, Sebastian Shaw, he is having a conversation with Leland. You see, Sebastian Shaw is a businessman above everything else. And when it comes to making money, there is nothing that he won't do. To include Orcus Shell accounts, ones looking for investments to produce new generation of anti-mutant weapons. Of course, he is going to invest in it. Also being someone who invested in Sentinels. If you were to ask him, does he regret doing that? The only thing he regrets is not getting in earlier to have a few more points. But of course, this was Sebastian Shaw's test. Showing up as Emma Frost. The progenitor lets Sebastian Shaw know that he has been judged and her thumb is down. Now Sebastian Shaw, he is livid because if you're gonna come to me as somebody, why would you do it as Emma Frost? Trying to talk as much smack as he possibly can to the god, it judges him and then it leaves. Leaves him angry and furious. But even in his anger, he has other things he needs to focus on. Headed over to the Hellfire Club. This is where he sits down and he has a meeting. This meeting is with Star Fox, letting him know that the immortal secret, this is what started everything, saying that they'll have to work out something to give up there. He, of course, immediately thinks how he might be able to profit from this, but then he also remembers the judgment from the Celestial. This actually alters what he is going to do in this situation, letting Star Fox know that Krokoa isn't going to strike a deal that would leave a lot of men like himself better off. Whatever happens, it is going to be for the children. And so the two of them, they discuss. Which brings us to later on in the day. A pentagram on the ground. A heart in his hand. And Sebastian Shaw, he doesn't want to die. In fact, he wants to live forever. Sipping the finest of brandies that cost entire planets. He wants power. He wants money. He wants success. He also wants to keep things moving forward. And so he does a ritual. He summons somebody. Appearing before him, we have Mother Righteous. Oh man, I hope you guys are ready for this. This is such a good issue. It makes me very excited to see how all of this is going to come to an end. You know, when we first started Judgment Day, I think we're like 26 issues in at this point. When I first started this, I was really hoping that it was going to be, it was going to be good as we go through the whole comic, as we go through the entire event. And so far, it has not let me down. But this story, it starts us off on Krakoa. This is all taking place prior to our team going inside the progenitor. They are currently discussing the fact that Magneto is dead. That they cannot resurrect him. Not because they are unable to, but because they are unwilling to. These were his wishes. This is when Nightcrawler, he points out that he thinks things are going relatively well. While Magneto, yes, he is dead, and that is not a great thing. They are also no longer at war with the Eternals. 
Now that Star Fox has taken up the role as Prime Eternal, their war has come to an end. And Nightcrawler, being relatively optimistic, he thinks that the world is going to pass. And so while everybody discusses the future, what might come, they have yet to face the ultimate judgment. That is when mid-conversation, there is a thunderous boom. The sky turns red. It appears that hell is now on Earth. The world was tested. Their judgment has been had. The inhabitants of Earth, they do not pass. And so now the Quiet Council, they plan for war. They plan for evacuation. They make their last ditch effort to do something. Now of course there are some ridiculous ideas out there. Not necessarily ridiculous, just absolutely crazy. But so crazy that they, they could possibly work. Sinister, he is out here saying that maybe we just make, you know, a couple hundred clones of Magneto. Regardless if he actually wants to be resurrected or not. No matter the ramifications, no matter the wishes of Magneto. Sinister believes that this is simply the answer that they need. Uh, and oh man, when talking about Sinister, I am excited to get to his part later on. This whole time, Destiny has been stressing, and Nightcrawler has been noticing this. So much so, that he grabs hold of her, and the two of them go falling from the skies of Krakoa. He knows that she is hiding something from the council, and though Kurt would never actually kill her, he just wants to scare her. He wanted her to feel it. Hurling at the ground at that velocity, that is what everybody is currently feeling right now. Right now, she is the only person with the ability to see what will happen. She's got the gift. This is when she divulges that the past path is narrow. It is very uncertain, and if she is being completely honest, it is not a path that she wants to walk. And so she tells Nightcrawler the plan, and with his first act, this is where he goes to Captain America. This is what we saw earlier on. After the first initial attack, we have Captain America who is sitting here, and he is recruited by Nightcrawler. As they make their way up to the North Pole, Nightcrawler had taken a blood sample from Captain America. That blood sample, it then gets passed off to Magic. Captain America goes to the Celestial. He faces off with him, connecting the mind of every human through Charles Xavier. They all hear the words of Cap, and then him and Nightcrawler are completely incinerated. Now, when it comes to Nightcrawler, he is getting backed up live. This is something that they don't usually do. But right now, on this day, they cannot lose any amount of time. Nightcrawler needs to remember everything, even if he dies. With his resurrection, we see see the battle take place. The battle that took the lives of Thor and individuals like Captain Marvel. The world threw every hero that the progenitor needed him to see. Their sacrifice, this was the cloak, the camouflage for everybody else. This is when Hope reaches out to all Krakoans, letting them know that it is time to evacuate. But we need volunteers. We need the progenitor to believe that a good amount of heroes or Krakoans have been taken out. And so people need to volunteer to stay on the island as it is destroyed. And she swears to every single one of them that as long as there is a breath in her body, she will do everything she can to resurrect them, to bring them back to life for their sacrifice. And from the five, we have Egg as the one who has to stay behind. The progenitor needs to believe that the resurrection has been taken off the table. And Destiny informs them that it must be him. That is when their paradise, the island of Krakoa itself, it goes up like a nuclear freaking bomb. Having no idea what this means, the island of Krakoa does not exist anymore. Both Mystique and Destiny on the island when it explodes. Looking like a scene out of freaking Terminator, the heat wave comes over them and it incinerates them. The mutant haven of Krakoa, it is no more. This is when we jump over to Sinister. I have been asking this entire time, what is up with his Moira clones? Why hasn't he reset the timeline? What we learn here is that this is not his first Judgment Day. Talking to himself, even saying, once more, I do not make it through Judgment Day. You see, he has been restarting the timeline. He has lived through multiple Judgment Days, having the opportunity to give himself pointers every step of the way. But he has ran into an impasse. 
every time he comes up to Judgment Day, he doesn't make it out of here, going to upload all of his current memories. The upload fails, trying over and over a thousand times over. The upload continues to fail, deciding, screw it, why not just go in there blind? I don't need to give myself pointers, I can just restart and do this again. He goes to kill one of the Moiras with a gun, but it misfires. And it doesn't say that he restarts the timeline. There is a possibility that he decides not to do it. More than likely, it has to do with the upload. He wants all this information that he has. Information is gold. It is good as any currency out there. And so while he may have hastily tried to take out one of the Moiras with a gun, when it misfired, this could have caused him to reconsider that. To try to find another path. Because the truth is, he can return at any time and restart the timeline. That is what takes us over to Avengers Mountain. As everybody is being resurrected that they want resurrected, one of them is Exodus. And he is livid, because what they were about to do goes against everything that he represents. They are resurrecting Captain America. We saw this previously. And while Exodus, he was very objective to this, when Hope told him that if you think I am your savior, then you need to shut up and you need to sit down. And that straight up humbled Exodus, not saying another word after that. The question now, what do we do next? And currently, we have the progenitor who is trying to destroy the machine. The machine that is Earth. He is trying to activate its self-destruct sequence. But the machine is trying to fight back. Jean Grey and her team, they have infiltrated the progenitor. They know the failsafe exists and now they are trying to get to it. But every single second, the machine, the Earth, is undergoing a, an apocalyptic turmoil. Every second, Earth's population is dropping. If the progenitor is able to succeed in shutting down the Earth AI, if the machine self-destructs, everything will be lost. Nobody will win. That is what leads us to Nightcrawler's secret freaking mission. We have had Nightcrawler who has been dying multiple times. The eggs that they brought along, while they may be limited, Nightcrawler is using every opportunity to learn exactly what he can. With a little bit of help from magic, being able to teleport him from one spot to another. He is continuously finding himself at the Orcus Forge. He has been facing off against Moira and Nimrod. This is why they are backing him up live. He needs to have every single memory. He is learning. He is adapting every time that he jumped into the forge to fight these two. The first time he arrived, he only lasted a single minute before they took him out. He had found Nimrod on the bridge. The second time, he was disintegrated in a split second. But it was just long enough to get the lay of the land. From then on, he has been working how to get to Moira. They have come to recognize that Nightcrawler is here for Moira. And so he has to play them smarter. This time, he decides to go after Nimrod first. Because Nightcrawler doesn't need to hug you to be able to teleport you. Or at least teleport away something meaningful. Just the fingertips. That could be enough. That is where we see him touch the head of Nimrod, and Nimrod's mind is teleported out of its robotic body. Just like that, he is taken off the board. Getting his hands on Moira, he puts a personalized ECM, hunter-killer virus combo, on her forehead. Something that would wipe her clean. He hasn't come here to kill Moira. He has come here with a message. With words from Destiny, from beyond the grave, letting her know that the Celestial will destroy this station in 20 minutes. After everything that they have been doing, it's actually going to be like 3 or, or less minutes at this point. Not really sure if she is able to believe him. They watch from a distance. We see the forge go up in flames. A giant explosion. Moira very upset that they just didn't send a message saying that we need to work together. But that is exactly why he is here. Having Nimrod and Moira, the two of them, they are headed down to the machine. Because if anybody can help save an AI to save the machine it is Omega Moira and so for today just for today 
these enemies, they are friends. All right, gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up in New Mexico, 1943. And our story, it starts off by following Mystique. In disguise, she has made her way onto a military base. That is because Destiny has been up to something. She has been keeping it under wraps, not letting Mystique know what is going on. Curiosity getting the better of her, needing to know what Destiny has been up to. With Mystique knocking out these guards, taking the form of one of them, this is going to give her access to the base. As she gets inside, it doesn't take long for Irene to find her. And while Destiny tells her that she needs to get out of here, Mystique refuses to leave until she knows what is going on. Because what she sees are cloning vats, eugenics, things of this nature. We learn that Irene has been working with Sinister. And while Destiny greatly agrees with almost everything that Sinister represents, there is one very important thing that they agree on. Mutant kind is important. At the end of the day, they are ultimately on the same side and Sinister is gathering all the information he can on Mutant Geno. While they both may think that this work is an abomination, ultimately she knows that this is going to be to the benefit of all mutant kind. At least one day it will. What Mystique didn't understand at the time is that Destiny was already paving the road towards Krakoa, but she is not naive enough to believe that they can trust Sinister. But being here this close, this allows Destiny to to keep tabs on him. With her powers of probability, being able to see glimpses into the future, she is learning a lot and discovering what is a problem and what is not a problem. She already knows that Sinister is going to hide his DNA in certain individuals, from families like Shaw, Sullivan, Xavier, so on and so forth. When he dies, he will try to take over them, a psychic broadcast. But Destiny already knows that this is going to fail. In fact, she knows that a bald psychic is going to give him a thrashing, at least a psychic thrashing, while giving him German philosophy. Even so, Mystique knows that Sinister is going to find a way to cheat death, that he has already done it before. This is one thing that Mystique never fully understood. She never understood how Sinister has stayed alive after all of these years. That is what takes us to London, 1895. We are picking up at 221 Baker Street. This is the office of the great detective known as Sherlock Holmes. The two individuals that we see, we see Destiny as a man walks out of the office. Going inside, we learn that the great detective is in fact Mystique, taking the form of a man. In the year 1895 in London, a woman doing this kind of work is something that is just unheard of. So Mystique taking the form of someone like Sherlock Holmes, going about doing this work, at least in this context, it makes sense. Mystique has just gotten some news. There have been a couple of East London murders. The death toll climbing to six. There has been one lucky survivor, Nathaniel Essex. And so Mystique goes to investigate, headed over to Millbury House. This is the first time that Mystique ever met Sinister. But this isn't the man that we know today, looking very feeble on the verge of death. If you would ask Mystique back then if this man would live for another century, even longer, it would be something that she could not believe. In fact, she believed that he wouldn't even last the year. But as the two of them are invited inside of Nathaniel's home, he has been working on what he calls the excess factors. This is when Irene begins talking about how Darwin sees his theories as more monstrositous than science itself. All of his talk about superior beings, so on and so forth. Before they can get into all the details of the SX factors, this is when the great detective starts trying to question about the attack. He gives very vague details, saying that he was walking and he was attacked from behind, that he was able to survive and there are no more details that he can give out. With him not being helpful in the slightest bit, Mystique and Irene, they head out, with Destiny asking Mystique if she would like a clue, but this is something that she wants to figure out on her own, going and wandering the streets of London, taking the facade of being some helpless woman that just needs somebody to help her home. She walked and walked and walked and she was just waiting for somebody to come murder her. That is when she heard the scream, pulling out a rifle 
and heading in that direction. By the time she gets over there, this is where we see Sinister. He is currently tearing a man apart. Mystique wastes no time pulling up her rifle and going to take a shot at him. Being able to dodge it, he takes off. Getting to the rooftops, he makes his escape. Having unearthly strength, speed, and a mind unhinged, she simply was unable to keep up with him. But this is a thing she didn't need to do, because she knew exactly where he was going. Of course, by the time that she got back to Nathaniel's home, his quote-unquote lair, Irene was already there waiting outside. Destiny knew that he was the one. She knew that Mystique was going to come here. But we see Mystique kick down the door. Going inside, we see a transformation. We see Sinister turn into Nathaniel, letting them know that this is beyond their understanding. But he also learns that these are the Essex men. Beginning to investigate what actually happened to him. He says that he never should have trusted the Egyptian, aka Apocalypse. Apocalypse came to him and gave him a great power. And while Sinister did try to escape Apocalypse, without his leash, Sinister's powers, they seem to be going wild. In fact, they are killing him. The only problem is that he cannot live without these gifts. But he also cannot live with them. He finds himself in one heck of a pickle. One thing he knows is that he cannot die yet. Not that he is unable to, but he doesn't want to. Because at this point in time, Nathaniel knows that something is coming. The battles that the future holds. The ones in the 20th century. He is predicting a war on a scale that is unimaginable. Destiny only confirming that this is a very good possibility. But she also says that there is a way through. He does mention a Charles. We can only assume Charles Xavier, saying that the following century, this is going to be the real trick. By then, he says that his math is saying Charles monsters will be upon them. But what he is hypothesizing is that we are going to see a multitude of geniuses come forth, each iteration being bigger, being stronger. But eventually, inevitably, the weight of this genius, it is going to cause everything to collapse on one another. The weight of it all will crush everybody. But he does have a plan for the long game. Despite his current predicament, he says the monster inside of him will be tamed, that he will make it to the 20th century, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. The only reason that he is telling them all of this, as there will come a day when a war happens. A war between people like them, and people that are not like them. When that war comes, they need to all be on the same side. This is when Irene just knocks him out. Locking him up inside of an insane asylum. They leave him here to live out his days. They are giving him the chance. Believing that his gifts from the Egyptian might settle. He can stay here until that does happen. But there will be no more murders on the streets of London. Hoping that the next time they meet, he is going to be a different person. Inside of his cell, he says that he is going to live forever. That there will be no stopping him. And then something appears in the cell with him. We don't really know what it is, but it glows red. As he repeats red and black, red and black, red and black, saying that this individual is a ghost, the next morning, they find Nathaniel Essex dead. With Mystique killing the guard because he was going to take a bribe, a man that they simply could not trust. They want to keep this as under wraps as possible. The question on if Nathaniel is actually dead. Destiny isn't sure on this. It remains to still be seen. The question is, how much does Destiny know that she wasn't telling Mystique? They knew that Sinister's impact would go far into the future, all the way to the end of her vision, saying that he needed to reach the paradise on the hill on the horizon. That, of course, is Krakoa. But Mystique never learned how Sinister was able to return after this death. That is where we see Destiny Destiny by herself going back to Sinister's home. There had been a door that was chained up. This door leads down to a basement. Inside of that basement, we have four different vats. Each of them marked individually, one with a diamond, one with club, one with spade, one with heart. Each of these vats are broken open. This is where the true story of Sinister begins. Alright guys, so as we pick
take up with this issue, we are getting tons of narration from Kitty Pride. Just another normal day on Krakoa. Judgment Day has passed. Charles Xavier still not talking about Eric. No one having any idea why Nightcrawler has grown horns. But as everybody sits around the table, things on Arako are going very well. The treaty with the Eternals, alliances, reparations, all of this is being had. While Magneto's death is very tragic for them, it seems to have convinced all of Arako of their sincerity. And the Rocky people, they are starting to recognize that maybe, maybe resurrection isn't all bad. Maybe death doesn't have to be the end. Now, of course, Exodus has been very opposed to the idea that humans are getting the immortality, saying that it is an abomination. This is when Kitty Pride stands up and lets him know that the Phoenix Foundation is a good thing. It costs a small fraction of their resurrection, given to a charity body to distribute to those that really need it. Kids in a coma, kids after car crashes, landmine injuries. At the end of the day, they are helping children. This is going to win the hearts and minds. And if none of that is good enough for you, take it from a more perverse aspect. The rich and powerful, they don't get the immortality. It is going to the poor, the desperate, the needy. It's really sticking it to the man. That is even when Hope, she chimes in, saying that even Jesus Christ shared his miracles with the lowly. Exodus a little upset, letting her know that he didn't share his theology so that it could be used against him. Everybody has a good old laugh. At that moment, she truly thought that maybe this quiet council could actually work. A mixture of monsters, saints, and everything in between. They have been through hell, but they are all mutants. They are all fighting together. But that is when Sinister walks into the room. As he goes to sit down, because they are getting ready to talk about Dr. Stasis. We know that there are four versions of Sinister out in the world. One of them being Dr. Stasis. Of course, we're gonna have Sinister saying that he is nothing more than an imposter. That is when Destiny calls out to Exodus, letting him know that Nathaniel is about to kill Hope. Before he can even get his gun out, Exodus, he wishes his hand over, and we see Sinister explode into pieces. Now, for most of the Quiet Council, this is no surprise. Even Sebastian Shaw had a running book on how long it would be before Sinister betrayed the council. Sinister has always been dumb, but Kitty Pride can't help but ask, what is going on? This is the first death. Taking us to a little bit earlier, we have a conversation between Sinister and Destiny. Sinister is a little bit upset that he hadn't been judged by the god, the celestial that came to judge them, the progenitor. He judged everybody except for Nathaniel. This is when Destiny, she brings up the fact that maybe he is not the Nathaniel that got judged. Maybe, just maybe, it was Dr. Stasis who was judged. Heading back to his laboratory, that is when he has had enough. He has learned a lot, but this stasis problem, he believes, needs a permanent solution. He believes that they go back before Magneto left, back to Moira 5, to take a longer run-up, thinking maybe that he goes back all the way to Moira 1, because what he has here are multiple different Moiras, each of them representing a different time and space. The problem is, he really doesn't want to go through Judgment Day, Day again, with the progenitor having the power to stop him from using his engine. He also feels particularly judged by not being judged. He tells his system to prepare two more Moiras. Now, he's been splicing up Moira so much at this point that the genes are looking relatively bad. He is pushing it to its absolute limit, leaving Moira 7 off to the side. Pure science would say that cloning, they could do this indefinitely. Sadly, mutant science is much more complicated. Sophisticated gifts are very tricky. Now, things like wings, eye blasts, all of those he can churn out forever. But collapsing realities to reset the timeline, every clone copy is causing more strain. And so this means it won't last forever. Any individual clone will give him 10 deaths at best. And so now he has 10 shots to try to murder the Quiet 
Council. Activating Moira 6. Activating the X-Gene. Saving his point. Restoring it. Going to download any information. He learns that this is his first attempt at doing this. He is going in blind. He is going in with fresh eyes. Grabbing a gun off the wall. Headed to the Quiet Council. That is when Destiny lets Exodus know exactly what is going on. That is his first death with Moira 6. And so he begins to prioritize. Destiny will interfere, believing that there is one way to sidestep that. Figuring that he will just drop a bomb on the Quiet Council and wipe them out all in one go. Still, Destiny saw that coming. Nightcrawler teleporting all of them out of there. And then Exodus yet again exploding the head of Sinister. With Kitty Pride asking yet again, what is going on? That is death too. As we go for try number three. Sinister walking in there. Mystique grabs hold of him immediately. Destiny yet again letting it be known. This Sinister is going to try to kill Mystique and Destiny. And then he was going to make his play for hope. Now at this point, they thought about maybe taking a peek inside of his head to see what he is doing, what he is up to. But Sinister has failsafes. If anybody tries to peer inside of his head, his head detonates. Kitty Pride left again wondering what is going on. And so we jump to attempt number four. Recognizing that Destiny is just the worst and she throws a wrench into his plan every single time. Believing that maybe he can avoid direct confrontation entirely. What if he goes for somebody other than Hope? Somebody other than Destiny? She may still give a warning, but it will be late. Enough for his plan to actually go into action. Using the idea that Destiny had told them at one point in time that they are on the same side he goes to do his next plan coming in with battle armor hope takes the power of storm and she electrocutes him that is death four death five death six Every single time Sinister tries, he fails. Death 7, Death 8. At this point, Sinister is losing and he only has one more opportunity. I think this is my favorite part of the comic. Because in a vet, what we have is Dark Beast. This is solidifying, or at least hinting towards the fact that the beast that is out there in Krakoa, it is not Dark Beast. Dark Beast is in Sinister's laboratory. He is keeping him captive. Sinister even going out and saying that even if Dark Beast were to be released, he is not the darkest beast any longer. If you have been following the X-Force line, then you are going to know how impactful this is. And so with his one last Last shot, he shows up to the Quiet Council, saying that he has been accused of a psychic imprint from Scott. He is going to use this to prove that he is innocent, telling all the telepaths to examine the signature, saying all real psychics, not plagiarists, like Hope. He does this because he wants Hope to take the powers of Exodus, to peer into this, into his psychic trap. This is a telepathic bomb. It is a cluster of Xavier your brains that he had cloned and turned into a giant psychic bomb. It was a giant stun and a single command. There was a telekinetic pulse, torso height. Everyone dives to the ground except for the telepaths. Hope and Exodus, they are indestructible. Xavier and Emma are not. And that is where we see winged eyeballs shooting lasers from their eyes, causing all kinds of chaos. This is when Sinister goes over to Exodus, using a little bit of Gambit's powers, turning mass into energy. Harry Leland increases mass taking both those g gifts, mixing them together into a murderous communion wafer. This causes Exodus' head to explode, with Hope no longer having his power because he has died. Hope is also not indestructible, and so we see her also expanded and explode. This is him trying to prove that he is nothing like Stasis, that he is Mr. Sinister. He is the original supervillain. That is when we see Sinister bamf out of here just like Nightcrawler would. The quiet council that remains is left in a panic. Without hope, without her, resurrection, the spark, all of it is in danger. They have contingencies that are untested.
tested, but they could work. This is when Kitty Pride begins to realize, saying that she knows what is going on. Someone is about to win Sebastian Shaw's betting pool. Destiny knows where to find Sinister. And so Colossus, Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, Sebastian Shaw, Mystique, and Destiny together. They are going to go hunt down Sinister, and they are going to make him pay. So as we dive into this issue, we are picking up in Sinister's secret laboratory. Right now, he is prepping Moira 7. After his attempt of taking out the Quiet Council, he knows that he needs a save point. He knows that he has to get out of here. Now, we don't know exactly what he is planning. The only thing that we do know is that he doesn't want to go back to Judgment Day. He wants to avoid that entirely. And so he is finding a time and place where he can have a save point and he can restart everything that he is doing. We haven't known the true goal of why he has been targeting the Quiet Council. We just know that he has been trying to take them out. With the Moira clone more than ready to go, there is no data as he goes into this new iteration, which means this is the first time. He knows if he stays behind, he is eventually gonna find his way into the pit, that the Quiet Council is going to send him down there. And so, with this being his first try on the restart using Moira, the rest of this comic is going to have very little dialogue, but we are going to get tons of narration from Charles Xavier. Picking us up with the Quiet Council just being decimated. We see that most of them are dead. From Emma Frost to Charles Xavier, even Hope has died in this. But the narration that we get from Charles is asking if you are suspicious of him. Because at this point, you really should be. Even he believes that you should be suspicious of him. After everything that he has done to be suspicious, he says that this is one of his ways of protecting everybody. That people should be suspicious of him. This is when he goes on to explain. As we watch Cable carrying Hope's body out of here, we see that a good amount of Krakoa, they stand before Cable. This is a very sad day because Hope is instrumental to the future of Krakoa, to the future of Mutant Resurrection. Now, when it comes to Xavier's thoughts, he is saying that he is an idealist, one who experiences have taught him to be practical. That when we talk about Xavier's dream, it is not Xavier's sensible and achievable policy. It is not Xavier's five-year plan. It is a dream. It is intangible. In all reality, it may as well just be nothing. Dreams can be forgotten in the morning so easily. He did not form the X-Men to fulfill the dream. He created them to ensure that there was a world where the dream, any dream, could be possible. Now, when we're on the topic of mutant resurrection, most of this is relatively easy. We have the genetic base that has been provided by Sinister, the host being created, grown by the Five, and then the mine, harvested primarily by Charles Xavier, stored in multiple cradles across the globe. And while this process, it may seem relatively complex, the most complex part about it is Hope Summers. She is what is required to synergize the process. Attempts to perform this process without her so far have been disastrous. She is the X Factor. The question is, can another X gene replicate the X Factor? So far, they are unsure. It has always been thought that if Hope dies, that there is a chance the Krakoan experiment is over. That Hope needs to be kept safe at all costs. That is where we bring in Sink. Somebody who has been able to connect to Hope's powers. If anybody is able to replicate her abilities, it is him. We have seen Sink's abilities grow, become more throughout all of his life, all of his death. His last resurrection, we saw him really beginning to change in good and bad ways. But we see that he is actually able to replicate what Hope was doing. We see Hope coming out of that egg. The word goes out that Hope is alive. 
after that, we have Exodus. We have Charles Xavier, Emma Frost, all of them are being resurrected. With everybody now back in the land of the living, it is time to go after Sinister. Everybody is ready for some revenge. Everybody is ready to take him down. The entirety of the X-Men team, also accompanied by X-Force, also accompanied by the Quiet Council. They are not messing around and it is time to take down Sinister once and for all. With him taking off to a hidden location, our team shows up and we see a Sinister that is frantically trying to get out of here throwing any and all defense measures that he has to include embominations that are iBoy and Cyclops mixed together with getting some more narration from Xavier talking about how he chose the X-Men he chose them very specifically between his gifts and Cerebro he knew who was out there he could have called out to anybody he ignored so many who needed help simply because he wasn't in a position that he could save them. Not yet. Instead, he grabbed individuals like Bobby, like Beast, like Warren, like Gene, and like Scott. Once he had the fundamental team, that's when he expanded the ranks. From Storm to Mystique, Colossus, and Sebastian Shaw. All of these individuals which we see currently trying to take down Sinister. He gathered those that he believed could do the job up to protect a world that hates and fears them. Now this is the part where Kurt is able to come in on Sinister. The Shaw batteries on Sinister's machine are 98% charged. He throws out his last line of defense with Xavier's thoughts letting us know that he birthed a child into this world that can nearly destroy everything with runaway thoughts. Moira's child was a serial killer who could carve reality with his mind. When Jean Grey had lost control, a planet burned. But none of this was done out of malice. Maybe weakness of character and fortune. But Xavier has looked across the table, looked at Sinister, and he is shuddered thinking what could be possible if they chose to give absolute and complete freedom. The truth is, Charles truly wishes this Sinister wasn't needed for Krakoa to become a dream. Now, this is where we see Sinister trying to make his escape. As he jumps into a ship, he thinks that he can make his getaway. Xavier letting us know that mutants are dangerous, that they are right to be frightened of them. This is where we see Hope and Exodus, they split Sinister's ship directly in half. Sinister trying to escape, trying to get away from the wreckage, but it is too late. Xavier and Emma Frost, they have him. Now, with the capture of Sinister, Xavier is letting us know why do you think that he was so worried about the potential of mutants with grandest power? This is because he has a mirror. He has looked into it. He knows exactly what he is capable of. He fears that mutants are as powerful as him, but much more dangerous because he knows what this all can possibly come out to. With Sinister being captured, being brought before the Quiet Council, they have their official meeting, they have their vote, and it is unanimous. Sinister is sentenced to go into the pit. With Charles Xavier's thoughts continuing on, he often thinks about how lucky it was that Eric and him were given these great powers and not somebody more dangerous. In fact, he is glad that Eric never got the powers that Charles has. If their places had been switched, if Eric had the gifts that Charles Xavier does, at his absolute worst, there would be no humans alive today. Now, Cerebro lets Xavier really find all mutants. In other words, this also lets him essentially find all humans as well. If he wanted to, he could work through all of them, placing kind of psychic triggers in each of their minds. A decade's work this could take, but one day he would eventually be done. And on that day, the entire human race would wake up and they would all slit their throats on the same morning at the same time. It could be so very dangerous if Xavier saw the world like Magneto had, or if he were simply a corrupt individual. The truth is, the entire world 
could follow their whims. Sometimes he does question if he is wrong for not doing this. But there is a secret. His secret is that there will never be nuclear war ever. If the doomsday clock ever hit midnight, when all those individuals go to press that button to launch the nukes, they would find themselves incapable of pressing it. If one tried to bypass those, they would also be halted because there is a psychic block in place. He has put it there to save the world from themselves. He did it with a simple thought. And if you're not terrified yet, you probably should be. Now you're starting to see things as Charles Xavier does. With Sinister being put down into the pit, the vines grabbing hold of him and locking him away. With the job being done, as they move forward to a new and better Krakoa, Destiny telling Mystique that they need to leave and they need to do it immediately. Xavier saying that he is terrified of his own abilities, of his own capabilities. And if you are not, you are not thinking hard enough on what he can do. But he knows that he chooses to let people persecute him. The alternative would be death to everybody. He believes himself to be the martyr. So he makes himself suspicious to everybody to keep them all watching him. Just in case he turns down a very dangerous path. He hopes that he has succeeded. He knows that he is far from a perfect person. But every morning, the humans, mutant kind, should wake up. They should be grateful. Grateful that this power and skill is not in the hands of an individual even slightly worse than Charles Xavier has been. Because if that were the case, it would be disastrous and neither species could possibly survive it. This is where it is exposed that underneath Charles Xavier's helmet, there is a diamond. This is in fact sinister. He has taken over Charles Xavier's place, taken on his face, taken on his powers, taken on his abilities, and now the entire world is in jeopardy. Alright gang, this is the story that I have been waiting for, that I have been so freaking excited to have come out. This story drops us 10 years in the future from when he got dropped into the pit. We see a Sinister that is hatching eggs. All of them reaching up to Sinister. He says, to me, my me's. But to get to this 10 year mark, we have to start in present day. And in present day, just recently, he went after the Quiet Council. As soon as he did and he recognized that they were coming after him, he booted up one of the Moira clones. And so this is one of the timelines that he is testing out. This is his first attempt at it. So we're going to see how it all plays out until he ultimately decides to reset it and start all over again. That, of course, is if he is not successful. If Sinister is able to get everything right, there would be no point in restarting everything. Now, as we pick up in Charles Xavier's room, exactly where we left off with Immortal X-Men, we have Emma Frost, Exodus, and Hope that all come into the room. We are quickly learning that they are also Sinisters. All of them being able to hide their diamonds when they are around other people. But when they are with one another, they are more than willing to show off that red diamond. This is letting us know that when Sinister killed the Quiet Council, or at least a good amount of the members, when they were resurrected, they had been tampered with. This was all a plan by Sinister, and with their resurrection, Sinister has taken over. Though he may be in the pit, these other Sinisters, they are running everything. That is when Charles Xavier goes on to let everybody know that with Sinister being gone, it is time to reconsider their program. No more reformed criminals on this quiet council. But he wants a new Krakoa. He wants a kinder Krakoa. Wanting to share more with humans and give them accessibility to immortality. Emma Frost playing her role, she objects to it, saying that they must take care of themselves, that you have all the dead Genotians that have yet to return. 
but Charles the Sinister Charles. He believes that the bigger stake humanity has in Krakoan's success means that they will not attempt to attack. While the deliberation goes on, this is where Storm interjects. Storm, not taken over by a sinister, because she cannot die. If she dies, it is a permanent death. And this idea of sharing more of the immortality with humankind is something that she is on board with. But the practicalities are what concern her. Is this something that they can actually do? With Charles going on to say that Forge more than likely has the skills to pick up where Sinister had left off. Now we're gonna jump one year into the future. We have the reporter Ben who is going to JJ. The two of them are meeting in secret, with Ben pulling out some kind of device from a suitcase. He grabs JJ and he sticks him with it. After seeing the results, he is relieved, because Jonah is still the same individual. He is yet to be taken over. This is where Ben goes to explain that the mutant gift, having the limited X-gene implanted to guarantee their immortality, he has the evidence to prove it was all a Trojan horse. That if you have this gene, you can be taken over at any time. And even if not, it still warps you, pushes you to your worst impulses. They have had politicians all over the country that have already taken this. He knows that the X-Men, Krakoa, mutant kind, they are pushing to take over the world with smiles on their faces. This is when Jonah exposes that he in fact has been taken over. He is a sinister. Jonah going on to explain that mutant kind is the one that put out that test. But it was all fake. It was all done to lure paranoid individuals like Ben. As dozens of other individuals cram into the room, they grab Ben and they take him out of here. That is what takes us back over to Krakoa. With Forge now being a sinister, he has created a weapon that will destroy Krakoa. As we see a bolt of energy land on this island, Cypher having a conversation with Krakoa. That is when a sinister Wolverine comes in from behind him and he opens up Doug's chest. That is when Emma Frost talks to the world, bringing a very grim message. They are blaming this attack on Orcus. Letting the world know that Orcus killed their living island. They wiped the banks of all psychic imprints. And while they have another method to retrieve mutant ones, the humans' minds are lost forever. That their immortality has been stolen away from them. Emma Frost saying that they will act against Orcus immediately. With the Avengers joining the ranks in the fight against Orcus, this was no fight that Orcus could win. Even with Nimrod on their side, with Moira Sentinel letting Nimrod know that he needs to run, but Nimrod refuses to stand down. Between the minds of Forge, Reed Richards, and Tony Stark, they are able to take down Nimrod, with the day being won. Orcus no longer on the map. There may be small remnants that were able to make an escape, but Orcus has been defeated. And then there's a conversation between Captain America and Cyclops. Cyclops talking about maybe getting that X-Gene so that Captain America has a mortality, making him a quote-unquote honorary X-Men. And as we are taken back over to Krakoa, this is where we have the return of Sinister. Now being able to take himself out of the pit without any concern that anybody may interfere. All of his minions begin to report into him, letting him know how the plan has progressed. That Krakoa is dead, Earth is compromised and there is no one left to know that he has been released from the pit. This is when Sinister goes to his secret hideout. As he sits here and he talks to himself, we are learning that he did in fact hide something in everybody's DNA, giving them access to his gene library. He had promised of course that he wasn't going to tamper with anything, but we know Sinister, and of course he was lying. 
He had buried a copy of himself and a little bit of extra spice in everybody's DNA sample. Anytime anyone died, they'd be compromised when they were brought back. This seemed to be a perfect plan. The only problem, it didn't work out how he had planned. It had taken him a lot of Moira resets to truly understand what was going on. The problem was always hope. Whatever her weird mutant gift is, she was fixing all the meddling this Sinister had been doing. She had to be the one to be compromised first for the whole thing to be compromised. But killing Just Hope would have been suspicious. That is why he killed as many members of the Quiet Council as he could. And then getting himself thrown into the pit. This means that he is away and no one can point the finger at Sinister. And now, the X-Men are all his. The X-Men are him. Everything is Sinister forever. Now he's going to sit back, he's going to watch as this commences, planning to sit the next 5 years out and just observe. Getting reports that Thanos was going to attack yet again, as he tumbled through the time streams. A psychically manipulated juggernaut volunteered for this mission, held as a hero as he was loaded into a forge crafted temporal cannon temporarily miniaturized via an application of Micromax. Hope borrowing Domino's powers and taking the shot, we saw Thanos' brain matter is scattered across 2 billion years of history. Juggernaut emerging into reality, left accelerating into space. There has yet been no attempt to go out and retrieve him. And of course, Victor Von Doom, Recognizing that Krakoa was becoming too powerful, he went to Namor. He went looking for an alliance. It was only too late that he recognized Namor had already been taken over. And so Doom is replaced by a cloak, fully under the control of mutants. There is a solo remaining Doombot claiming the mantle of Doom. There have only been a handful of number of sightings, but what remains of Orcus, they say that Doom is working with them. So it is possible that Omega Sentinel and Doom are working together. Next is the Eternals. The Iraqi people, they release Uranos. That one hour that they have, they open up the gates to the machine and they let him go loose. The Eternals are defeated. They are safely stored away in a stasis engine, and Uranos, he is sent back to his prison. When it comes to the Fantastic Four, Reed Richards is considered to be too dangerous, an unmalleable individual. Many people believe that he put in some kind of, some kind of psychic lockout. He put in failsafes to prevent any kind of gross tampering. The only problem, Reed Richards isn't the only one on the Fantastic Four. Ben is the one to be compromised. A mystique gene allowing him to return to his human form. After the sinister gene had done its work, he wanted one more thing. For them to die like he had lived. And so Krakoa provided a mission passing through cosmic rays. The Fantastic Four had disappeared into the void to never be heard from again. And then it comes to what is left of the Avengers. The Avengers are pushed to increasingly extreme, antisocial, and very dangerous actions. This climaxes in war, when Captain America takes control of the US government after murdering the sitting president. Thankfully, the X-Men were there to save the day. By the end of the X-Men Avengers War, the X-Men are all hailed as Earth's mightiest heroes. That is what brings us to five years into this timeline. At this point, sitting around the Quiet Council, Storm is one of the few individuals that has not been able to be tampered with. At this point, she has also recognized that Nightcrawler is not in fact Nightcrawler that this is some kind of replacement. This is where we see the main Sinister come into the room, having Nightcrawler, but severely, severely turned, changed, manipulated. 
Sinister has been messing with his genes. Storm not understanding how Sinister is here. He was supposed to be in the pit. This is when it is also revealed to her that everybody on the Quiet Council, they are Sinister. Sinister going on to let Storm know that she has always made things hard. Deleting herself from the resurrection protocol meant there was no killing her to bring her on board. Psychic meddling was too much of a risk, but at this point they are left with no other option. Emma Frost and Charles Xavier are going to do their thing. What they were not aware of is Storm took precautions. She recognized that things weren't going right. That is where she uses Laktuka. He had sewn in a defense into Storm's mind, that her mind will become linked with his infinite one. The intruders will be pushed away, because one cannot hold the ocean between their fingers and come out the other side. That is where we see the storm come down. The lightning, the thunder, the hurricane winds. Storm recognizes she has to get out of the situation. Leaving the Quiet Council in rubble, she takes off to Peru. And this is where she runs into Destiny and Mystique. They took off at the very beginning of all of this. They have been laying low and hiding out. Destiny letting Storm know that they are going to lose this fight against Sinister if they are not working on the same side. With Sinister no longer concerned about Storm, at least for the time being, Sebastian Shaw becomes Krakoa's emissary to the various Hells. Thor had left the Avengers as they had turned evil, retiring to Asgard in depression. With Sebastian Shaw making a Hellforged deal, he was able to borrow a certain sword. With that sword and magic, Asgard and all of its inhabitants, they are propelled away from Midgard. Sinister going after the Scarlet Witch for no reason other than just in case. This is also where we have the first generation of true Chimera that are born into the world, splicing two X genes into one body. With Storm believed to be hiding out on Arako, attempts to detain and murder her have all failed. Evasion of Arako with the Stage 2 Chimera. This allows an insert of a Legion clone into the planet's core. With a psychic prompting, two seconds of complete loss of control, this is more than sufficient to end this entire planet. But Storm's fate, it is still left unknown. That is what jumps us 10 years into the future. Everybody is lining up to get their X-Gene. And while we have Foggy out here trying to let everybody know that this is nothing more than control, that you have to stop, we have Spider-Man, or what was once Spider-Man, now going by Night Legion, letting them know that this is all for the good. It is all for the better. Grabbing Foggy and taking him off, Sinister lets it be known that the people are here because they don't know. The people are begging for this. Now that they have control over everything, there is no longer a reason for them to hide their diamonds. They flaunt them. They gloat them. They expose them to the world. Now the other members of the council do bring up the concerns of the empires that are out in space. That inevitably they are going to come. They are going to try to take us out. There is also what remains of Orcus. There are still many threats that are left. And while the main Sinister says that none of this is really of concern, Emma Frost, she says why not put this up for a vote. As they prepare for their space war, the main Sinister is a little bit confused, even surprised. He believed that he had more pool around here. This is when he learns that the other Sinisters, Charles Xavier, Emma Frost, Exodus, and Hope, they have all been tampering with things just a little bit. While they are the Quiet Council of Sinisters, they believe that they should all be ruling together. Now, Sinister recognizing that they've all teamed up together. For the time being, he says yes. Of course, this all makes sense. As he takes off and he goes to his secret hideouts, he curses them, recognizing that this all went to hell. 
he needed their personalities, but he believes that he gave them too long of a leash. He was hoping that he had gotten a little bit farther in all of this, but he learned a lot. This is much better than most of his first Moira runs, so now he wants to sweep the board, clear it all out, and start over again. But his teleport does not work. And so, he has to go there physically, knowing that he is going to have to move the location, because going here physically has gave it away. But as he makes his way down into his laboratory, what he finds is that it is all gone. Somebody has stolen his lab. Someone has stolen his Moiras. And now, he is trapped in this timeline. Alright gang, we are jumping 10 years into Sinister taking over everything. And Storm remembers how Arako had died. She remembers confronting the Quiet Council. She wanted to know why, and when she arrived, she quickly learned exactly what was going on. That Sinister had taken over all of them. Barely being able to escape via a psychic failsafe implanted by one of her friends. In that moment, she was ready to go to war. But Destiny had told her to wait, and so she found what mutant she could, called in every single favor that she had. They were ready for anything, but they were not ready for everything. Everything all at once. Sinister threw everything he had at them, and of course he blamed the attack on the scrolls. All propaganda to serve his bigger goal. But Storm and the others knew that these were the Chimera. While Storm and the Brotherhood had been planning, so had Sinister, and he left nothing to chance. They had fought against all hope. They fought knowing that they would lose. This is what it means to be from the broken land, to be a Rocky. But now the people, they have scattered across space. Some of them remain hiding in the asteroid fields that was once a Rocco. The planet now destroyed nothing but rock floating in space. This is where Storm and her Brotherhood of Mutants call their home base. They hide away here, unbeknownst to Sinister, waiting for their opportunity. This is where we see a conversation between Storm and Destiny. Destiny had told them to wait. She had said not to attack immediately. Now Storm is wondering, was that a good idea? Were the premonitions wrong? Because she sits on this broken land, this tiny piece of rock that is floating out in space. At this point, Storm is blaming Destiny for everything that has happened, but she is also skeptical on if this is actually Destiny. This is where we see Iron Fire. Coming up from behind her, he recognizes that this is not Destiny. Body language being off. Vocal infliction too precise. As he drives that sword that is connected to his arm directly through her stomach, we see that this is Mystique. He had already known this when he went to attack her. That's why he wasn't too concerned about stabbing her, because she is going to heal back from it. With Storm going on to say, why are you here? Why have you come here? She says it is to protect her wife. But she does come with a message. The message of what Sinister has truly been up to. Finally, the news is out there. Sinister has a secret cloning facility dedicated to a secret clone. That clone being Moira. That he activates her mutant gene and uses it as a safe spot. The clone's life began 10 years ago. That is the most recent save spot. If they destroy the facility, they kill the clone. They reset time. They go back 10 years to when all of this started. And while there's no guarantee that events won't play out the same way, at least they will have a chance at saving everything. Storm only taking a moment, but then turning to John Ironfire and letting him know to assemble the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood made up of Cable, Korra, Wizkid, Iron Fist, Quick, now Mystique being a part of this as well. And of course, the wonderful, the powerful, the beautiful Storm herself. 
as our team body slides in to Sinister's secret island. The team not really sure if they are able to trust Mystique, but right now that is not their concern. This is when the Chimera attack. A combination of both Maggot and Maro. Every bone in their bodies is a flesh eater. While Korra and Quick, they focus on these individuals. We have Storm. She creates a tornado. She is tearing up this island, digging herself into the ground. She takes Wizkid and she takes Ironfire along with her. They make their way into the sub-levels, and what they see is a chimera unlike anything they have ever seen. It is a living force field. This is where Wizkid does his thing, using some new technology that he just created. He starts trying to break down the impenetrable field. Meanwhile, Iron Fire and Storm creating a conduit with their powers, Iron Fire throwing out iron rods in all directions and Storm electrifying them. We see the electrical current going through all of these Chimera. With Wizkid initiating his program, we see this entire thing teleported out of here. The entire lab, force field and all. The day has been won. The lab has been stolen. This is going to buy them just a little bit of time. With Storm turning her back on Wizkid, we see him stand up and he drives a sword right through her stomach. Asking Iron Fist if he was able to spot her this time. Because this is not Wizkid, this is Mystique. Mystique played Iron Fire for a fool. All of the body language, the vocal infliction, she has been faking it for years for this moment. That the Mystique that was on the surface fighting with Cable and the others was nothing more than a hard light hologram. When Iron Fire goes in to kill her, that is where we see her able to translocate out of here, leaving Storm in a very wounded position. John Iron Fire calling for a medevac. That is what takes us to the world farm. Mystique is returning and we have Destiny who has been waiting for her. This all went according to Destiny's plan. The Brotherhood took care of Sinister's defenses and Mystique took out the leader of the Brotherhood. With no storm, they believe that she is no threat, that the Brotherhood is no threat. Also saying that it is relatively ironic that if they hadn't lured her into action, the timeline would have reset. And then there is another voice, letting Destiny know that this individual knows him very well. That this chaos he unleashed was his idea of a controlled experiment, but he is no longer in control. Going on to ask Destiny why she doesn't want to fix the last 10 years. Destiny letting us know that it is simple. In this world, right now, her and Mystique are alive. That is the only thing she cares about. Refusing to gamble with this idea, that is why she is not restarting the timeline. Our mystery individual going on to say that there is only one winning card. That there is an endgame. At the end of all of this, there can only be one of us who has dominion. And that is when it is revealed to us that this is Stellaris. It is the Spade Sinister. And he now has control of restarting the timeline. Alright gang, so this story is picking us up in New Essex, also formerly known as New York City. We pick up at the Sanctum, once the house to Doctor Strange. This house being empty, what we find is the spirit of variance. What is unique, after 10 years, the spirit of variance and Banshee, they are both here. They can communicate with one another much like Johnny and Ghost Rider might be able to. They find themselves inside the sanctum looking for items of power. Unfortunately for them, Sinister's army, his Legion of the Night, they have shown up. These are his Chimera, his secret legion spliced together by Nightcrawler. Using individuals like Wolverine, Spider-Man, Domino, he has created the ultimate weapons. And the Legion of Night is now descending down on the spirit of variance. Having no other option, they used the Scream O Change. Previously, this had never worked on any of the Chimera. 
The Scream is a reordering of the mind and spirit. They have tried this on countless Sinisters, but they have found that their core cannot be shaken free. The infectious ego is simply too strong. But right now, they have no other option. Screaming into the face of the Chimera Wolverine, we see her put it pause. And then in an instant, we see her begin to attack the others that are still inflicted by Sinister. That is when the spirit of variants begins screaming into all of their faces, as many as he can, as quickly as he can. With half of the Legion being taken over by spirit of variants, we see that the rest of them, they want to scatter. They want to inform the council of exactly what is going on. But before they get the opportunity to leave, we see the Chimera that is both Nightcrawler and Domino opening up a teleport, taking some lucky shots. Every single one of these shots meets their target. What remains of this Legion of the Night, they have all been assassinated right here on the spot. And what remains of the Legion of Night, they now find themselves needing somewhere to go, needing some kind of direction. These are all creations of Sinister. Now that they have been broken free, they need to know what are they for, and what is their higher purpose? This is what brings us to Luna, the House of the Fall formerly known as the Summer's Home. We have Mother Righteous and the Spirit of Variance. They have come here for a meeting. As the two of them go inside, we quickly learn that they were not invited to this meeting. This meeting is between Stellaris and our Dr. Stasis. This is a meeting of the Sinisters. Stellaris being the first chair of the Galactic Rim. Dr. Stasis being the captain of the Orcus remaining forces. They have yet to fully understand who Mother Righteous is. But with her coming in and crashing this party, she lets it be known that the X-Gene that had got bewitched, she has been working in secret to reverse this hex. If you guys have been following Legion of X or anything going on with Nightcrawler, you will see that he has been inflicted with a secondary mutation, causing his mutation to go haywire, turning him into nothing more than a monster. Mother Righteous has been working in secret to reverse all of this, years to fix it, with spells, sacrifices, deals, all of it. But it is finally done. Dr. Stasis not really happy with this decision, because Orcus had commissioned that hex. While it lasted, Sinister was unable to exploit some of the most dangerous bloodlines. But ever since this was reversed, we have seen Nightcrawler Strain being used to build hit squads. This is when Mother Righteous takes off her mask and reveals that she is the Heart Sinister. One that doesn't have any kind of narcissistic delusions that she may be the one true Sinister. She knows that she is not the original. But she didn't come here to talk about that. That is where she has the spirit of variance attack. Going after the club sinister. We see this battle break out. And while Dr. Stasis may believe he has the opportunity to overcome this situation. That is where we see the Legion come in. The Chimera that were once saved by the Spirit of Variants now work for Mother Righteous. They are new disciples, and they come in here fighting with a fury. As Dr. Stasis throws out every defense in his arsenal, and may look like he has the upper hand. When he grabs hold of the Wolverine Chimera, about ready to rip her to pieces, but that is when her Nightcrawler tail comes out. And that tail also has one of the Wolverine claws, putting that right into the head of Dr. Stasis. He is taken out of the game, with Stellaris saying that that was a beautiful display because Stellaris had hired Mother Righteous to assassinate him. The reason Mother Righteous did this is because she wants some answers. This is when he divulges that he stole Sinister's lab. They didn't want him resetting reality. That is because he has the processing power of the world farm, crushing possibilities to find a path to the highest throne. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, nobody can access the Moira clones now. And so what Stellaris is doing is allowing Sinister's Chaos to wipe out any threat they could face against him. 
he doesn't have to lift a single finger, and Sinister is doing all of the work for him, believing that eventually the possibilities will lead to him being in control of everything. Stellaris only asks one thing of Mother Righteous, to stay out of the way, that if you stay clear, you will have safe passage. With Mother Righteous needing to take this information in, she tells Vok Ignis and the rest of her legion that they need to go out and they need to find new recruits, new resources, and new believers. And so this takes them to the Savage Land. It takes them to Namor. It takes them all over the world looking for people and artifacts that they may be able to bring to their side. That is what brings us to the prime cloning facility where this legion had actually been created. As they look around, what they find is Dr. Nemesis and the original Nightcrawler. Mother Righteous had dissolved the spell which afflicted him over a decade ago, but the effects are still persistent. He grows more monstrositous and more mindless. All it would take to set him back to his regular self is a resurrection but unfortunately right now sinister is the only one that has control over resurrection as the legion goes around and they begin to rescue those that they can adding a few more members to their team they are freeing them from sinister's grasp and they are joining forces against something even greater at this point both banshee and the spirit of variance they're a little bit concerned on what they are doing is it good or evil? Are they doing the right thing? And the spirit of variance, he lets Banshee know that he's not really sure if this is all good or bad. What he does know is that the Legion, also known as the Nightkin, they are happier free. They are kind. In the very heart of their soul, Nightcrawler is still in there somewhere. That spark, it is still very much alive. But if it does prove that they are in the service to evil, then they must trust in the instinct of the Nightkin. They must trust in them to find a better way. That is what takes us to Avengers Crater, formerly known as Avengers Mountain. Her legion have come with all kinds of artifacts. They have the Book of the Spark. They have a Limbo Rifle. The Brain of Cortez. Sinisters hang these everywhere to boost their powers. This is when our Mother Righteous, she shows us a vision. She shows us the laboratory. The giant chimera surrounding it, keeping it encapsulated. And it is surrounded by flames. This place stolen, protected, and hidden. It is only through remote viewing that she can even get a glimpse of it. Going on to say that this is the dark heart of all sin, and it is up to them to cleanse it. That there are others out there that were working against the devil, but they are unwilling to join forces because they have their own goals and plans in mind. What Mother Righteous wants to do is create a weapon, a holy weapon that they must build. Properly deployed, it'll purge the sinister strain from the heart of every mutant. It will do this with the white hot fire of faith. All they are missing is what is on the inside. This is when one of the Legion members steps forward. Our Nightcrawler Spider-Man, he is the one to step forward. To say that he will go in, he will try to get into this laboratory. Though this may be a suicide mission, these are the faithful. They are willing to do anything that Mother Righteous demands. Using the Cortez brain, we see him bamf out of here as he makes his way to the world farm where this is all hidden away, where the laboratory is hidden in flames. As he begins to teleport into it, we see that there is a teleportation barrier. In an instant, this chimera is wiped away, with Mother Righteous saying that the boy died for love, the love he bore for his kin, love for the world, love for the sacred spark inside of all of them. Asking what his name is, they all called him Wallcrawler, and much like some Fight Club stuff, we see Mother Righteous begin to say the name Wallcrawler. She says it over and over, all the others also begin to say it. As if in death, he now has a name. His name was Wallcrawler. And a new ritual is born. This is when Mother Righteous tells them that it is time to get to work. 
while you were made into the ultimate killers, she is going to use them as holy thieves, the buccaneers of light. And what they are to steal are the instruments of the gods. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up in New Essex. This is 10 years in the future. The world has been taken over. And there are still small groups of individuals like Nick Fury that are trying to fight back. We see them on this evening planning an operation. They plan to put in a virus that would bring down the entire Cerebro satellite system. They believe that this is their best way to really forging a new resistance ever since Orcus was taken off the board. As our team heads out, they all jump out the window. Jumping out the window, they all fall down to the ground, they fall to their death. Just like that, Nick Fury and his team are done for. That is what takes us over to Krakoa. We have the sinister Charles Xavier that just took them out. This is what individuals like Charles and Emma have been up to. They use their powers and abilities to take down these cells. But what we do see is that Sinister let them keep a little bit of their personalities. This is something that he is now regretting but cannot reverse. Because while they may be Sinister, there are still very much remnants of the people that they used to be. For example, Charles Xavier, he finds doing all of this killing of these terrorist cells, he finds it a little bit immoral. He finds this hard to do. He wants the dream to be real, that they must perform these acts to ensure the safety of the dream. But more than anything, Charles wants them to submit. He doesn't want to have to kill all of these people just to get everybody on board. He wishes that everybody would just come to the dream. While Emma Frost, on the other hand, she has no problem killing all of these cells. In fact, she enjoys doing this work. Now, as these two have a conversation with Charles saying that he wished Magneto was here, only so that he could finally realize that Charles was right and he was wrong. With them being interrupted by Hope, saying that they need to have a quiet council meeting. That is when Emma Frost psychic projects everybody to the quiet council room. And in this quiet council meeting, this is where we really see that their personalities are still there. For example, Exodus, he is very much still a believer in hope. Even though she is a sinister, he still believes her to be the messiah. While Hope on the other hand, she is taking the path of Cable. Even going as far as getting a cybernetic hand that has a grenade and a gun inside of it. But with this quiet council meeting, they are talking about the prospects. About the future of Krakoa and mutant kind. The problem is, they rule Earth. They are growing even more powerful, and the galaxy is beginning to notice. They are theorizing that within 1 to 10 years, they are going to see a galactic war. Most likely, this is going to be by proxy. But within 10 to 30 years, it is undeniable that one of the empires in space, they are going to declare war. After 30 years, if they are still standing, they are an undeniable threat. More than likely, there will be a super alliance. Two major powers will join up with them. Possibly the Kree and the Scroll, maybe even the Shi'ar Empire. But Hope isn't sure that they can make it to that 30 year mark. In fact, she is theorizing that they don't make it past year 17, unless they do something drastic. Her conclusion, they need bigger guns. They need bigger weapons. With Sinister heading back to his secret laboratory, his second secret laboratory. When he arrives here, there is another Sinister waiting to have a conversation, asking who is he and where is he. Now, Sinister created this clone of himself just to have a conversation. He needs somebody to bounce ideas off. The more he talks this through, the more he will find an answer. He will find a conclusion to what he is trying to figure out. Not being able to trust anybody or anything, he created himself 
And so these two, they have a talk. The biggest problem, his secret laboratory had been stolen. He needs his Moira's back so that he can reset this timeline and fix the issues that he has come across so far. And of course, he's tried the obvious techniques and came up with nothing. And while he may be ruler of the world, he is still answering to a quiet council. Even if that quiet council is made up of himself, he also worries that they may find out about the Moiras. That once they realize the Moira engines exist, they will all be trying to come for it. There is also a trigger fail safe. A psychic inferno that he is going to use to kill all sinisters. This would kill anybody that is not him. The only problem this failsafe is also in the secret lab with the Moiras. So even if he wanted to kill everybody and then just start from scratch, he doesn't have that capability until he finds his lab. And so now he needs to try and reinstate control. A gene update, saying that the override will be Beast doing, but also believing that there is not a day that he is unable to beat Beast, that he will confer with Dark Beast for his perspective. But Dark Beast's head is in the secret lab, so a manual reinsertion of the control protocol is his only option, though it may be a big risk. With him being done with this conversation, he clicks a button and we see this sinister begin to melt down because he trusts nobody, especially himself. This is where we see Sinister sneaking his way into Emma Frost's room at night, getting ready to inject something into her neck. We see that the needle breaks on her neck. This wakes her up and he finds himself very much confused. The truth is, Emma Frost has been sleeping in diamond form for a very long time for, for so many different reasons. More specifically, for individuals like Sinister who think they can come in and just end Emma Frost. You see, she keeps a little mastermind up all night on a cocktail of amphetamines making sure that she stays invulnerable, making sure that nobody recognizes her in her diamond form. Sinister recognizing that he messed up, he opens up a portal and he gets out of here. Emma Frost getting the Quiet Council assembled, they are about to go on a hunt. And it doesn't take long for Emma Frost to find exactly where Sinister is hiding. Being able to get a surface scan of where he went before he left, she knew the exact location. That is where Sinister pulls out a gun with the combination of both Cypher and Banshee. This is supposed to read the frequency of Diamond and find the frequency on which it could absolutely obliterate it. Shooting this gun at Emma Frost, we see her arm completely disintegrate. And while this is a huge feat just in itself, this is where we see Emma, she pulls out her Logan patch, something that they had created just in case they lost a limb or needed to repair a missing limb or something of that nature. Putting this Logan patch on, we see her arm, it comes back. This is where he brings out his Chimera. Like Nightcrawler, Scott makes a wonderful genetic base for additions. But when these Chimera come out, they are facing against Emma Frost. All of the Chimera, they begin to turn on one another. Emma Frost making them do this. Sinister really thought that he could pull one over on her. Grabbing a chain and wrapping it around the throat of Sinister. She is getting ready to end him right here and right now. With Sinister trying to say that this is just the start. That she doesn't understand all of these Sinisters are going to turn on one another. The truth is, Emma already knows this. Sinister may have made everybody him, but they're not stupid. They know that in the long run, there can only be one. But Sinister also says that they both need each other. That if you want to win a war, he has a weapon to do so. Being able to press a button, we see the next evolution of Chimera. This is the next generation. Five mutant gifts in one body. 
and while it's going to take him some time, he will be able to craft genetic weapons no one has ever seen before. If they plan on facing against all of the empires that are in space, they are going to need him. They are going to need his weapons. With this being a relatively convincing case to keep him alive, Emma says, why not? Let's keep you alive at least for the time being. But she wants him to beg, with Sinister begging for his life. She gets in contact with the Quiet Council, bringing everybody in to the Psychic Council meeting. They are going to forgive his indiscretions in lieu of his past, present, and future services to the cause of them being the best. With everybody in agreement, Sinister has saved his life at least for now. With Emma Frost saying that Krakoa needs you just for now, they rule the world, but the standard we is about to go out of fashion very soon, leaving the royal we forever. Alright gang, so this story is starting us in Asgard. 90 years ago, Asgard had been sent spinning into the void, but now in the 100th year of the Sinister Era, Magic of the Red Diamond has decided to finish what she started, recreating the Bifrost making it in her image, a black robe that leads her directly to all of our Asgardians. And the Nightkin have been waiting for this moment, because the Nightkin, they dance between the raindrops of war, while the Asgardians fight for their very existence. The Nightkin, they come in, but they're not here to help anybody. They are here to plunder. The only reason that Asgard is still standing to this day is because of their isolation. In the sinister era of the year 53, Xavier and Sin whispered through hybrid brains. In doing this, he killed an entire civilization, died in paranoia and pain. This is how the Shi'ar Empire had fallen. And with its fall, of course, the Night can come in to plunder. They have made it a kind of art to be slinking through all of these margins of tragedy. And the Siege Lords of Otherworld had cherished this as well. In the sinister era of the year 77, they had come to the Nightkin trying to seek an alliance. But the Nightkin don't pick sides. They do not care for power or pride. The Sinisters cannot tolerate anything that is not them. Which means the Red Diamond will be coming for Otherworld. It is just a matter of time, and the Nightkin, they will be there to steal any magical treasures that are left behind. The very next day, Hope and Sin deployed her first Triple Chimera, a mixture of Megan, Maggot, and Madrox. A plague of magical slugs undid Otherworld like rot, and of course the Nightkin were there to steal all of the artifacts. There is also what is known as the System Killers. Fugions of Legion, Proteus, and Polaris tortured beyond sanity. They say that Sinister was there in the Sinister Era of the year 89. He was there when the first air burst bomb had hit Xander's son. And of course, the Nightkin were there. They heard the death screams of Xanderian world mind. In the process, 32 of the Nightkin had been taken out. The Nightkin had been trying to recreate themselves as much as possible. But without Sinister and everything else, this is only going to last them so far. Through all of these years, it was only a matter of time before their reputation really came to precede them. And so when they're on Asgard, Thor is furious. He knows exactly what they're here for. They are here for the hammer. They are here for the sacred arms of Asgard. Taking them in the most dire moment, Thor tries to fight them off. As he swings his hammer, one of the Night can come in and they chop off his arm. Mjolnir falling to the ground and Thor now defeated. And with Thor bleeding out, one of the Nightkin let it be known that they are the only one that can purge the diamond. They are the only one that can build the perilous. The weapon to cleanse the sinister strain from the universe. But they need all the holy artifacts to do so. And though this may be an unliftable object, it must fall towards something. This is where we have Lost in Shadow, one of the Nightkin. 
By the spark of her gene, she has the ability to determine the gravitational pull of the hammer, which means the hammer will fall as they wish. They keep this hammer moving in rotation, constantly and move it as if it were to fall. This is how they carry Mjolnir out of here. This is how they take it back to Mother Righteous. With the Nightkin losing two of their finest at the regrouping point, as the Frost Giants descended down on everything, and Asgard was lost forever. And that is what takes us to the Narthex, uprooted from the corpse of Krakoa itself in the twilight days of Earth. This may not be much of a home, but it is the only one that they know, a sanctuary to travelers of a strange aspect. This is where we have the Spirit of Variance. Returning back after a long voyage, he goes to have a conversation with Legate, and it appears that Legate is the leader of the Nightkin, one of the first to be switched over from the Diamond to the Heart. And after a hundred years, there is a ceremony that is currently ongoing, the Last Rite. One of the Nightkin known as Summer Knight is losing his battle against the Diamond. Sinister is retaking control, because great trauma can have this effect. What happened was the miracle, at least that's what they called it. When Sinister had created them, he wove infertility into the X chromosomes. Just another slice of control, but the healing gene that she has been carrying for nearly a century to regenerate. She knows that the child she bore was not a miracle. She was a triumph of love and patience. A terrible, brief beauty. The Cyclops Chimera was the father, but it wasn't the loss of this child alone that broke him. Not fully. Mother Righteous had rewrote their tragedy. The child is now at the core of the faith. And so you have to ask, how can Summer Knight recover from a tragedy that he is expected to celebrate. When that baby had been born, it began to glow. No one understanding truly what was going on, but born with the mutant gift that is Nightcrawler. There was a birth reflex. With that first breath, we see this baby teleport out of here. Not sure to where. Maybe the heart of a star. The endless void. Not sure if this baby felt fear. Not sure if it felt alone. Nonetheless, it was gone. The child is gone, and so is half of their heart. And today, Legate loses the other part. They have been using Sinister's lab as a way to end life hurling them at Sinister's lab which is protected by a chimera, one that they cannot break, one that is always existing and always will. This is why Mother Righteous has been gathering all of these magical artifacts. She wants to break down this barrier. As it stands, no teleporter can jump through, so every time something is sent into it, it instantly dies. But even suffering all of this, Legate isn't feeling pain, she is feeling rage. And if the news couldn't get any worse, our spirit of variance has been out there looking for any other versions of Nightcrawler, any chimera that might be crawling around. They believe that the Sinisters have realized there is some kind of quark of spirit that makes the Wagner gene just susceptible to emancipation. In layman's terms, Sinister has decided that he is no longer going to create any more Nightcrawler Chimera. Because of their ability to break away from Sinister's control, they have put a hold on this. And so while they fill their ranks up, while they are recruiting new individuals, they cannot create new Nightcrawlers. They can only save those that have already been created. And so after a hundred years and no longer creating more Nightcrawler Chimeras, there is nobody left to recruit from. Their numbers are going to continue to diminish, maybe before they can even finish their task. What makes it worse is that Mother Righteous lists of sacred items, it is growing even longer, and the Nightkin are becoming very skeptical on what she is doing. She says that she knows how to gain entry into Sinister's laboratory, but she has always been very vague about this. But Vox Ignis, he goes on to say that he has watched her visit many folks down the decades, people untouched by the diamond, 
rebels, survivors, and she always asked them the same thing. What would you have done differently? One of them specifically was Legion. Legion has been staying out of all of this for as long as he can, all of this time protecting the folks that he can save inside of a peaceful dream. But he has also been watching Mother Righteous for over a century. Back in the years of Krakoa, she was set on making deals, on getting into folks' heads and hearts. And now she is reduced to nothing more than gossip and regret. And while Legion doesn't know her game, he know the likes of her. Always a stated goal. Always a true goal. He knows that whatever Mother Righteous is up to, this isn't for everybody, this is only for herself. And while Legion has the possibility and the capability to turn the tides of everything, he believes the X-Gene has become nothing more than a cancer. He is taking what remains of his people, and he is leaving for a higher plane. They will explore, they will rapture, and that is all that is left. And Legate wants to try and ask a question to Mother Righteous believing that it would best come from the spirit of variance. He goes to have a conversation. The Nightkin are dwindling. They worship her. They only wish to fulfill her designs. But they're not going to last long. He has thought of a way to reverse that trend. That is what takes us to the abandoned planet of Earth. It was only a matter of time before Earth was completely destroyed or taken over. That is when the Brood and the Annihilus incursion scoured the price of real estate even faster than they expected. They came in on their ships and they destroyed, they took over everything. But the Quiet Council, most of the world, had already abandoned Earth. But they had emptied the factories by remote flipped the plasma cores and filled the ionosphere with debris. No ships in or out. And so as we jump into Earth in current day, we see the hellish landscape that is left behind. The Nightkin have come in here for something very specific. They have come here for Dr. Nemesis. He has been growing on this wall for quite some time. And his computing power is far beyond what anybody would expect it to be. With such vast intelligence, he is a huge asset. But they have to cut him down, which means eventually he's going to have to regrow all of this fungus. For the time being, this cuts down his intelligence. He will need the time to regrow. But this isn't the only thing that they are bringing to Mother Righteous. That was not the real target. They brought another guest. They have brought the original Nightcrawler, a monstrous beast of a mutant nowadays, still having a small sliver of intelligence. After hearing what Mother Righteous has turned the spark into, it was supposed to be an idea. It was supposed to be about joy, not a mission, not a weapon, not control. This is where Mother Righteous pulls out a sword from her chest, telling him that the spark is whatever she says it is. And that's where she cuts the throat of Nightcrawler, with Legate going in and charging Mother Righteous, trying to end her treacherous reign. Mother Righteous snaps her fingers, and just like that, she takes out Legate, falling down to the ground in excruciating pain. Taking a small moment to teleport out of here, this Nightkin is leaving. Those still faithful and loyal, they wrap up Nightcrawler and they throw him into the void. Throw him at Sinister's lab and we see a detonation. In the blink of an eye, he is wiped away from existence. With Legate being able to make her escape, when she had left, she got a small voice inside of her head. This voice was the voice of her child. Mother Righteous still has the child. It called out to Legate, letting her know that she is still here, that Mother Righteous had lied. She never teleported anywhere. Mother Righteous has been keeping her captive. And now this Nightkin is out for vengeance. Her rage will burn with love. Love for her child, love for her people. Love that will wait as long as it must to set them all free. A love that will last a thousand years.
Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up at the edge of the packs. The remains of the compact are making another stand. The galactic empires have slowly been falling to the will of mutant kind. They have fortress solar systems, millennia of weapon production lined up and pointed directly at the mutants. This is definitely a well defended system. But the good news, there is nothing in this system that mutant kind needs. That means they can go straight scorched earth on every single planet. Leading this armada, we have none other than Exodus and Hope. Even with their vast numbers, even having them pinned up, mutant kind is still not able to see anything far into the sector. The supreme intelligence is blocking the sector from far viewing. This means they cannot deploy what they call L-bombs. But we have Hope calling out to her entire fleet, asking them who they believe in. The words burst out of the speakers. The word most feared across the entire galaxy is hope. And even being imbued with this amount of power, this unfeathered belief setting her veins aflame, she doesn't have to do these battles alone because she has Exodus by her side. Everyone believes in Exodus because he believes in hope. This is the dynamic duo of the cosmos. Making their way to the planet's surface, they are able to see exactly where they need to drop these bombs. Opening up a portal, they get out of here and they prepare to drop them. With Hope imagining crosshairs over each planet, we see them one by one begin to erupt. The L-bombs are for Gift Chimera, unstable, so they are stored in Tempest status until they are able to be deployed. Having Lila's gift being able to teleport anywhere they have been in the universe. When they get the psychic imprint from Hope, they have the destination. The L-bomb arrives and the other three gene payloads, that is when they kick in. We have Firestar plus Leland plus Micromax. Nuclear fission plus increasing mass plus increasing scales equals a planet splinter. With this system being absolutely decimated, we are taken over to the arbor. What we have are the many pieces of hope inside of this vat. The only reason that she can be off on the front lines is because of this right here. Chunks of hope that are floating around in a big tank back home. Now we have gone over the fact that Hope isn't one that clones very easily. They have one of her at a time, but the discarded pieces can synchronize with the duplicates of her old crew. This keeps the resurrection industrial complex ticking over. But the resurrection process isn't that important now that they have cloning. But the clones aren't OG Krakoa, that they are just a superior method. And if Hope is being honest with herself, she is happy that she no longer has to stay behind and chant to bring people back. She is meant to be holy and do war. By definition, any war that she does is a holy war. And now that the war has nearly been won, that means they need to start thinking about finding a new war. Finding a new way to expand their empire. To do this, they are going to use the Marauder. Inside of this, they have huge Shaw batteries. They have Eunice Glance and a Tempest Magic Drive. Imagine this like the Starship Enterprise. It is meant to go out there, find new worlds, strange civilizations. But their intention is to annihilate them. Now that the Marauder has been fully upgraded, all it needs is its captain. The crew is ready, and this captain is going to come from Nathaniel. That's what picks us up in one of Sinister's labs. The first thing that he shows them is the crew. These are Mystique Grey Crows. But this isn't his prized possession. This isn't the prize creation. This is where he introduces Rasputin 4. 
This is the latest generation of Chimera. Rasputin 4 is stable with 5 genes, something that has proved nearly impossible. Most 5s just detonate before you can even throw them into a Tempest Vault. Having Colossus and Kitty Pride be the ones to stabilize everything. Just a little bit of Eunice to be able to bring up the force fields. A little bit of X-23 for aggression and survivability. But then there is the really good one. He was able to manage to get an actual Omega Telepath Gene inside of this. Now they know the problems when it comes to Gene Grey, but when it comes to Kid Omega, that is much more malleable. And to top it all off, the equipment that she uses is a Soul Sword. A weapon that can attack while you are remaining intangible obviously has its benefits, and Sinister has trained her for the cause. When all is conquered, all will be at peace. They needed a hero in the captain role. She is a powerhouse. Sinister even says that they need to make sure that she doesn't go and backstab the council when she's off on her own. And this is when Hope goes ahead and asks the question, can you do six genes? And Sinister says that that is not possible. Five is as far as they can go. With Sinister and his new creation leaving the room, the rest of the council have come to the conclusion that Nathaniel is no longer a necessity. He has done everything to his fullest extent. Nobody can create better Chimera than him, and he cannot create better Chimera than what he has just created, which means his purpose is over. After a century, it is time to take the old man out. And of course, Sinister already knows this. He already knows that this is just on the horizon. As he goes into his room, this is where he sees a book with a heart on it. This book is locked by magic. This is where we see Mother Righteous in the room, letting him know that he won't be able to get that open without the key. When he goes to ask who this is, she says that all the answers you are looking for are in the book. She tells him that if you want the key, the only thing you need to do is say thank you. And so of course he says thank you and she hands it right over. This book divulges everything that we have already learned. That there are four different sinisters, Mother Righteous being one of them. It goes to say that once upon a time there was a man called Nathaniel. Exus. He saw that eventually machines with big brains would destroy all of them because they are good at thinking. He died but left behind four clones. Each of the clones would explore one route to the best machines, all of them heading out on different roads with the same destination. To survive the machines, they have to escape the machines. If they become a dominion outside of time and space, they cannot be touched. Coming to the realization that Mother Righteous is also one of the Sinisters. He doesn't really care because he still believes that he is the real one. This Sinister was born of the Diamond via Apocalypse. He remembers this. But what if she is saying is true? This is all a race. It has always been a race. But he knows that this changes everything. He knows that he can use this information, but he needs his Moiras to really utilize it. And he needs to do this before the council crushes him. Taking us over to Hope and Exodus. They agreed to move on Sinister once they had taken out some of the pirate worlds. And so Hope does what she does, calling out to the crew asking who is best. They all cry out Hope making their way down to the planet's surface. They witnessed and message sent. As they get ready to take off, this is where Hope's powers are cut off. Because Exodus is far enough away that she cannot duplicate his power. Exodus is letting her know that he is not with her. That she is just a girl with a gun. That she is no more use to the church or to the council. And Messiah's purpose is to inspire the church. To pray that one day that Messiah may return. The fact that they have the Messiah with them, it makes it very, very hard to have faith. It makes true faith impossible. Exodus reminds her that she is more useful dead than alive. And so he leaves her on this planet by herself. Now lucky thing for Hope is she upgraded herself. 
taking a lot of her father's, really, technology and utilizing it to the fullest extent. She is a walking, talking arsenal, even without her powers. But even with all this weaponry and technology, she knows that she is going down. And in her last moments, there is one thing of comfort. She may be the first of the council to be taken out, but she knows that she will not be the last. That's what takes us to Sinister and Rasputin 4. He is giving her one last gene treatment. This treatment gets rid of the Sinister gene, the diamond being removed from her forehead. She is truly free, and Sinister goes on to say that Krakoa was a paradise, one that he destroyed. What we are seeing is Sinister plead to his hero, letting her know that he messed up, he created this strain, he infected all of them, and it turned them all into these monsters. He has been trapped in their service ever since. But there is a way back, a device that he had lost. What he wants is for her to find it. If they do, he can purge the strain, and they can have all of it back. He raised her to be good. As the universe needs a light, she is the hero in the blighted world. She alone is free, alone to save them all. He is asking her to save them from his sins. That is what takes us to the command deck of the Marauder. Her and Sinister getting on board, she says to launch immediately. Taking off from the landing dock, she launches two torpedoes. It detonates this little space station that is connected to this planet. They put full power into the engines and they head off into space. And to save the universe, they must find the lost treasure and undo all of this. He believes that this mission may take five years, that it surely couldn't last any longer than that. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up in deep space. The location is unknown, but it has been 100 years since the Sinister Takeover. We have this floating space station that is known as the Arako Base. The base commander is Novar. And right now, they have a ship coming in. When this ship docks, we see that the person on that ship was none other than Destiny. And Destiny has come to have a conversation as she meets the likes of Iron Fist, Korra, and Cable, now going by the name of X-Man. Destiny has come to talk to the goddess. As they have this conversation, we learn that really Destiny is in a struggle. She wants vengeance. Her mystique had been taken away from her. While Destiny had pleaded for Mystique not to join the fight, not to join the rebellion, Mystique felt as she had no other option, that they couldn't simply hide away forever, that she couldn't be a keepsake in the, in the vault of Destiny. She wanted to free everybody, and so she went and she fought. All Destiny ever wanted was to live forever with her beloved, or at least as much of it as they could possibly steal. But now Destiny feels as if Mystique had died for their cause. She died on some backwater world trying to free people. This makes Destiny have to ask, was all of this worth it? That is where we see Old Lady Storm. She says that it was worth everything. And as these two really start to dig into their conversation, we learn what Destiny is truly looking for. Once Destiny had offered the chance to clean this slate, to restart everything, but at the time, she had too much to lose. Now that Raven is dead, the galaxy is on fire, and they have lost everything, she says it is time to end this phase of the game. It is time to kill Moira for real. That's what takes us into deep space. We have our X-Men team getting ready to really lay down some hate. All of them in their own fighters. As we see them jump out of this portal, where they have landed is right in front of the enemy's gate. This is the home base to Orbis Stellaris. Except this giant golden ball is much bigger than it once was. Once upon a time, this ball was so tiny, it only kept the Sinister inside. But now, this thing is the size of a freaking Death Star. They refer to this as the Death Sphere. The life's work of Orbis, overlord of the Interstellar Compact. Essentially, a scaled-up version of his own mobile life support shell. This allows him to have his base of operations. 
it allows the system-sized computer known as the World Farm to travel anywhere in the galaxy, enabling total domination over all worlds under the Compact's Aegis. On the inside, they are getting the readings. They know that the X-Men, the Brotherhood, have come for them. But they came in such a small armada. Orbis is a little bit confused, but still, he drops all of his weaponry. He deploys all of the standard fighters that they have. Every single one of them get dropped down into space. The odds, 100 to 1. On the bridge of the Brothership, we have Korra using her gift to boost Destiny's powers. This is going to help her with accuracy and detail. If they are to take down Orbis, Destiny is their greatest weapon. Having Cable, aka X-Man, being able to read her mind and then broadcasting it to everybody else. Destiny can see in the pitch of battle with her vision. Zelo's processing power with Nathan's strategic sense. Those two powers together create an unbeatable combination. A self-fulfilling prophecy. The most potent of possible futures. She can hear Storm give the order to destroy the artificial sun at the heart of the sphere. This destroys the Moira lab at the very heart of it. A moment of euphoria and victory, and then darkness. The end of a universe. The future is set, and they will win. And so, with everybody getting the orders, we see that Ironfire gets a visitor. This visitor is none other than Mother Righteous, trying to plant seeds of doubt, trying to bring him over. But what she doesn't understand is that he already has faith. He is already a true believer, but it's not in Mother Righteous. It is not in Sinister. It is in the Goddess Storm. As this battle begins to rage on, our X-Fighters are doing everything they can to avoid destruction. They are waiting for an opportunity, and that opportunity comes very quickly. With the doorway being opened and all the standard fighters being let go, this gives them an opportunity. This gives the fighters a chance to make it inside the orb. With the systems taking too long for them to fully close the door, our X-Fighters are able to make it inside. They target the Central Sun. All Storm has to do is say the word, and all of this ends right now. With Storm saying, do it. In an instant, what we see is that Destiny has been struck down. Painless and quick, Destiny was taken down by Korra. What she saw was the end of a universe. It was just her own. It was her own death. Though they wouldn't put it past Destiny to have some kind of contingency plan in play, they have just taken down the precog. They did not take down the sun. And so, obviously, everybody is curious on why they are not destroying the Moiras. If Destiny was right, this reality is hell. But Storm says that a hell still supports life, and thus it supports hope. 90 years ago, she was angry, and she still very much is. But how many have lived and died since that day? One dead planet does not justify the murder of a universe. Saying that the Moira lab is an abomination, one that they must defuse, not simply destroy, that they must guard it with their lives, for they guard the life of everything that is. But even with this, they're trying to figure out if we're not going to destroy this and reset the universe, then how do we get out of here to defend this? How do we take the Moira Labs with us? As it stands, they are pretty much fish in a barrel waiting to be shot down. But this is where Storm does something absolutely tremendous. With Korra giving every bit of energy she has into Storm. Storm says to be an Omega level mutant is to be without limits, but there are limits beyond limits, powers beyond powers. She is the heir to a very ancient kind of magic. Many have called her the old witch for a reason. This is where she calls upon her ancestors. She calls upon her bloodline. She is offering up fire, a life incarnate, that through magic and mutation she might be able to command the weather of the cosmos itself, to summon a storm that shakes realities. This is where we see a giant wormhole open up, and we see it begin to eat up everything. 
It takes the world farm. It takes the Moira Labs. It takes everything. But it leaves behind Orbis and all of his command center. This is the most epic of heists ever done. Orbis's life work has been destroyed. He no longer has the Moiras. He no longer has anything that he was using before. That's what takes us to the far edges of the universe. Somewhere where no one will ever be able to find them. And if they do stumble across them just by chance, they are going to make sure that they never stumble away again. As they concentrate on the center sun, they know with a little time and effort that this place could be a fortress. This could be Fort Arako, maybe even a new home for their scattered people. But when everybody tries to get in contact with Storm, they only find that Korra is crying. Because the great goddess, the great omega-powered mutant, the amazing old witch that is Storm, she used every bit of her life force to open up that wormhole and get them all to safety. The great Aurora has died. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are getting the mission log of Rasputin. She is the tip of the spear, you could say she is the whole spear that is Red Diamond's arsenal. They travel the stars, they go from place to place, and their newly upgraded Marauder. They are looking for the Moira clones. They are looking for a way to restart this universe. Rasputin, she doesn't know this. She believes that they are trying to save the universe. She doesn't understand that this is going to restart everything, wiping this universe away and going back to how it used to be. Their latest clues tracking down the Moira clones has led them to a place that is known only as Numbers. This is 5372389. This is also referred to as One Exodus Prayer World. And what we see as we go in here are tons and tons of eggs. They all surround an Exodus. While Rasputin is making her way through this prayer world, we see that Sinister is very concerned because of any Exodus Exodus. Mind you, I said any, not the Exodus. And we're gonna get to that in a minute on exactly what I mean. But he is worried that if any Exodus realizes he is alive, it is going to be bad for everybody. All of these eggs, all of these clones that Rasputin is surrounded by, they all have a purpose. All of them have their brain trapped in an infinite loop. It is constantly praising and giving praise to Exodus, to the Exodus of this world. But she is looking for one prayer that may be holding the secrets that she needs. While this is like looking for a needle in a haystack, that is how the last 900 years have been for them. She rifles through the minds of these clones trying to steal the secrets that she might need. And she does find it. But saying a prayer of thanks, this was a mistake. Because that is when the Exodus opens up his eyes. As the Exodus begins to get up, she opens up a portal and she jumps on board the Marauder. As they try to make their escape from this planet, we see this Exodus is a ginormous monster. Following Rasputin up into space, we see Sinister go out and make a call to another prayer world. He discusses on how their exodus has launched. This is a high risk move for him, but it may be the only way that they can escape exodus. And while this exodus is focused on trying to take down the Marauder, off in the distance we see another exodus coming his way. Ever since the exodus schism, individual sects have established their own claims, each with prayer worlds and Exodus clones pointing across the void at one another. Many have ceasefire scriptures. The launching of an Exodus is against them, and so nearby sects will have to respond. They do this in case their neighbors are unleashing a first strike crusade. They launch their Exodus, and we see the two Exodus go at one another, both of them calling each other heretics. This gives Sinister the opportunity to jump away. And so if you are a little confused on what just happened, what we are seeing is that throughout the universe, there are prayer worlds that all have their own exodus. This means that exodus was cloned or something of that nature over and over and over again. And so there are exoduses spread throughout the universe, all having an immense amount of power. The only problem is that they have sinister DNA in them. 
This led to the inevitable point of them going against one another, of them believing that their exodus is the supreme. What Sinister just did is made it seem like they were going to launch a first strike initiative, that this exodus they woke up was going to go attack another. And so this exodus planet sent a countermeasure, which just so happens to be another exodus. And the war will ignite between these two exodus sects and they will spread. The body count will be unimaginable. The only hope for everything is absolute transformation. Sinister has promised Rasputin the promise of Krakoa, of peace, of plenty. The only hope is that they succeed. But Rasputin decoding the message that she had received, one that is written in classical English, only a few words, one sentence, that sentence being, we should be on the same side. Sinister automatically knows exactly who this message came from. This message came from destiny. Now when it comes to the fate of the Quiet Council in the third millennium, Professor Xavier is now the protectorate of the dream. Nightcrawler dead, his gene line utilized so that he can do the Legion of Night. Colossus is the bulwark of materialism, all superpowers to the Space Soviets. We know that Sinister disappeared 900 years ago with the experimental Marauder. He is still a wanted man, but mostly forgotten. Emma Frost is the Empress of the Red Diamond. Kate Pride, Hellfire Exile, Pirate Queen of the Void. Exodus, the gene reformation led to the division of the one true Exodus Church into thousands of heretic subsects. And Hope, dissected into little pieces still alive. This was distributed among the Exodus Six. Namor is leading the Drowned Worlds. Beast has been working for the Red Diamond Emma Frost. Magic had retreated during her incursion after losing the Seventh Diamond War. And then Sebastian Shaw, the ruling majority in the Screaming Council of Hell. As the Marauder travels through space, the journey is not an easy one. The biggest detour was around what happened with Magic. Her incursions, it tore across the galaxy. Magic's wound in space-time to try and bring Limbo into reality. Passing through a war between the Dream and the Red Diamond Fleet, they see nothing but bodies. Later on, they are stalked by Kate Pride, her pack of pirates chasing them through the asteroids. But eventually, they reach their coordinates. They find something old, older than them. Sending Rasputin out, she is able to go out into space without any suit. Now, she's not able to do this for super long periods of time, but she has the fortitude to be able to do it for a couple minutes at the very least. Though she has never truly tested how long she can wait out in space. After retrieving the device that she needed to get, Sinister asks for a little privacy while he listens to this message from Destiny. Not sure what little plot she was trying to scheme up. He plays this device and it goes on to say that she helped with Storm stealing the lab. And that if he is listening to this, they have hit it again. They hit it when she tried to restart the universe. This is all because Raven is dead. And while Mystique wouldn't agree with what she is about to say, she lets Nathaniel know that if you get your Moiras back and you return to the past, that you need to come to me and I will join you. She will admit that she has fought against Sinister. She didn't trust him or his plans, and she also knew that it was impossible for him to trust anybody. But right now, she is telling him that he must try, because she is only trying to find a way to save Mystique. She sees the future, and there is only death for her. It is horrible. It is horrible to see the woman you love torn to whatever end she may get. And while he may not be able to understand this, this nightmare dimension was the longest path of her life. And so Destiny followed it. Mystique had beat the odds so many times. Destiny was hopeful for a moment because no world is truly a hell with her in it. But now if she is gone, they must try again. She believes that if Sinister and Destiny work together, then they may be able to find a path that both of them can go down. She wants them to be on the same side for so many reasons. Reasons that she dare not say aloud. 
The only reason that truly matters is to save the woman she loves. She will join him because Sinister and his Moiras are the only way to get back to Mystique. With the message coming to its end, Sinister says that he will consider this offer, but he's probably going to reject it. Before he shuts it off, it says one more thing. It says that I know your eventual goal is to transcend time and space and become a Dominion. She tells him that he does not succeed. She also knows that he will think that this is a trick, but it is not. This is their only hope, them to work together, telling him to give up on being a Dominion, to reset the timeline, and they together will figure this out. This is when Rasputin comes into the room. She has been eavesdropping on this entire conversation. She now knows that they are not trying to save the universe. Because of this, she tells Sinister it is time for him to die. With Sinister manifesting pistols, using anti-phase phasers, he tries to take down his creation, but he created something that is just so powerful. Even with his best tech, he is not able to fight her. He is not able to beat her. He knows that he can't. She has the finest stable gene cocktail ever created. Telepathy, steel body, intangibility, force fields, and a healing factor. He also didn't even put in his self-destruct sequence. He feared that this would be a weakness that somebody could use. He even gave her free will. He is able to step into the other room. He seals this room off with Rasputin in it and he injects her into space. Because one thing she doesn't have is flight. And while this does suck, he's very upset that he had to give up Rasputin. Probably his finest work that he has ever created. He knows his mission, he knows his heading. Destiny telling him to dissolve the message that she had sent him, and this will give him instructions so that he can find his Moiras. Going to this location, he goes to a cave, and in this cave, what he finds is the last Doombot. It has been hiding away for hundreds of years, but it has not been hiding away by itself. From the shadows, what we see is Moira Sentinel, or Omega Moira, however you want to say it. Moira has lived through all of these years. She has been in hiding. And now Sinister is propositioning a way to, to restart everything, to go back to the way things were. And after everything Moira has endured, she lets him know, Sinister, if you can do this, I will follow you to the edges of the universe. Lucky for her, that is exactly where they need to go. This is what takes us to the court of the Red Diamond, Emma Frost. We are seeing that Emma Frost, she has become the queen we all know she is. But Beast, he is letting her know that Nathaniel is not dead. Because Beast is using the Doombot as a kind of spying device. Emma Frost very curious on what Nathaniel has been up to. Beast is letting her know that he has recruited Moira because he needed her psychic imprint so that he could locate the Moira clones. Emma Frost, in a fit of anger, she always knew something like this was a possibility, but never believed that this is actually what happened. She always knew that he would have some kind of high card he could play, a last ditch effort. Emma now recognizing that he has the, the chance, the possibility of burning this reality down. When she is so close to winning her war, she refuses to allow this. And so she is going to lead them personally into war against Sinister to find these clones. That way she can save them and continue on this until she has overall supremacy. That's what takes us to the world farm. The world farm currently on fire. Moira and Sinister having a conversation, Moira not being able to believe that Sinister had actually cloned her and kept it a secret. But after a thousand years, she doesn't even care. She just wants to restart all of this. As they make their arrival to the world farm, they get shot at. Being greeted by Storm's old attack dog, John Ironfire. We see that he is very much aged up. But John, he wants to know about the Red Diamond Armada that is following behind them, what they know about it, and why are they here. This is when Sinister goes on to tell him that Frost has picked up their trail, that he's not with her, 
He is with him. He is with Sinister. And if they have been followed, it is much worse than they thought. They are running out of time. Storm had told them if this citadel falls, then the universe goes with it. And Storm was right. But Sinister may have a little more information that John would be interested in, telling him that together they can save the universe. Meanwhile, up in space, we pick up with Rasputin. She has been floating here for quite a while. She has air in her veins. She can slow her metabolism. She can live for a little bit longer, but for what? This would just keep her alive for a few more days, really dwelling in her anger. This is when she hears a voice. We're gonna dive right into this. We are picking up with John Ironfire. He knows that the Queen in Red is coming. She is coming to break them, and he knows that they are not ready. After the Diamond Jubilee disaster, they are nothing more than a shadow of their former strength. He knows if they fall, everything will fall with them. That they need a symbol of hope. And Korra knows exactly what they need to do. With her mutant heart still beating after 900 years, they know what they have to do. And they do mention that Cable is no longer around. He had fallen to Orphan Madrox. And right now, they want his counsel more than ever. But they walk into a room, this is where we find Sinister. And here in this room, we have what is called the New Five. Because Sinister and John Ironfire, they are preparing to do a resurrection. That's what takes us to the beautiful, the wonderful, the powerful, the terrifying Emma Frost. The ice-hearted queen making her way through space finally having the location of the last stronghold of John Ironfire. She plans to burn them all out this day. While her armada moves towards all of our heroes, Sinister had held on to a very unique treasure, a single vial of Hope's precious blood. This gives them the key to unlocking true resurrection, with Crane of the Commander giving her order to life and to bear life. Bloodroot the Bone Shaper formed veins and limbs. He is a sculptor of flesh. And then the Mind Flayer, tearing memories from the king himself of his old goddess. And Korra, she bathed them all in her heart's fire. This created the union that they need. And this, this returns our goddess Storm. We see her risen anew. Reborn among them, the great leader of the old has finally returned to fight the last foe. When John Ironfire says her name, we see this storm, she doesn't have all of her memories. She's not entirely sure exactly who she is. And John Ironfire never thought he would ever say this, but he says thank you to Sinister. And this storm, she has all the knowledge that John Ironfire had supplied but she has none of her memories. The storm that John Ironfire once knew, she no longer remains. She still is dead. What we have before us is something new. All the knowledge that John Ironfire has provided, he has seen her as a goddess from the very beginning. And so the knowledge that Storm gets is that she is in fact a goddess. This is when the alarms go off. Everybody moves to their battle stations. And before you can even blink your eyes, we see this battle is well underway. From the loud hailers, to the hot claws, to the high summers. The battle is bloody. The battle is brutal. And there are few survivors. And our Red Queen, she wanted all of this to be wrapped up before Beast and his armada had arrived. She wanted this battle to already be over with. This is where she decides that she is going to take it into her own hands. And we see the Red Queen go into a room, going into a type of bathwater. What this actually is, is a giant weapon. Being of both Sinister and Emma Frost, this is one of the most deadliest people on the entire planet. And she initiates the Mistress Mold, the Blood Diamond Monarch. She activates her giant robot Emma Frost. 
with Emma Frost having absolute control over it. She has turned herself into a giant Gundam, and she has come to punish John Ironside and all of the rest. As the people scream for Storm to protect them, the Queen of Blood's blows they echo through a sun under siege. This battle infecting the integrity of this center sun itself. Storm can hear the pain of the stars, of the sky, and of course, Sinister, he proposes going to the vault, going to the laboratory. Of course, John Ironfire isn't going to do this. He has no intention of letting him anywhere near there, and recognizing he's not going to get in just yet, he goes over to the last Doombot that is crushed under some rubble. He pulls off the hand of the Doombot, and he uses it as a gun. As we see Storm making her way up to Emma Frost, she is recognizing that she was born to battle. She has John Ironfire's knowledge of what she can do, but not how she did it. While instincts are good, the experiences would be much better, but this is what they have to work with. With Korra giving herself to her goddess, we see Storm just stupid overpowered. For nine long centuries, Korra's power had matured in her heart. 900 years of waiting for the moment to give it all once more. And as this battle had raged on, she rose to fight alone. On the ground level, we see Sinister, John Ironfire, and Korra. They are struggling to hold the line. One by one, the new five is slowly taken down. Eventually, Korra meets her ultimate fate. This is when everybody looks to the stars, bearing a miracle that floats up there, lightning coming from Storm's hands. Emma Frost seeing Storm, saying that it is nice to see you again. But the old Storm, she might have been of concern. You, you are nothing more than a newborn. A spark of raw power without any knowledge. You have no idea even how to fight, let alone how to win. But Storm also lets it be known that she hasn't learned how to lose either. She has no rules of limits or boundaries. She is not stuck down by fear. All she knows is the play of the living sky. The wind, the seasons, the lightning. This is where we see raw electrons transfer through her sky, all torn directly from those bonds connecting atoms. The carbon molecules bonding to form the frost-hearted queen, all shattered into fragments in that moment with nuclear force. We see the Armada, we see Emma Frost's giant Gundam, all burst into flames. In one fail swoop, with a single thought, Storm has absolutely decimated Emma Frost and her Armada. But Storm, she paid a heavy price. She didn't block the radiation. Lacking the experience, she didn't know what would happen to her body. As she falls from the sky, burnt to a crisp by radiation. But she has given this universe a chance. With John Ironfire covering her up, he picks her up and he goes to carry her off. And now that the battle has come to an end, Sinister is about to do what Sinister does best. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up with Mother Righteous. Her Nightcrawler is bringing her one of the most newest weapons. This is a Phoenix Egg. Yet another magical item for her to add to the collection. That is because she is building what she calls the Sacred Weapon. But this weapon, it has been loaded and armed for ages. But the oil to grease this trigger, to let this gun go off, they are on the 50th generation of Nightcrawlers. At this point, they are lacking a lot of intelligence, but they are more trusting, they are more faithful. As we see Mother Righteous walk through the corridors, we have a Nightcrawler that hears the voice. It calls to him, and so he does what all Nightcrawlers do. They teleport themselves directly into the shield that surrounds the Moira Labs. And Mother Righteous has waited a millennia for this timeline to get its stuff together. A millennia of hiding her true intentions. But this is when the ship lets her know that they have reached the world farm. That Sinister is already there and the Diamond Empress, she is right behind him. 
Now the question is, will Mother Righteous reach the laboratory, or will Sinister do it first? And while Sinister may be there, he's not able to get inside the hangar. And a millennia ago, Destiny stole the Moira clones. She preserved this timeline. She did this so that her wife could live longer. Live as long as possible. And she has spent this whole time banking on this one thing. Hanging on the faith that anybody will do anything for love. But as we saw in the last issue, that had failed. Everybody knows that Destiny would have a plan B. And so now Mother Righteous, she looks for that plan B. In fact, she theorizes that Destiny had sent Sinister to find the world farm. This is when she sees it. An object. Its trajectory is headed directly for the world farm. She sends out the word to signal Vox Ignis. To send him the coordinates and sound the trumpets. Because the rapture is about to begin. With the call going out, we see all of our Nightcrawlers begin to make their move. As we see each of the Nightcrawlers completely disintegrated, burned to nothing more than ash. They have the world farm that is directly below them. The force field is being depleted. All of these Nightcrawlers knocking against it, it really has done some damage. But it hasn't done enough damage. Luckily, Mother Righteous has something up her sleeve. With Vox Ignis coming in, the spirit of variance chasing behind him is Galactus. And Vox lets Mother Righteous know that he found them. All the spirits of vengeance who had fled Earth. He found a hive of hatred. And they have infested the Great Devourer. Now the other spirits, they're not a fan of Vox. Vox had hoped to make an alliance. Instead, they have hounded him like he is a vermin. He has been fleeing from Galactus for over 56 years. And Mother Righteous says that it was worth every single second. Off in the distance, this is where we see him coming in. A thousand years ago, the Sinisters had shot an unstoppable object right through the brain of a Titan. That, of course, was Juggernaut. They didn't stop to wonder where he might go next. But Destiny did. Destiny knew where he would go. A millennium of gravity wells, of slingshots. He has been building up speed, bending light and time. Unable to die, screaming in the vacuum of space. Unable to stop, just going. And so what Destiny did was tweak the path of the world farm, setting up a cosmic trick shot. And so when Juggernaut comes in, he absolutely decimates the world farm, and he goes right through the skull of Galactus. And so now that the world farm has been opened up, Mother Righteous and Vox, they head inside. The most faithful of all her Nightcrawlers goes in to give the last blow, teleporting directly into the barrier. We finally see it shatter. And with it shattering, we see the Moira Clone Laboratory. That's when we see the little golden orb that she has. Every magical item that she has possessed is in this one item. Now we believe that she was going to use this to break the barrier. But it appears that she has other plans for it. This holy purge was supposed to cleanse the Sinister Strain from everybody. Just like all the other Sinisters, Mother Righteous plans to kill a Moira. She plans to destroy this universe. And Vok Ignis, he thinks that this is a horrible, monstrous thing to do. You see, what Mother Righteous has been doing, she has been asking questions for centuries. Asking people about all of their biggest regrets. She is going to send all of those secrets back to herself. This isn't a cleansing purge. This is a cheat code. That way, in the next round, she is ready to win. When they go back in time, when the timeline is reset back to the very moment this Sinister started all of this, she is sending herself a message in a bottle. And with these secrets, she plans to do everything that a Sinister would do. As the spirit of Variance tries to let her know that this galaxy has lived. For hundreds and hundreds of years, we can't simply reset this. But then Mother Righteous, 
she takes the power that she had once given to Banshee, absorbing the spirit into her artifact, into her message in a bottle, Banshee no longer being connected to the spirit. And the last thing in all of this is that baby Nightcrawler. This is where we finally have the arrival of Wagnerine, the once faithful Nightcrawler. After having her baby stolen from Mother Righteous, she had fled away. She waited for her opportunity, and now she has come to claim her child. But against Mother Righteous, she is not enough. This is where we see Banshee take a knife, and he cuts her foot while he is on the ground. This momentary distraction, Mother Righteous turns her attention towards Banshee, only for our Nightcrawler to come up from behind her, and drive a tail right through her chest, continuously stabbing her over and over and over again. She takes her child and she disappears. Left behind is the artifact along with Banshee as he slowly dies. This is when we have a mysterious figure pop up. Grabbing hold of that artifact, stepping out of the shadows, we see that this is Moira. Now, if you remember, Moira was working with Sinister, but once they arrived at the World Farm, Moira disappeared. Everybody was wondering, where is Moira? What is she up to, and what is she doing? Well, now, we have our answer. Moira has the artifact, the message in a bottle, everybody's secrets, everything that somebody might hide. And while this is a message in a bottle, Moira could decide that she wants to go a different route. Hypothetically, they could turn this message in a bottle into a bomb. Moira could send this back in time when the timeline restarts, and it has the possibility of ending Sinister, of ending his cloning laboratory, and who knows what else. Alright gang, so this story is picking us up at the Storm System. This is the World Farm having the undead Galactus. Galactus being the steed of the Ghost Rider, the world farm in flames. But this story is starting us just a little bit before the last issue. Moira yet to get inside of that facility. All of this going down, Sinister has taken out John Ironfire. Moira stands outside of the vault, unable to get in. She knows that it is sealed and Mother Righteous and the others are not allowing anybody inside. So now the question is, how do we get in here? And Sinister is letting Moira know that he believed Galactus was their way in. And while they try to figure this out, that is where we have Juggernaut flying through space. Many people forgot that he was even in existence. You gotta remember, it's been roughly 900 years since they shot Juggernaut into space. Since they shot him like a freaking bullet when he went through the brain of Thanos. And he has been moving ever since, telling everybody to brace for impact. Juggernaut blows right through the world farm and right through Galactus. Moira wasting no time, she runs directly into the lab. While Sinister says to wait, that he needs to upload his mind before they restart the timeline. But as Sinister goes on to say this, that is when the spear goes right through his chest. We see John Ironfire back on his feet. Sinister believed that he had defeated him, but before an epic battle of this nature, he turns his blood into metal, which is his mutant gift. And before a battle like this, he makes sure to give all of his bones a little coating as well. But truth be told, Sinister has no concern for John Ironfire. He is more worried about Moira, because if he does not upload this data, the last thousand years will be a complete waste, at least for Sinister. And so while this is all ongoing, we pick up in space. We have Beast who is sitting at the helm. They know very well about the Moira clones. Everybody is making a mad dash for it, and so they want to deploy what they call the Namornauts. They are going to send them in to retrieve the Moira engine, but Hank also knows that they're going to need a distraction. This is where he tells them to dismantle the Quiet Council's psychic barriers. This may be a huge risk, 
but it is one that Hank is more than willing to take, because right now they are fighting for their very existence. That is what takes us to Charles Xavier and his forces. While Hank believed that he may be able to resist Xavier, but quickly diving into Hank's mind, he learns of the Moira clones. Recognizing that he probably needs to step in, he tells Hank that he has risked the dream. But with their connection, this has created a conduit so that he can astral project himself to the location of where Hank is. He tells them to fight for your dream. And we see him transform, with Xavier taking over Hank and the entire ship. Down on the ground, John Ironfire and Sinister have recognized that Xavier is here. With their defenses gone, all of their psychics dead, everyone dead. They quickly see that they are in trouble, or at least Ironfire is in trouble. Sinister already has defenses ready and set up against Xavier. But then Ironfire cuts his forehead open. His blood turns into metal. It turns into any metal. And as the leader of the Brotherhood, he believes that he should look the part. That is where we see the helmet form over his head, almost identical to that of Magneto. As Ironfire gets ready to drive a sword right through Sinister, Sinister, like he usually does, flees for his life, telling him that you need me to stop Xavier. You may be able to block out the psychic attack, but you cannot fight him as you are. You are gonna need more power. And with his power being his blood, this means he needs more blood. This is where Sinister pulls out a secret weapon. With blood being 90% water, a dose of Bobby Drake would give him all the chilled water he needs. Telling him that if you let me go, I will more than willingly give this over to you. And while Ironfire does play with the idea that he could just take it from him and activate it, there are two options here. He goes to face Charles, or he lets Sinister go. Now Sinister could run off and restart the timeline. Maybe someone will stop him, maybe someone won't. But no matter what, Charles will not be stopped. If he gets his hands on the Moiras, it is all game over for everybody. This universe will keep on existing, but it will be his universe. And he will have the Moira engines. He will be dang near unstoppable. With Ironfire saying that he will come back to kill him, we see Bobby injected into Ironfire. With the metal now going all over his body, he takes to the sky. He takes to face off against Xavier. As the two of them have their battle begin, Sinister has made his way to the Moira lab. Getting there, what he sees is the original Moira, but he also sees the skulls of all the Nightkin. Not really sure what happened here, wishing he had more time to understand, because some of these skeletons are very, very old. He immediately assumes that Moira is trying to make a play, and so he takes aim at her. He begins to fire, but the two of them at a standoff. Sinister is asking what happened to Mother Righteous. This is when Moira fills him in, letting him know that she broke in with a scheme, but her stooges had turned on her. She had a plan and it all went wrong. But Sinister just trying to upload his mind into this machine. Moira tells him that there is no way in hell she is going to allow this to happen. She doesn't want him to learn from this. Turning Moira into a glorified hard drive, she obviously is taking offense. But Sinister says that if he sends nothing back, all of this will happen again. It'll be a thousand year rerun. To add all of this up, you still have Xavier, who is eventually gonna make his way through John Ironfire. Xavier getting a hold of this and trapping them in his heaven. Neither Moira nor Sinister have a place in Xavier's dream. With the psychic shockwave that just hit them, they see that John Ironfire has gone down. Not only that, but the Namor Knots are headed directly for them. They have mere moments to reset all of this. In this situation, Sinister is the least worst option. Moira telling him that he will pay for this. Before they can say any more words, the Namor Knots have shown up. Moira trying to hold them off. Sinister starts typing away at the computer. He is able to make the upload. This is when she says to activate the engine, and Sinister could. This universe has taught him a lot, but he has seen exactly how bad things can get when they go astray. This is when he thinks that maybe, just perhaps, he should become a god. 
This is when he goes to the Inferno failsafe. Inside of his modified X-Gene has two purposes. To clear up an experiment that is run out of control, and in the unlikely event they ever reach a sufficient population of sinister mutant hybrids, he can effectively harvest their psychic essence. He can use this to push himself outside of this reality. This will bring him to a state of existence normally reserved for the AI gods. This is known as Dominionhood. He says if they kill every single person in the universe with his modified X-Gene, he can use all of them as fuel. They were gonna wipe this dimension away regardless, so one final atrocity before the last call. He presses that button, and we see it all activate. From the Namor Knights all the way to Charles Xavier, the X-Gene connecting all of them. A galaxy of mutant sinisters burning in an instant. It would take a miracle for anybody to survive. The screams echo throughout the universe. The knowledge of all those minds consumed digested and injected into his hungry psyche. He has finally built a staircase straight out of reality, and every step is a corpse. He has now become everything. As he ascends, becoming a dominion, he makes his way out here, only to run into something that is already here. There is something blocking him. The space is filled. A dominion already exists. Asking what this is, it tells him that he is the being that is harvesting the power the Sinister stole. Whatever is his, now belongs to him. A being of infinite knowledge and perspective. He could tell him everything. Instead, he shares a single fact with him. When Sinister asks, who am I? This giant red bubble says, not you. That is when Sinister is cast back down to Moira in the laboratory. He recognizes that he is already too late. A Sinister Dominion is already outside of time and space. This already happened in another timeline. With it being outside of time and space, it can act across all timelines. Sinister quickly seeing that he is too late, and it wasn't him. Now, we thought that John Ironfire had died multiple times in this comic, but we see him coming through that doorway. Xavier was unable to finish the job because of what Sinister had done. Igniting the Inferno had killed Xavier. This is what saved the life of John Ironfire. Sinister seeing that he killed the galaxy. He killed everybody and it was for nothing. He says that one of them have done it. Whether it be Dr. Stasis, whether it be Orbis or Mother Righteous, none of it matters because he lost. This is when John Ironfire cuts off the head of Sinister. After a thousand years, Sinister has learned that he is nothing. Moira going up to one of her clones, she executes it, and we restart the timeline. That is what takes us back to year zero. Sinister in his laboratory. Right now, he is working on making another Moira. He knows that he needs a save point. He knows that he needs to be out of here. This is when he sees that he has an upload. A very large file of 1,000 years. Very unusually long. But wanting to see what's in here, he goes to download the information. That is when there is a giant explosion. Because Moira has shown up. She tells Sinister a story. Mother Righteous was going to insert a mystic virus into the machine. She had spent thousands of years trying to find the right tools to do this. But failing in the last second, stabbed in the back and the throat, she needed a specific soul to sacrifice the finish. And she had prepared one to do the job. A radiant soul saturated in the purifying faith of fanatics without number. Feeding her into the heart and corrupting the machine, Sinister had interrupted Moira before she could reset the timeline. But she is glad that she failed, because she saw something that Sinister must know. He made an attempt to ascend to Dominionhood, and he failed. The last thing she did before burning that timeline to the ground was have the machine take a reading of his mind, because the realization that he came to that all he gets to learn from 1,000 years of Hell Unleashed is that this story is Moira's. Sinister story is over. That is when the laboratory explodes. The X-Genes in the Moira had been neutralized before they were killed. That is what the virus did. But all the files, all the uploads, everything is gone. 
But before Moira had left, she left a little gift behind for Sinister. With the cloning machine activating, there is only one cloning tube that survived this blast. And from that tube, this is where we have Rasputin 4. Wielding her sword, she is letting Nathaniel know that he is wanted for the murder of mutant kind. That he will pay for his sins. This is what takes us to Mother Righteous. She goes into a room that was never here before. She opens up the door to find a whole library. A brand new wing. She is seeing that Mother Righteous from the future had created a situation where when she came back, all of the knowledge came back in the form of this wing on the library. So while she didn't upload her mind or memories, all she has to do now is read these books. This will give her a catch up on the last thousand years that had transpired. This is what takes us over to Krakoa. Kitty Pride and what remains of the Quiet Council, they are on the warpath as they get ready to go hunt down Sinister. This is when Destiny senses that the future has changed, that there is more of it. A portal opening up, we have Rasputin 4. In tow behind her is Sinister, but more than anything, she is seeing that Krakoa is real. Kitty Pride, the first one to make the introductions. Rasputin lets it be known that she is Captain of the Marauder, that she comes from a thousand years in the future, and that Sinister's crimes are numberless, that he must be punished for every single one of them. And so the rest of the Quiet Council, resurrected and brought back here, Nathaniel is pleading for his life. He says it was all a huge mistake. But at this point, the Quiet Council, they have no time to hear his pleas. They say that you are going directly to the pit. He tries to tell them that they don't understand. That he is not the threat. He is not the one that they need to be afraid of. That there are other Sinisters. In the grand scheme of things, he is nothing. He is the one that failed, but one of them succeeded. With the Sinister Dominion outside of time and space, a stain on existence, it is already there. They have already won, and it is far too late. A last ditch effort, he reaches out to Irene. He tells Destiny that they have to stop it. It is down to her now, but he also says that it has already happened, so it is already too late. That she must find a way to remember that they are on the same side. Now she understands. Only she can understand. As he goes down into the pit, he says that he is not even a crumb between the teeth of a god. That he is nothing. As the pit swallows him up, everybody's a little concerned on the sincerity of how he was saying this. He seemed very particularly convincing. Of course, Rasputin 4 says that she was lied to for 900 years that you can't believe a word from his mouth. And while Destiny says that she doesn't know specifically what he is talking about, most of them are brushing this off as him trying to escape, trying not to be put in the pit. When Kitty Pride asks Rasputin, how did you come to be? To fill us in on the latest dark future, how did you become our savior? But Rasputin says that she is a mere soldier, that if you want to meet the savior, I can introduce you. That is where Mother Righteous comes into play. She fills them in that she essentially got a download from the future. Filling them in on exactly what has been happening, Sinister has been cloning Moira's. Storing the data about the timeline in her brain and then killing her to reset everything back to the past. Destiny confirms this by saying that she had been investigating but she didn't want to tell anybody. She was concerned that Sinister would find out and reset the timeline. But Mother Righteous goes on to say that he took over the world and then he lost the Moiras. The galaxy went mad for a thousand years. Sinister's everywhere. And so as the Quiet Council says that they need some time to really go over all this information, Mother Righteous has one more thing to let them know. By offing hope, by taking hope out of the equation, he was able to do some very clever gene melding. He got a copy of himself inside the four he killed, which means he can take over any of the Quiet Council that had been murdered, and they may not even know it. This is when she excuses herself and lets the Quiet Council talk about what happened, with Storm saying that they can't have anybody that might be compromised in power. Xavier, he thinks that this is not nearly sufficient enough. 
calling Mother Righteous and Rasputin back into the room until they can be sure that their genes are clear of any sinister influence. They know that they are unsafe. They must be held safely. And no matter how unpleasant it is, the pit is their most secure prison. As they ask Mother Righteous how they could ever repay her for the debt. Because today she is she has done a huge service for all of Krakoa. But she says a simple thank you will be more than enough. And so Storm saying from every mutant on this island, we think Mother Righteous. So a lot of theories are going to quickly be thrown out the window. If you had listened to our conversation with Blurred Without Fear, me and him definitely threw some ideas back and forth on what we think might happen. There were so many questions left unanswered, but Immortal X-Men issue number 11 is giving us everything that we need to know. And so our story starts us off with Storm and Rasputin 4. With Storm being the region of Arako, she had left everything to the Quiet Council. The only thing she asked of them is to make this work. Obviously, that all went sideways, telling Doug that it is time to begin. This is when they bring up the first one from the pit. They bring up Charles Xavier. Now, if you remember, everybody was thrown down into the pit. At least our four members that had to be resurrected, that we believe have the sinister gene in them. Rasputin is here because she is the one to keep them under control, psychically and physically restrained. While Charles is just asking what is going on, they tell him that they will explain later bringing up the rest one by one. We have Hope, we have Exodus, and we have Emma Frost all coming back from the pit. And so their time in the pit didn't last very long. Storm has been working with great effort, hand in hand with Forge, to try and figure out a way to get the Quiet Council back to its regular numbers. And Charles is the first one to say, is all this really necessary? Now, Rasputin 4, she has seen the future. She has lived through it. In her eyes, all of these guys have the great potential of being evil. So when Xavier is trying to ask if this is all necessary, that they have voluntarily thrown themselves into the pit, which he does mention is not pleasant down there, but he doesn't go into any more detail. They say that the four of them have done everything to help secure Krakoa's future. And Storm says that yes, you have but only when it's too late. Taking all of them to Forge and hooking them up to the system. They had their every science brain go in on this. Double checked all of the genetic database. They had found nothing, but then they went back. They worked out the whole routine, and that is when they found it. You see, Sinister had created a sub-dimensional loop in the DNA sample. It coils into another dimension. It is almost totally invisible. There is one base pair stitched together. That is the only sign that he has been messing around. But in there, there is a whole other genome. One that is toxic, just waiting to attack. But he does believe that they can remove the loop. That the genetics are lost in time and space. But all the genomes should be all back to normal. And now that Sinister has been wiped from their system, Storm says that you guys aren't just jumping back into business as usual. Forge goes on to explain that he thinks he removed it. If he got it all, he is unsure. If it will come back, he doesn't know. They did miss it before, so who knows what other tricks Sinister has left in them. And so Storm is taking every precaution. Xavier is removed from resurrection duties. Hope's work will continue at a reduced rate, but anybody that she brings back will go through Forge's cleansing process and then they will be under heavy psychic surveillance because the risk of that person being compromised is still out there. When it comes to voting rights on the Quiet Council, until they can find a way to truly be sure, none of them have the right to vote. The problem that Xavier sees with this is that they are being asked to prove a negative, that they can never truly be sure if they wipe Sinister from them. This is when she tells them that there is something that they need to see. Mother Righteous has provided a detailed historical record of that timeline, of the sins of Sinister. Rasputin providing psychic access to make sure all of this is on the up and up. 
and Storm has noticed that Rasputin has a certain self-righteousness to her. This does concern her, because while Rasputin may be a true believer in Krakoa, we have all seen the path that that can lead down. And so the Quiet Council is going to sit down and they are going to watch this. Now they could telepathically implant all of these memories, all of these visions into their mind. But Storm wants to do it the old-fashioned way. She doesn't want this to be over quickly. She wants this to linger. She wants them to have time to think. By the time that they have finished this, Hope cannot even look at Exodus without being absolutely disgusted. Xavier recognizing the severity of the situation, all he tells Storm is to tell us what you need. And so the way Storm sees it, they cannot be seen publicly dismissing four members of the Quiet Council. It would look like chaos, but they also can't go without their input. The vast knowledge between those four alone, it is an insight that is a necessity to Krakoa. And so Rasputin is going to be the personal security at all times. She will stand by the side of Xavier. She will ensure that he never steps out of line. When Charles asks what's been going on in their absence, with Destiny, with the Moiras, all of it, that's when they go to the Quiet Council Chamber, and sitting there waiting is Destiny. Storm and Charles, they have some questions, because Destiny has known about the Moira engine. Destiny says that it was too much of a risk. She didn't know where the engines were. She was too worried that Sinister would restart the timeline. But Storm also saw everything from that timeline. Irene had tricked Storm, tricked her into stealing the Moira engines. Even further, Destiny knew how to deactivate the X-Gene. The same she did with the real Moira. The question now remains, why did you not deactivate it when you had the chance? Now for the readers, we already know this. She wants to keep Mystique as long as she can. Alive, healthy, for as long as she can live. She kept the sinister timeline going. She did all of this for the love of her life. But this is not information that she is willing to divulge to either Storm or Charles. And while she goes on to say that there was an indestructible shell around the Moira Labs, that there were failsafe after failsafe, and this is the reason she didn't do anything, but she did give them the option, the opportunity, to be able to take it back later on. But Storm knows that something is being hidden from her. She doesn't know what it is. Storm wants to know why this timeline was kept running for as long as it was. But Destiny says that this meeting is over. That's when Charles tells Storm that they have to go. Because right now, Hope and Exodus are going toe to toe. With Hope calling Exodus a Judas, Storm says that she's gonna go stop them. But Destiny can't hide the truth forever. This is where we pick up with Mystique. Mystique in a room, she is running into Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous believing that she was coming to her in the shadows. Mystique grabs hold of her and puts a knife up to her throat, asking what she wants. Mother Righteous has just come to deliver a message. The message that Irene had created for Sinister in the Sinister Timeline. This is Mother Righteous just planting those little seeds of doubt, of mistrust. It appears that her goal is divide and conquer. As we pick back up with Hope and Exodus, Storm comes in trying to separate the two. She comes in with a strike that could shatter a mountain, but against these powerful individuals, it is almost like throwing water in their face. This is because Hope is feeling betrayed after seeing that timeline. Seeing what Exodus had done to her, Storm breaking them up saying that it has been hard for all of Krakoa, but you both need to understand how much you mean to everybody. The leader of the five and her shield, who stood defiant on Judgment Day, with mutant kind currently looking up at you two battling in the sky. Do you really want them to see this? And so the two of them coming back down to the ground. This is when Hope says, do you know what an Omega level power manipulator means? It's not 
memory banks. It's not range or the accessories. Hope was killed in that timeline by Exodus leaving her behind. Omega means there are no limits to what she can do manipulating powers. This is where she takes the powers from Exodus. And the fight continues on the ground. Hope is just laying down the hate on Exodus. She beats the living crap out of him. Telling him that your god gives and your god takes away. To stay away from her. That she is not his messiah. That he is not a church. Walking away, she apologizes to Storm. Saying that there are simply no words. This is where Storm has to head back to Arako. Logos waiting for her by the gateway. Having a quick conversation with both Charles and Emma. With Charles walking away, Emma and Storm have a conversation. Now everybody is taking all of this pretty hard, except for Emma. The thing is, Emma, she, she's already done the supervillain thing. She is very used to shame, but she also understands that they weren't themselves. Sinister had unlocked the worst part of them, and she knows better than anybody that they aren't their worst selves, no, how, no matter how much anybody thinks of that. Her time in the Hellfire Club had taught her all of this. But Storm also says it's not just what happened then, it's what you did now. That future was brought on because of the present day games that you guys are playing. And Emma, she kind of pauses and says that this is a bit hypocritical. You said no thrones on Arako, yet you end up being worshipped like some King Arthur. And to even further this, there is something that has been missed that was a key point in this awful future. Yes, Storm was a hero. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. But Storm was herself for every single second of that future. And it took her five years until she realized something was wrong. Five years of being the region of Arako. While down on Krakoa, they were drowning. And so she asked Storm, what did you do? You did nothing until it was too late. She tells Storm that you're on the Quiet Council for a reason. And with their votes gone, they need Storm more than ever. But still now, she is about to pop off and head over to Mars. As the two of them take off, we pick up with Sebastian Shaw and Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous saying that Sebastian had played his part well. The two of them have a budding business relationship going. He didn't want to blow it up by revealing that the new friend of Krakoa was also the money behind Celine's power play. And Sebastian would like to develop this relationship even further. He knows that this place is tipping. It is about to all go south. Krakoa is rich. If it does go down, he wants it all. He wants to own Krakoa. This is when he asks if she is able to arrange that. She says that she can, but she wants something a little more practical than a simple thank you. To use his position on the Quiet Council to proposition certain motions. And while he says that these motions will never pass, even with four votes gone, she tells him to why not take the opportunity and see what you can do. This is what takes us to days later. Storm has arrived back to the Quiet Council, and while Emma's words definitely ticked her off, she knows that it is true. And so she has come to the Quiet Council chambers to meet up with one of the members. She fears the situation between Charles and herself is deteriorating. She has become aware of a certain truth. She has responsibilities on two worlds, but she cannot be in two places at once. She also doesn't want to step down from either of these duties. There will inevitably be council business that she cannot attend to, and so she needs someone on the Quiet Council, someone to speak for her. If an emergency situation demands it, she wants this individual to be the proxy and vote appropriately. This is when it is revealed the person she is talking to is none other than Colossus. Right, gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up at the Quiet Council. All the members that have been compromised, or at least they're theorized to possibly be compromised, they are being asked to leave. This is about to be a closed session. As Emma Frost, Xavier, and all the others, they make their exit. Sebastian Shaw immediately puts it up for a vote. The sinister seat has been left open for too long. He is now pushing to have that seat filled. Now at first, Kitty Pride thinks that this is Sebastian Shaw just playing at political games. 
which it really is at the end of the day. The problem is, she didn't think that Shaw would have the votes to go ahead and do this. But then there is Colossus. Now, Colossus is under the control of a reality warper known as the Chronicler, with Colossus's brother being the one manipulating the entire situation. His obvious goal is the downfall of Krakoa, and so any move that Colossus makes, it seems like it's gonna be more in the interest of making Krakoa fall, of bringing it down to its knees. And he is probably the most dangerous individual right now, because with so much of the Quiet Council being compromised, Colossus has three votes. Storm is Nightcrawler's proxy. Colossus is Storm's proxy. With Storm not being here, that means Colossus gets three votes. Immediately, Kitty Pride is shocked. She is shocked that Pete would go down this route, that he would vote with Sebastian Shaw. But with four votes against three, they introduce the newest member to the Quiet Council. And that member is none other than Celine. At this point, Kitty Pride is absolutely losing it. And throughout this comic, we're getting the kind of narration from the Chronicler. While Colossus is under control, it seems he, he understands what's happening to him. But he is unable to let anybody know. At this point, Colossus is hoping that somebody catches on. That somebody realizes he is acting out of character. That this is not him. That there is something wrong with him. But with Selene making her arrival to the Quiet Council, Selene was thought to be dead. But Mutant Kind is not the only people with resurrection possibilities. Because magic can be a very powerful thing. As they have this conversation, this is where Destiny speaks up. At first, she simply says no, and then she goes on to say that Shaw is working with Orcus. Obviously, Shaw refutes these claims, that he would happily go to a psychic search to confirm the facts. This is where Mystique calls in Rasputin 4. Without any hesitation, she goes into the mind of Shaw. Examining him, she learns that he has no relation with Orcus. This confuses Destiny, because this is something she saw. This is something that she has seen. When Rasputin 4 says that she could scan her mind to see if this vision is correct, Destiny immediately says no. Absolutely not, that is not happening. Now, Kitty Pride at this point, she's looking at Colossus, and she's asking, what the hell? How far does this coup go? Now, at first glance, Kitty Pride sees this as Colossus selling them out for an extra vote, ensuring that Kurt's vote will always go to Colossus, at least until he returns or there is some kind of replacement chosen. But Colossus goes on to say that he has sold no one out, that the council has become corrupt, that he became the liaison for X-Force to prevent any kind of further abuse of power. The way that he sees it, the good are gone and only the sinners remain. The Quiet Council is heavy with secrets, and so now he is moving to release the full details of the Sinister Timeline to the world. While he makes this proposal in the green room, we have Hope, Exodus, Xavier, and Emma. Now, at first, Hope is wondering why nobody is even trying to check in on the situation, but they don't want to breach any trust. They believe that they did only make the situation much worse. But Hope, she cannot help herself. As she peeks in on the situation, she sees what's going on and she immediately heads toward the Quiet Council. Standing directly in her way is none other than Rasputin 4. This is where we also see Mother Righteous. Just recently, she had been banished, but she has made her return. And so while she manipulates the situation as well, we see Rasputin 4 go and attack Hope. While Emma Frost, she is doing an examination of Hope's mind. Kinda a way around the rules, not breaching anybody's trust, just seeing what Hope is up to. And Emma has learned that Selene is back, that they have voted her onto the council. Now at this point, Emma is about ready to put Colossus to sleep, but that is where Xavier stops her. He says that even now, we cannot do this. With Hope reaching out to Exodus, saying that if you want to make things up to me, if you want to make it right, 
come and help me with Rasputin 4. But he says that he cannot stop this. And if he cannot, then who can? At this point, Kitty Pride is recognizing that they are fighting outside. But Colossus is letting it be known that they must continue. While Kitty argues that this is something that you cannot spring onto the council. That there must be debate. This is where we have a small delay. Because we have the arrival of Storm. At this point, Colossus is no longer able to fight back against the Rider. He has been trying with all of his power to fight against this reality warper, hoping that someone might realize how broken he has become, how corrupted and compromised he is. And Storm is asking, what the heck are you doing? He is moving that they break while they consider their options, to calm down and return to debate this. He believes his position is just, and he is happy to convince anybody that that is true. And so as they take this break, this is what picks us up with Mystique and Destiny. Now Mystique feels a little bit foolish. Destiny said she had a vision. Mystique wanted to prove that this vision was true. She didn't know that Destiny was lying. Either it was a lie, or just Destiny didn't actually know. The problem is, when the Moira engine had been destroyed, all the futures were reborn. Now it is much bigger, a whole new map, and she only knows the old map. She is yet to gain the larger perspective of what is yet to come. This is all new territory, and right now, Destiny is terrified. She is more blind than she has ever been before. She is scared. She is in a weakened state. This is when Destiny sees that Mystique is going to kill her. Now, Mystique lets it be known that she would never do that, but she does want her to listen to something. This is where Mystique plays the recording from the Sinister Timeline, the one where Destiny is saying that she would do absolutely anything to ensure that Mystique stays alive. And when Mystique died in the Sinister Timeline, she was ready to burn down the entire universe. But Mystique goes on to say that this is simple. Our love may be immortal, but we are not. You must accept that at some point in time, you are going to lose me. That I will die. As the two of them embrace one another, we have Mother Righteous manipulating things from the outside, casting her spell, we see that Mystique does turn on Destiny. Her arm manifesting into a sword. We see that sword going right through the stomach of Destiny. Destiny beginning to bleed out and then she eventually dies. As we pick up later at the arbor, Destiny is being resurrected. And Mystique is saying that she doesn't know what overcame her. Suddenly she was filled with anger and then she killed Destiny. Sebastian Shaw is also here just to let them know that hope is compromised. Anybody that she resurrects is also compromised. This means that Destiny's vote no longer counts. And so with four votes for, three votes against, and five unable to vote, it has been decided that the world is going to know of the sins of Krakoa. When Storm goes on to ask Colossus why, he simply says that you trusted me, but I don't trust you. That it would be arrogant to assume that I was going to agree with you in all things. Colossus using all the willpower that he has. He lets Storm know that I am not your playing piece. Or at least it looks like he's speaking to Storm. But really, could he be speaking to the reality warper? Trapped inside of his own mind, Colossus prays for any kind of deliverance. He wishes that Storm could see past all of this. To see the awful truth that he is trapped in a Russian novel, tormented by his brother, and his escape is impossible. With Storm walking off saying that they will live with what he has done today, and she can only hope that he is right. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up at the Quiet Council. Like I said, this is hugely going to focus on Cypher, so most of this comic is going to be his narration. And currently, the Quiet Council, they are arguing over the release of the Sinister Timeline. The world now knows about it. They know of the potential future where Sinister takes over everything. But while they bicker and argue, Cypher notices something. He notices the leaves, and Krakoa is able to sum all of this up with two words. It's fall. But this has nothing to do with the season. It has everything to do with mutant kind. It has everything to do with the fall of X. But as we continue on, the outside world knows about the sinister timeline. 
and it's gone about how you would expect the world to take it. People are not happy. And to the world, it doesn't matter if it was just Sinister. Sinister was on the council. His sins are the council's sins. And while Emma Frost, she had gone to the UN on a personal mission. That didn't go well for her. And moreover, all the orders that Krakoa has been sending out, all of their medicines, everything that they sell, people are dropping them like flies. The problem with this, Krakoa is not a self-sustaining nation. They sell goods and they buy what they need. And so if their goods are not being bought, they cannot afford their little paradise. As it stands, the nation of Krakoa only has months left. In the financial standpoint. And Emma Frost a little bit frustrated with this. When she originally joined up, she didn't join up so she could spend all day peering at graphs. At this point, Emma is irate. The whole situation. Sebastian Shaw not seeing this coming. Colossus and his ethics. But with Charles Xavier stepping in. Trying to calm the situation down. But Selene doesn't make things any better. And Emma Frost more than anything wishes that she would have found out about this sooner. Found out about Selene coming onto the Quiet Council. Cause if she would have known about it, she would have ripped out her heart from the very start. She would have never given her a chance to even be voted onto the Council. The way Xavier sees it, they keep to the rules. That is what matters, it shows that they are still who they are. But the way that Emma sees it, playing the good boy doesn't prove that you're not sinister. That he doesn't have a hold of you. But with Destiny chiming in saying that none of this matters. While Celine should be gone, she is still on this council. Reminding everybody of the laws that she broke. Now this has nothing to do with Orcus. Though Irene was wrong about that whole situation. Selene had attacked Krakoa. She desecrated the land. That is a sacred law. A sacred rule. And so in Destiny's mind, they should send another person down to the pit. And that person should be Selene. But Storm does chime in saying that this is not the time. That they must calm things down before they fall from the infighting. With five council members without a vote, they are about to tear themselves apart. She says that they must find a way to fix this council before everything falls. But Destiny continues on saying that Selene should be thrown into the pit, or at the very least, thrown off of the council. And in this situation, Hope is siding with Destiny. Hope would be more than happy to put a bullet into Selene. At this point, Destiny is really throwing everything at the wall and just seeing what sticks. Even going as far as talking about resurrection. That if Selene is back, there is a possibility the Sinister might have his claws in her. But she came back through magical methods. And this is when Exodus does his thing. Immediately turning to Selene and he gives her a devastating blow. Using his laser eyes, he almost instantly takes out Selene in this moment, as she begins to bleed out from her stomach. The way Exodus sees this, Selene dies. The five bring her back, she loses her vote. And with Selene making her attack, Exodus lets her know that you simply don't understand my power. That she cannot resist the true mutant divine. That he will separate every single molecule in her body and then scatter them to the four corners of existence. That there is nothing she can do to stop Exodus. And as he begins to break her apart, before he fully gets the opportunity, Storm comes to intervene. And so, up in the sky, we have Storm and we have Exodus. The two of them at a standoff. Exodus saying that he fights for Krakoa. And while Storm says that she also fights for Krakoa, that if the two of them are to fight, if they truly unleash their power, that that would kill everybody on this island. And so Exodus decides to stand down, knowing the cost of the battle with Storm is too much, with Xavier saying that he went too far, that it was unacceptable. Exodus does admit that it was, but he asks, what can you do about it? Sabretooth you can put into the pit. Sinister, maybe Selene. But Exodus? Storm? If they so choose, they could govern themselves. They do not need to be governed. They cannot be controlled. That they only allow this to happen so that the utopia can happen. At one time, 
Exodus had laughed at the Iraqi people. But the people of Iraqo, they fully understand what war is. They understand that the only thing that truly matters is power. And those whose power means they cannot be controlled and choose not to be controlled. Those are the ones that must lead. That this whole time he has been fighting for Krakoa. But there is no Krakoa. They have compromised with the devil. They have invited snakes into the garden. As Exodus begins to have a mental breakdown. Fully understanding the actions that they have done. That has led to the downfall of society. And so Hope grabs hold of him and she goes for a walk. The two of them trying to walk this off. While everybody takes a break. This is where Cypher comes into play. He goes to have a talk with the professor. Now at first Charles is saying that he has a lot of work to do. That he doesn't have time for a little talk. Not unless Krakoa has a message. And Krakoa does have a message. He's got a message from Krakoa. As in everybody on this island. Finally somebody is stepping up and saying what needs to be said. He is telling Charles that you are tarnished, that you cannot save us, and every time you try, you are going to drag us all down. Telling Charles to read his mind because he has something prepared, that there are some things he should know. Asking Charles, have you noticed that the leaves on Krakoa, they are falling, and Cypher knows why. They have all been bad, mainly by trying to be good. Even Cypher admits that he is the one that let Moira go when Destiny and Mystique had schemed to kill her. But most of all, he hasn't been running the pit as Charles had wanted. Him, Emma, Exodus, Hope, and Sinister. They are the only ones who actually got the trapped feeling of nothingness. Everyone else, he gave them a psychic place to be. And Sabretooth had used that. It is why him and everyone he was with had escaped the pit. Something that none of them knew until right this moment. He apologizes for betraying them. But he's not sorry that he did it. He knew that they viewed the pit as a glorified naughty step. But it's not, and it's simply never going to be. But Sabretooth getting out did change things. Everyone realized what the pit was, and what they had done. Not everyone as in the Jeans and Scots, or the people that could imagine themselves on the Quiet Council. The people like Cypher, the ones that don't go into combat, the mutants that they are trying to protect. They are a persecuted people. They know what bad government looks like. And that is exactly what the pit is. And then with the sinister timeline, with Beast going completely out of control, people no longer believe in Krakoa. And Krakoa the island, it feeds off of everybody else. The island has become sick because of this. That they need to be good or nothing. That right now they are a sick country, and it is only making them more sick. With Charles taking off his helmet, he says that he didn't want this. That it had to be a compromise. Moira's experience showed purity failed, and so he bent it in so many ways. Mutant separatism, mutant essentialism. These are ideas, the concepts that he despised. His work has always been that mutants are humans. And he had gone along with all of these tactics. Exodus, he is correct in a way. If they are bound together, they could survive. But it is all a lie. And while it was a useful lie, now that Max is dead, Moira betrayed them. Apocalypse had left. He believed that it was all up to him. But Cypher is letting him know that you can't do it. That you must let go. The only question... Can you let go? Because if you can't, all of this is done. And so as we pick up at the quiet council meeting a little bit later, Xavier has come with a proposition. They have all failed. The council's authority is now bankrupt. What they are going to do is announce the quiet council being disbanded at this year's Hellfire Gala. Getting rid of the old management and promise that a new one, it will be better. They knew that many people would object to this, and so only a select few were even told that this is going to happen. That way there was no time to debate, there was no time for any chance schemes or something stupid. 
This is going to be a decision that is going to stick. No matter what Celine has to say or Mystique or anybody else. And Hope has already talked to the Five. They are going on strike until they agree to this regime change. And while Exodus definitely has some words to say about this, that is where Cypher chimes in, saying that this is not perfect, but it's not nothing. This is an evolution. That maybe what they buy today is a chance to evolve. They continue going on about human thinking, but believing that they could build a utopia from scratch and all of it go perfectly. That is the most human thinking of all. That history is full of fallen utopias, put together by those who thought themselves entirely unprecedented. But he tells Exodus that he's right, that they are not a people, and they never had a chance to be a people. They are just people, singular and alone, that they must find a way to be otherwise. That maybe they can be the Krakoa that they always wanted to be. With Cypher going on to say that he moves to dissolve the council, asking if there are any objections. There are none. This is when Krakoa speaks up, and before Cypher can say anything, Krakoa grabs hold of him and it sucks him down into the ground. The members of the former Quiet Council, they begin to panic, not knowing what's going on or what is happening. Hope, while she has the opportunity, she talks to Krakoa, borrowing powers from Doug before it is too late and she can no longer do so. And what Krakoa says is that Doug must be protected, asking what he must be protected from. Before they are able to get an answer, the powers are gone. Doug has been put somewhere that he cannot be accessed. Somewhere safe, they are all assuming. Asking what Destiny sees. She sees nothing. She sees a blinding white nothing. That at some point, they have made a mistake. And Emma Frost goes on to say that they have made way more than just one. Alright gang, so we are diving weeks later from the fall of X. The Hellfire Gala, it is in the rearview mirror. We pick up on Krakoa, a population of one. And I know many people have wondered, is this actually true? Is Xavier the only mutant on Krakoa? And what we saw before the fall of X was Cypher. Doug had got sucked into Krakoa. So yes, technically there are two people on Krakoa, but we don't really know what happened with Doug. We're all assuming that Krakoa put it down in the pit and he's keeping Doug safe because Doug is his only means of communication. It is the only way that he can talk to the outside world. But as we look upon Charles, we see that these weeks have not been kind to him. He has felt the full weight of mutant kind dying. 250,000 mutants that he believes he is responsible for killing, taking control of them and leading them all into the gateways. But what he didn't know is that Orcus did something. He's not sure what they did, but he can no longer feel them. He can no longer connect with them. And so the way that Charles sees it, all of them have died. And so the mutant massacre is taking such a heavy toll on his mind, while Charles lives with the consequences of his actions. This is where we jump over to the day after the Hellfire Gala. We are picking up with Sebastian Shaw. And of course, Sebastian Shaw, he betrayed mutant kind. Now partnering up with Orcus, they have come to give him the cure. And Sebastian Shaw takes this cure willingly. For him, this is no problem at all. In his mind, he was never really a mutant. He just had a mutant gene. But the first question that he must ask, how rich am I? Because he just sold out mutant kind. He's expecting to get a whole windfall of money. But his funds, they remain unchanged. This is where he becomes irate. Krakoa is his. He owns the entire island. But he does not own the country's finances. They're not sure exactly where Krakoan money is. But man is Shaw about to find out. This is where Shaw throws on his coat and he heads to the Hellfire Club. As he goes to his ritual circle, this is where he summons Mother Righteous. The deal that they had struck was that Sebastian Shaw would get the country's worth of funds. All the money that Krakoa had was supposed to go into his bank account. This is where Mother Righteous tells him that he is being naive. You're acting like you made a deal with a businesswoman. When the truth is, you made a deal with a magician, with a speller, with a storyteller. At this point, he's recognizing that he is getting screwed over. 
he vows that he will destroy Mother Righteous. And Mother Righteous knows that he might try, but he broke the magic circle of their little quiet council. And when you do something like that, that puts you in danger. This is where the soldiers move in on Sebastian Shaw. They let him know that his membership to the Hellfire Gala has been revoked. Because the Hellfire Gala, they have a brand new owner. With the men escorting Sebastian Shaw outside, this is where he learns the truth. The new owner of the Hellfire Gala is Wilson Fisk. The Kingpin is the new White King. This is the deal that Emma Frost and Kingpin had made. Putting the Hellfire Club into the hands of somebody that is not a mutant. This keeps the Hellfire Club going. It keeps it off the radar of Orcus. And this is when Emma Frost goes ahead and has a little conversation with Shaw. Telepathically communicating with him. She tells him that he went for the short trade. That he left so much money on the table. That he could have been truly rich if he had stuck by mutant kind. But now, he is asking for scraps from their table. When Sebastian Shaw comes to outside the Hellfire Gala. Sebastian Shaw is not giving up. His superpower has always been the ability to turn cents into billions. One of the best businessmen on the planet, but also one of the most corrupt. Regardless, he is making arrangements. He wants to begin the exploitation of Krakoa immediately. He's going for the surface resources. Salvage anything that is not nailed down. And Krakoa, a living island currently in semi-hibernation. They want to make sure that that stays that way. Once they are assured that this is going to stay asleep, they begin their mining. Exploring the underground labs. Not only that, but whoever is in the pit, they are also going for. He wants to see what Orcus will pay for Sinister. If they don't offer him enough money, they'll simply kill him on principle. But they want to attempt to control this sleeping giant. And then maybe they can start a bioengine of making anything Forge could do. Anything that Forge did, he wants to profit off of. But as we pick up weeks later, we have Sebastian Shaw and Celine, And we are seeing that the exploitation of Krakoa is not going as planned. They haven't even got to stage one. They are at stage zero. This is because anytime anybody comes onto the island, giant monsters are appearing and scaring them off the island. There is something or someone that is preventing anybody from stepping foot on that island. This is what takes us back over to Charles. With Emma Frost reaching out, she knows that he can hear. She is telling Charles not to give up hope because right now Emma Frost is worried about him. He may think that all those mutants died, but none of them can be sure of that. Just because he can't sense them doesn't mean that they are dead. Emma Frost is reaching out to all of their contacts. T'Challa, Reed, Doctor Strange, anybody that might listen. But Charles has fully accepted that their children are dead. This is where we see an advanced attack team making their arrival on Krakoa. As they put boots on ground, we see some horrible monsters appear. And these monsters quickly scare off anybody that might step foot here. But these are just manifestations. This is Charles protecting Krakoa. As long as he lives, he will not let the memory of all those mutants be desecrated. He would rather the air be torn from his very lungs. That as long as he lives, this island will be a monument to all of those lost. Charles Xavier has dubbed himself the sole protector of Krakoa. This is where we hop over to nowhere and no win. We find ourselves in the middle of the desert. We have hope, exodus, and destiny. With all of them getting up to their feet, they don't really know where they are. But Destiny can see nothing. She may be a blind woman, but she has always had the ability to get glimpses of the future. But now, that future is blind to her. There is nothing but white space. And even more than that, she doesn't know where her wife is. As she begins to panic and freak out, this is where Hope slaps her across the face. The truth is, Destiny is a stone cold bee. That is what Hope has always liked about her, and Hope is telling her that you need to get your stuff together. And then Exodus lets us know that they are not the only ones here. 
there are 250,000 other mines here. None of them are Mystique or the rest of the five. It is the whole population of Krakoa, the ones Xavier forced through the portals. They were meant to arrive on Arako. Instead, they are here. They are lost in the desert. Having an entire city full of people, most of them have no useful mutant powers. They have no food. They have no water. Some of them still wearing formal wear. The question now remains, what are we going to do? And this is where Exodus does what Exodus does. He calls out to all the mutants. Like Moses to his people, he tells them that they will survive the desert. Just like he did so long ago. That this desert will transform them. They are now mutant pilgrims. And Exodus is going to lead them to the promised land. He has seen this in a vision so very long ago. That they are the people of Krakoa. That they only have each other. They have only ever had each other. And whether they live or die, they will live and die together. Pointing the direction and telling them all to follow him. While Hope is a little bit unsure, she asks what is in that direction. And what he says is the promised land. And he doesn't truly know this. But Exodus has faith that he knows what to do. From the book of Exodus, the whole mutant people were cast out from Krakoa. They came to the desert. And in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Exodus and Hope. The mutants said to them, If only we had died by Orca's hand. In Krakoa, we sat around pots of plenty. We ate food. But you have now brought us out here into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up with Celine and Sebastian Shaw. And right now, Celine is draining all of the Orcus soldiers that had made landfall on Krakoa. As she eats them, she consumes their memories. She has seen exactly what is on that island, what all the Orcus agents have been running from. And now Celine fully understands exactly what is on that island. No fingerprints of psychic tampering that she can see. In other words, it is somebody who is so good they're not going to leave behind any evidence. Sebastian Shaw immediately knows that this is Xavier. That's what takes us to the Krakoan perimeter. All the soldiers fully loaded up with Psy Blockers. Psy Blockers that Sebastian Shaw himself had built. But as they prepare to launch off, Celine lets it be known that this is important to her, that the external gate is hers, that those bones are her fraternity, and Sebastian Shaw gives out one last warning, that Xavier will be on the island, that he has some telekinetic powers now, but Sebastian Shaw would like him alive. Because of his brain, because of how marvelous it is, Sebastian Shaw sees it as a resource, one that he can exploit. When it comes to Sebastian Shaw, it is always about the money. But this is what takes us to Exodus, in a place known as Nowhere and No Win. Exodus is using his mutant powers to bring water up to the surface. The water vapors gathered from miles around. But looking at this at face value, it could easily be taken as a miracle. Now Exodus and Hope, they have plans to share this power. To take turns using the gift. This will ensure that everybody survives as they make their way to the promised land. And Hope can't help but feel her name right now makes things very difficult. Or at the least, really egotistical. But the way Exodus sees it, Hope's name is essential. She is the Messiah. And so they cannot forget what her name means. They cannot forget her. Because if they lose her, if they lose what her name represents, they have nothing. Now, lucky for these mutants, there are 250,000 of them. When it comes to the water source, Omega-level telekinetic powers are gathering what they can. When it comes to food, they rely on the few mutants that are able to create food for them. They have everything that they need to survive, but they are still left wandering in the desert. But as our 250,000 make their way through the desert, we have Kafka who is on patrol this evening. And while out on patrol, this is when he runs into a Wolverine. 
this Wolverine looking like it's about to kill somebody, and that somebody is Mother Righteous, with Kafka hightailing it all the way back to the rest of the mutants, giving word that he is coming for us. What we see is not one Wolverine, but many. And these Wolverines begin to do what Wolverines do best. As they are tearing everybody apart, this is when Exodus lets it be known that the wolves have fallen upon them. That this is a time of testing. With Exodus using his powers, all the Wolverines fly up to the sky and they explode into tiny little pieces. In an instant, all the Wolverines pop like a balloon. And with the defeat of the Wolverines, this is where we have the arrival of Mother Righteous. She is saying that her magic just isn't working right in this place. She's playing it off like she is lost in this place as well. But from what we had seen during the Hellfire Gala, it seemed like she was right where she wanted to be. Now, when Destiny hears the voice of Mother Righteous, she cannot help but just scoff at it. She lets us know that wherever we are, she cannot see from here. However, she remembers what she did see. And Mother Righteous was always a hole, a gap, concealed. Destiny knows that she has a very big secret. Mother Righteous lets it be known that her secret is that she is a mutant. That she heard the voice of Xavier and now she finds herself in this desert land. But Exodus is very skeptical. She claims to be a mutant. Why is she unknown to everybody? And her excuse for this, she saw how they treated the Scarlet Witch saying that she feared for her life on how they treated her. With her being a witch, she feared that they might do the same to her. This is where we finally learn exactly what her mutant gift is though. Her mutant gift, it is like legions, but it is microscopic. Many gifts, but none of them solid. And so when they finally do agree to allow her to accompany them on their march, she says that they can head back to her place. That she has been so lonely with a whole city just to herself. This is what takes us back to Krakoa. The Orcus agents have made landfall. And because they have the blockers on, Xavier is unable to manifest the monsters that scare them off usually. But Charles Xavier is not powerless. As quickly as these guys had made landfall, that's how quickly they died. Ripped apart, limb from limb, heads decapitated, guts spilled out all over the earth. It is more than obvious that the kill no human rule has been long gone. We have seen this from all over mutant kind. But the fact that Charles Xavier is out here doing that exact thing. He's killing humans as they make landfall. We can see that things have shifted. Mutant kind is taking the gloves off. And God have mercy on any that might stand in their way. But as we pick back up with Exodus, Mother Righteous, and all the others, she has brought the 250,000 to her new home. She said that she found it when she arrived, but we know this to be false. We know that she is lying and manipulating the situation, but nonetheless, this is the Atlantic Krakoa, the island that she had stolen away, and now all the mutants see this as the promised land. But Exodus doesn't believe that their testing is over, an oasis of the desert, and the desert remains a place of testing, and soon, Revelation. This is where we get a glimpse of something else. And this makes things even more interesting. Because the truth is, we don't know where we are. Our mutants could be in an entire different dimension. They could be on a completely different Earth for all we know. And obviously, this place has Logans that are like wild attack dogs. With Exodus reminding everybody not to forget that the desert is also the home of Satan. This is where we see an apocalypse having Jean Grey chained up and a Wolverine attack dog at his feet. It is obvious that there is much more to this place than we expected. Alright guys, so as we dive into this one, we are picking up with Shaw and Selena. And Selena, what she's been trying to get out of this is the external gate. They have been sending in everything they can and every single time they do, it just gets decimated. At this point, Shaw is even recognizing that they have pushed Charles too far. But over at Shaw Industries, Shaw has something up his sleeve. Something that he has been keeping secret. Something just for a rainy day. And that of course is his Hellfire Armor. Designed himself 
commissioned and built for whenever he needs it. But Selene does question, why don't we just send in the Stark Sentinels? And while Sebastian says Orcus, they would love that. But Krakoa belongs to him. He plans to exploit it. He is not going to let Orcus touch it. As he hops into his Hellfire armor, the two of them take off. They head off to face against Charles Xavier. And when they arrive on scene on Krakoa, Sebastian Shaw lets loose. Everything in his arsenal, he throws at Charles. And so now Charles, he is on the defensive. He is on the run. As their battle continues on, we pick up with Apocalypse. And for all of us that thought this was Apocalypse, it is not. As we are shown nowhere and no win. He says that he is not Apocalypse, but he is something grander. And he feels like Apocalypse would approve. He is here for a purpose. He is here to test them on the road to Revelation. And I feel like the word Revelation used here, it means the road to the real Apocalypse. Eventually, they're all gonna understand. But right now, they find themselves in a danger room. A danger room where they will not survive the experience. This is where we are shown Egg. Now Egg, he is currently wrapped up and there are a bunch of individuals that are dragging him off. Thinking that this was going to be his end. From the sky, we have the arrival of Exodus and Hope. As Exodus grabs hold of Egg and goes to take off. That is where a Wolverine comes out of the sand. But it is quickly struck down by Hope. But this day is more than a victory, because they have found the last of the five. Egg was the last one. The Eternal Gang is back together. Resurrection is back on the board. The only problem, they are nowhere and no win. So while Resurrection may work, they don't know who is left standing. They can't simply start resurrecting everybody. Not until they know who is actually alive and who is not. But today is a good day. Because mutants that are dying here in nowhere and no win, they are able to bring them back. Everybody enjoys the festivities. Mother Righteous more than most. Because Mother Righteous has been getting thanks. 250,000 mutants. It's almost like they worship her. And just recently, she has got another vision of another lost mutant, giving the location of where this mutant is. Destiny continues to let everybody know that she cannot be trusted, that she is hiding much more than her mutant ability. But right now, Exodus and Hope, the way they see it, she is useful. She has returned the five to them. She has returned immortality. And Hope tells her that it would be a lot easier if you would let us read your mind. Destiny says that you can trust me or you don't. But the things I know, they would burn your skin from the very bones, render the skies asunder, that if you were to look into my mind, you would endanger everything just by taking a peek. More than anything, she is just telling Exodus and Hope to be careful. With Exodus and Hope flying off, Destiny is the one that is left behind in some kind of control as the temporary leader while the two of them are away. And so as they go to rescue this lost mutant, we pick up on Krakoa. Charles Xavier unable to do any kind of psychic attack to Shaw. We see that Shaw is pushing Charles to Selene. As they attack him, we see that things are going really bad for Charles. He calls out to Emma, asking what does Shaw want, trying to figure out what his overall goal here is. With Emma giving him a download of information, this is where he learns that Fisk has stolen the Hellfire Club, and Charles using the full extent of his power, able to block through any blockers that Shaw might have. He lets Shaw know that he has harvested the passwords for a dozen key Hellfire accounts, that Shaw can start to take back control, that it might be a battle, but with this information, he will be able to start to win. Only if he acts right now, he tells Shaw to go recover the club. Krakoa will still very much be here when you're done. And so Shaw, he says to Selene that my systems are going haywire. That you were right, he was able to get through my Psy Shield. With all of the missiles coming down on Selene, she is rendered unconscious. He says that he will pacify her, because all she wants is the gate. To let us do that and you can keep this island to yourself, at least until he is done with Fisk. Charles letting it be known that they will know that you have the passwords if you double cross me. Shaw agreeing to this deal, but making note that I hate to think that what we have unleashed on this world 
Charles may have always been manipulative, but a murderous individual he has never been. Even Celine squirmed when she saw the bodies. But Charles doesn't understand this, because from what he understands, he hasn't killed anybody. But this is what takes us to nowhere and no win. Exodus and Hope flying through the desert, and who do they find? They find Jean Grey. But Jean's mind isn't right. In fact, she is speaking about what is going on in her little mini-series, the Jean Grey series. As Hope says that they are missing something, she's not sure what it is, but something is missing in all of this. This is where Apocalypse arrives. This is where their Satan appears. The first one he grabs is Exodus. He takes Exodus and slams him on the ground, tossing him away. Hope is trying to figure out what the heck is going on, because there appears to be a chain around Jean Grey, but Exodus doesn't even know what's happening. Now, he's had visions of this place a long time ago. If he is understanding things correctly, Exodus thinks of him as his Satan, with Exodus in the hands of Apocalypse. He says that revelation awaits you, as he speaks to Hope. Hope has no idea what is going on, but she's gonna figure it out. This is where she goes to read the mind of Jean Grey. In doing so, there is a huge blast coming from both of them, but she is okay. Jean Grey is not. Her mind is on fire. It is burning. It is so hot that it is beyond hot. She knows where they are, but she doesn't know what it means. Turning to Exodus, she asks the question, what is the hot white room? This is the revelation. This is the experience they will not survive. Because no one survives revelation. The person that you were is dead and gone forever. In their place, someone stronger. But one thing is for certain, revelation cannot be denied. As she has her revelation, we pick up with Charles Xavier. Making his way around Krakoa, he sees footsteps. Not really sure who they belong to or what is going on. As he makes his way down into a cave system, he looks into the mirror. And what he sees is the Diamond of Sinister, written on the mirror, saying, Don't kill yourself, please. Dive into this issue, we are picking up with Charles Xavier. He is talking with Sinister. He has just learned that Sinister is still with him. And at night, Sinister has been taking over, doing unspeakable things. He refuses to allow this to continue. That by sunset, Sinister will be gone one way or another. With Charles peering over the ledge, he contemplates taking his own life. But we see Sinister. He apologizes but begs him not to do this. He wants Charles to give him the opportunity to explain himself. This is what takes us over to the White Hot Room. We pick up with the Satan Apocalypse facing off against Exodus. And we also have Hope and Jean Grey. Now Jean Grey recently accepting the Phoenix. Taking it back in, her and the Phoenix are one once again. And she had thought herself to be dead, but she has been waiting to come together in the White Hot Room. She has been incubating, but the time for her rebirth is not now. Yet for some reason, she is here, but she knows that something is wrong. While she struggles with all of this, we see Exodus and the Apocalypse Satan going against one another. The two of them clashing mighty blows, with Exodus driving a psychic sword right through the head of Apocalypse. He may be able to oppose the Satan, but he cannot beat him. This is where Apocalypse, he grabs hold of Exodus's head and he begins to crush it as blood seeps through the hands of Apocalypse. Exodus not able to take much more of this. This is when Jean Grey gives the power of the Phoenix over to Hope, lets her mimic it just for a moment, and she pierces right through Apocalypse. The Satan has been defeated. When all is said and done, Hope thinking to herself that she was so strong, that she was actually connected to the Force. But this is all quickly broken up when we see that there is something wrong with Jean, telling Hope and Exodus that they have to help her. This is when something begins to speak out of Jean Grey. It says, Jean is the house where I live, and I am the house where Jean Grey lives. The white hot room is where the Phoenix lives, and that they will learn more about them all in good time, with Hope seeing something is awfully wrong with her. 
they get Jean out of here and they head back. That's what picks us back up with Sinister and Charles. Sinister is letting us know that he is still in the pit, but this is a part of him that is inside of Charles. Now, Forge's cure, it did work. Everyone else is clean, but he has older work inside of Charles. From the days of Project Black Womb, his genome was able to reattach itself but it is old tech he has beaten before. He only holds Charles by fingertips because his conscious mind is much too strong. That is why he has been active when Charles is asleep. And he said that he only did the things that he did to ensure that the island stayed safe. He also goes on to say that he wasn't lying, that one of his peers will basically become a more terrifying god. And though he is working on something to fight it, Charles believes that he would say anything to to preserve his own life. Letting Charles into his mind, he lets him know that he is nothing. This Sinister believes himself to be nothing, that he's not in Charles' league. After going down here and seeing all of this, his mind is still unchanged, contacting Emma and letting her know that none of them are under Sinister's influence, that they are all free, but he is not. Ending the conversation with her right there, Charles does at this point believe Sinister is telling the truth, that he saw a horrific dominion, and that Charles is the only one he can still influence. He also saw that Sinister has no other real backups. Now, at first he says that I should trust the X-Men to fight this Dominion, that he has to have more faith in them. So if it is all true, and this is him, perhaps the greatest use that he could give the whole world is ensuring that Sinister is gone forever. Thinking about jumping over that ledge, Sinister stops him and lets him know that he isn't the one that goes to Dominion. He thought that he would go to Godhood, but he saw the Red Diamond timeline. He came face to face with it, and that Dominion had laughed at him. He tells him that this is one of the other Sinisters. He says that it is a Sinister, that he would recognize it. It's just not him, but it let him see enough to know that it is true. He is now on his knees pleading with Charles, saying that they have to stop it, or at least find a way to take down the Godhood while it is still very fresh. That's what he's been working on at night. Charles still not sure about all of this, because when Charles was in his mind, he also saw that Sinister was trying to take him over permanently. And he admits this. He said, yes, of course I did. I'm freaking Mr. Sinister. That he is the best at what he does. But he knows that he loses. That he lost. Everything he achieved, he is not the Dominion. One of his peers do it. Whether it be Stasis, Orbis, and he still doesn't know that Mother Righteous is the fourth. He lets Charles know that you can trust my spite. The spite I have for my peers and wanting to take them down is stronger than anything else. He also goes on to tell Charles that Krakoa was actually a really good idea. He wished he hadn't messed it up, but he believed that he had to be the Dominion. That he was compelled. Almost like he didn't have a choice. But Charles also says that you must take responsibility for your actions. That's exactly what Sinister is trying to do here. Or at least, that's what he believes he's trying to do. But Charles reminds him that he's doing all of this out of spite. Fear and everything that is beneath them. For Sinister, that is all all he has. This is where we pick up with Mother Righteous and Destiny. She is coming to let Destiny know that Exodus and Hope, they are back and they found Jean Grey. And Destiny does find this very interesting, very curious, because Jean Grey had died. But Mother Righteous pulls out a dagger in the middle of this conversation. Destiny unable to see what is about to happen. Mother Righteous telling her that they are in the white hot room. No past, no future, no nothing. This is why her visions haven't been working. But Mother Righteous is more worried about what she had seen. Outside of time and space, it cannot see destiny. This is when Mother Righteous attacks. And Destiny says that you're a sinister. You have to stop. That you don't know what you're doing. But that dagger plunges into the chest of Destiny. Destiny pleading for her to listen. Mother Righteous has no intention of doing so. When a young mutant walks into the room and sees what has transpired. Mother Righteous now knows she needs a distraction. As she cashes in the remainder of her Krakoan thanks. This is where we see Krakoa go wild. Something has angered it. Exodus and Hope being informed that Irene was stabbed by Mother Righteous. Exodus knows that this is Mother Righteous's doing. 
but the only thing they can do now is save as many people as possible. While they are all busy doing this, Mother Righteous goes to Jean Grey, and she plans to take Jean on a little trip, with Jean in an almost comatose state. She is unable to refute this. This is what picks us up with Sinister and Charles. Charles having the red diamond of Sinister. This is a gateway. It'll get them off this island and exactly where they need to go. They are headed to Muir Island. As they disappear, we pick up in the white hot room. We pick up with Jean Grey on a chain and she is being led through the desert by Mother Righteous. All right, gang, so as we dive into this issue, we pick up with Mother Righteous in the white hot room. Jean Grey's mind is still pretty messed up, and Mother Righteous leads her on a chain. She has figured out how to get to Dominionhood. She has figured out how to become the one, and it is all because of Jean Grey and the Phoenix. You see, everything that has happened so far since the Hellfire Gala, the mutants arriving here in the white hot room, Everything with Jean Grey, Mother Righteous has been slowly manipulating, leading to this very moment where she has the opportunity to take everything. As we pick up with our heroes fighting against Krakoa itself, Exodus and all the others. This is because of what Mother Righteous had done. After she stabbed Destiny, she caused Krakoa to go crazy. This gave her the opportunity to escape. Now, if you guys remember, Mother Righteous, she gains power by the thank yous that she gets. Every time someone thanks her, she gets a little more power. But this power is limited. In fact, she used a lot of her thank yous to make Krakoa angry, to make it lash out and attack everybody. But the way she sees it, it was a great bargain because everything has led her to Dominionhood. But with Destiny on the verge of death, we have Elixir coming up and helping bring her back to life. And when she wakes up, she knows that they are in the white hot room. But Mother Righteous is already gone, saying that they have a chance. That there is a chance to still stop her before it is too late. And right now, Destiny is the only one that can stop all of this. But Mother Righteous goes on to explain how her little thank yous work. She has a debt from everyone on Krakoa, a tiny one. She could maybe make each person sneeze, but those tiny things do add up. She used about half of her favors to play with the mutant's connection to the gateways. When they were forced to walk through it by Orcus, she also hacked into Orcus's hacking, but she says that's a story for another time. She brought all of the mutants here where she wanted them to go this is what is even more interesting with her not being a mutant that's right she is not a mutant but using those thank yous she takes a small fraction of mutant gift from everybody making herself a mutant adjacent this is not to say that she can use their powers but it's kind of like a temporary mask of the next gene and while that revelation is brought to us, we pick up with Charles Xavier and Mr. Sinister. We head up to the laboratory where the Moira engine was, with Charles able to walk right past the guards, tapping into their minds so that they don't see him at all, because Orcus agents, they've been staking this place out. They've been waiting for anybody to return. But Sinister has come here hoping that there is some information that they may be able to pull out of this stuff. And what they're trying to remember is the Sins of Sinister timeline. Now, Mr. Sinister doesn't remember much from that timeline besides what Mother Righteous allowed him to know. But what she didn't know is that he has his own hidden backups. And these backups should give them all the secrets that they need to learn to figure out who becomes Dominion. Little do they know that Mother Righteous is almost there already. Now, Sinister, he took his shot by accident, filled the universe with himself and set it on fire. All the cloning, all the science, the churning away for a thousand years. For Mother Righteous, this is too exhausting. For her, magic is about the easy way. But magic is also not as powerful as we may think it is. At least for Mother Righteous. And that is where mutant kind comes into play. This is her cheat code. Putting her own little twist on Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced mutation is indistinguishable from magic. As Destiny, Hope, and Exodus arrive on scene, Destiny is saying that she couldn't talk about any of this. She couldn't talk about Dominion or anything else while they were in the main universe. Now that they are in the white hot room, outside of time and space, the Dominion cannot see them here. And so in this place, she can tell them everything. She was too afraid that the Dominion might try to manipulate something, might try to stop her from talking. But now she can divulge everything that she knows. But she is trying with all she can to stop Mother Righteous, saying that she doesn't know what she's doing. 
as we pick up with Charles and Sinister. The two of them currently discussing what they might do once they actually get to this Dominion or once they're able to try and prevent the Dominion. Once they come face to face with it, how do we stop it? But Sinister thinks the question is more what can it do? Because it is outside of time and space. That has great power, but also significant limitations. It is reliant on bringing itself into being. It cannot change that causality. It's out of time, so maybe it would survive, but it wouldn't take that risk. He does believe it can alter things behind the scenes. It can change meanings. It can reveal truths. They should assume that all reality is a minefield, and that it could be watching them at any time. But with Sinister inside of Charles's head, the only thing the Dominion sees right now is Charles. But they don't believe that the Dominion has come to its full power yet, saying that if it had come to its full power, Charles probably wouldn't be breathing right now. But as they start to plug into the system and try to figure out who the Dominion is, what they learn is that Stasis and Orbis, they aren't the Dominions. The machine includes data from the timeline when they tried. They both have already failed. So that leaves two options, Mother Righteous or Mr. Sinister. This is where we pick back up with Mother Righteous. As she goes on to talk about Legion, that was her first choice, her way to Dominionhood. If she could have ruled him, she could have ruled everything, except all of that went sideways. He disappeared and she has no idea where he went. And so from Dr. Stasis, she learned that Orcus was going to try to kill Jean Grey. And she knows a lot about Jean from the Empire of the Red Diamond future. She prodded at a phoenix egg for the best part of a thousand years. Jean's connection to the White Hot Room, which is basically the phoenix. Anytime she dies, she is there, out of time. She is of the Phoenix, in a real and unbreakable way. She guides it and it guides her. It is a circle without beginning or end. And so as they finally reach the ending, she prepares to go to Dominionhood. As she makes her preparations, we pick back up with Charles. He is letting Sinister know that it is clearly labeled. Stasis and Orbis, they don't make it. He also goes on to say that he fears someone else has already been there. There have been three Dominion attempts. Sinisters with his Empire of the Red Diamond, Orbis, and Stasis. But there was no fourth attempt. But there are details on the fourth Sinister. This is where they finally learn, Charles finally learns, that Mother Righteous is the fourth Sinister. Thinking to himself that he never even considered why she was wearing a mask. Finding it strange that he never thought about this before. Maybe something was preventing him from even thinking about it. Sinister says that this is story magic. And so they now know that they must stop Mother Righteous before it is too late. As we pick up in the white hot room. Hope, Exodus, and Destiny trying to make it to Mother Righteous before it is too late. And Mother Righteous is cashing in all of her orbs. Destiny is trying to reach her. Trying to let her know that we cannot do this. With Mother Righteous sending some monsters after her. Hope and Exodus try to cut their way through, but they are already too late. We see Mother Righteous drive a dagger right into the chest of Jean Grey, and then she begins to write on the ground. By the time Destiny gets to her, it is already too late. Writing on the ground in Jean's blood. Once upon a time, there was a simple girl from Exodus. She became a Dominion. She lived happily ever after. And this is where we see her ascension. She begins to rise up, believing that she is the breath before creation. She is the relief after, as she begins to rise up to Dominionhood. This is where she sees a page turn. Grabbing hold of that page and opening it up, what she finds is a message. Saying, however, his mistress of stories should have known. There's always a twist. Telling her to look behind her. We see Mother Righteous popped like a zit. Thrown out of Dominionhood. Mother Righteous is irate. She thought she was about to make Dominionhood only to learn that he made it first. With Destiny walking over to Mother Righteous, Destiny kicks her right in her freaking face. Because this is exactly what Destiny has been trying to tell her the entire freaking time. And now, they have all been doomed. This is where we head over to the old Essex house. All those years ago, Nathaniel Essex, he created four clones of himself. He sent them out into the world. Each would explore a route to become what the machine strove for. The four variations were leeches, colonizing and appropriating all creation and all of life's data. 
When they succeeded, failsafes would engage. All they would have known, everything that they would have gathered fed into a central model. Because the real answer, what can defeat the machine brains, is nothing. When it comes to artificial intelligence, all you can do is create the Apex AI first. And that is exactly what Nathaniel XX did. He turned himself into artificial intelligence. He is long dead. He is a ghost in the machine. You can call him Enigma. He was told that there are new gods. And they are right. Nathaniel Essex is their new god. And that will be the end of this issue. Holy crap. Now, some of you guys may have may have really suspected this to happen. I know many people were wondering what happened to the original Nathaniel. And by all accounts, we believed he is dead. And the truth is, he is dead. But he turned himself into AI. He fed his consciousness into a machine, created the four variations, sent them out into the world to gather all of this data. And then once they got all the data that he required, all that data went back to the central hub. With all this data collected, this gave him the possibility, the ability, to become the Dominion Hood himself. It appears that once all of them had tried for Dominion Hood, this is what they needed to kick in the failsafes. Mother Righteous was the last one to go for Dominion Hood. All the others had already tried and failed. But man, is this a way to end Immortal X-Men. No, X-Men Red didn't hit as heavy as this on its ending, but man, did Immortal X-Men bring it. And I was really expecting X-Men Red to be the banger. But this changes everything. How this is going to play out, we really don't know. But what we do know is that there is a much bigger threat on the horizon. You know, we got the Sabretooth War, we got Orcus, we got all this craziness that is currently going on. But the biggest threat out there, the biggest threat against everybody, is Enigma, Nathaniel Essex, the Ghost in the Machine, the Dominion Hood. So let me know your thoughts, let me know your theories. If you would like to get completely caught up on everything going on with this story, go ahead, check out the link in my description as well as the top of this video. It'll get you completely caught up on everything going on with this series. If you would like to support the channel, you can always do so by joining the channel membership. Much like Patreon, having multiple different tiers, from $1 to $50, from loyalty badges to comics every single month. Not only are you helping out the channel, channel, but you are getting tons of perks in the process. Now, if you're unable to do this, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit that notification bell, and with that being said, until the next breakdown.